I used to have eyes where they like to be wide and I'd be scanning everywhere. I'd be paranoid. I'd be mm-hmm. thinking everyone's out to get me all the time. So I was talking to you. Now I'd be scanning everywhere and I, I just was un, wasn't mm-hmm. right. And I just remember a lot of lads <laughs> on the field and they were looking. So I walked into the middle of the road and I was going... Staring at them all. It was only not long after that when I got my big sentences. Was it? I used to carry big knives around mm-hmm. my waist, so if they'd have come at me, you know, when Paul says, Oh, mm-hmm. keep away from him, he's a nutter. Mm-hmm. If they'd have come then, I'd have probably stabbed them up because that, that was my mindset at the time. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that long after I ended up going into Hartlepool, stabbing the man through the head right. uh, who was meant to be a nutter himself, and yeah. then into Peter Lee, stabbed the man straight mm. through his chest because I had a a fascination with knives like they were a god. Like I I actually used to sit mm. and stare at them and twist them. And he had a Rambo one, you know, them ones with the compasses on. I just bought it, it was like, at the time, oh, it was like precious to me. And one day I went to a party and when I was at the party, I, I forgot where I was and I pulled my knife out and I started staring at my knife and I must've been looking at it you know, for about mm. 10, 15 minutes, just forgot where I was. And then all of a sudden, I just went, oh, let's go and kill somebody. And when I looked up, I spoiled everyone's buzz, <laughs> right? They're all on E, they're on E, stoned. When mm. I looked up, they were all crunched up, mm. like squashed up like that on yeah. the set E. All like Michael Myers has just turned up, hasn't he? <laughs> no, and, then one, and then one of them just went, slowly came over, he went, hey, give, us a, give us a knife, mate, you're killing the buzz. <laughs> no. yeah. And yeah. I went, oh, here, yeah, sorry about that, lads. Mm. And there's a bit in Goodfellas where he's uh, where at the beginning where they hear the bang on their boot mm-hmm. and they pull up and they open up and the man is still alive. So he pulls out the knife and he starts sticking mm-hmm. it in. You can hear it, can like it's, a it's pretty graphic. Squelch. But yeah. uh, uh, my first time I watched that, my hair's all stood on end. Mm. Not not the part, just the, the stabbing bit. Mm. My hair stood on end and I got this like feeling of a rush. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yes, I want to be like that. I want to mm. kill people. All that, all that hate and anger... You just look back and think, someone just said, hang on a minute, just calm down. It's just a load of rubbish. Because that's all it was, wasn't it? There's no goodness, really, was it? Years of wasted regret. years. Regret. How did it feel like when you knew you were so wrong? Mm. Just like your whole life's been a lie. Is that what it was like? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Now, Wild Man was not very easily impressed. And there was a couple of guests in particular, Alan Lord was one of them, that after the podcast, Wild Man, I could tell he was really impressed. And one of those, Shane Taylor. And in part one, you know, it was very hardcore, the crimes that he went through. But he came out the other side, he got his faith, and he has turned his life around. And it it was just so powerful to go from these really violent extreme crimes on one side to walking with God on the other side. So he's come back today to do a part two. He's he's done some other interviews. They've, They've gone really viral on YouTube and nothing but love and support has come in for him. Now, to co-host today, we've got Jamie. Who has, cheers, cheers, who has arranged many of our interviews. <clears throat> We've had some phenomenal guests through Jamie and we published many of the audiobooks for his company. So the links for Jamie's YouTube and all of his socials and, and the audiobooks will be in the description box below the video. So it's very important that we support Jamie and his work because, you know, he, he's gone out of his way to be here today and he's arranged so many other guests for, for us and spent so much time doing all of this. Shane's come down as well. So huge thank you for coming back, Shane. Cheers, thanks for having me. Yeah. With all your stuff getting really viral on YouTube, are people reaching out to you and are you feeling this love and support? Yeah, a lot of people have been actually, yeah. I've had loads of people messaging me. and In fact, I had a, 
I, I can't say his name, but I had a traveller from down south. He, and he um, messaged me saying, look, Shane, I watched your story. And I just relate to the mental part of us. And I thought it was only me who thought like that. So I'm struggling. I mess my life up all the time and I don't know how to get out of it. So we just started chatting, sent him a book and a DVD. Mm. And we're just going down the route, like little things like that. I love it. Absolutely love it. It's, it's... Do you not find it's almost like your life's completely changed because now people know you? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. It's just... Uh, do you know what I can I, I, the, the reality to it is when I first got out of prison mm. for about five, six, seven, eight years, no one took it serious. They just thought, oh, yeah, watch. It, it's all a blag. He'll soon be back. Oh, he'll soon do something crazy. And as the time's gone on and the years have gone on, it's almost like people are starting to like think this is not a game. It's like 15 years down the line now. Mm. He's still out. He still hasn't done something crazy. Mm. And he's still... You know, I'll say I'm still struggling on because mm -hmm. it's not easy. It's not an easy walk, you know, to turn the other cheek or whatever. But um, it's just the people are starting to see that it's I'm re it's real. I'm it's you know I'm I'm not just saying I'm a Christian. I'm not just saying I've changed. I'm not just saying it's easy. So when people talk to me, I don't go, oh, it's easy. I've just changed. I know exactly where they're coming from. I know exactly what they're struggling with. And we start talking about mental health. Start talking about, I actually start talking about like, oh, do you think like this? And they're like, oh, yeah. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And about this. And we go down the route of how our minds think. And I say, mate, I'm still there sometimes myself. Just hold on, man. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. And mm. just, and then they message back saying, mate, I've got a bit of hope. You know, you give me a bit of hope. And I, I just get a, um, I get a big buzz out of that. Helping people. Shane was classified as being in the top six most dangerous prisons in the country. <clears throat> and they had him in the highest security facilities and we're going to get into that. But can you imagine, like, back then when you were in one of those facilities thinking, 20, 30 years from now, my story's going to be inspiring people all over the world. I thought I was getting a life sentence. I was set on not getting a life sentence. Mm. I remember seeing you for the first time. Oh, must have been about 2008, 2009, and he started being in the middle of papers. Do you remember that Red England top you had on? Like, oh, yeah. And I, I remember yeah, thinking, in, and in it was the a, there was a story in the paper, this badass was in the same cell as Charles Bronson. No, but it's... Can I, oh, sorry, it's yeah. in the same wing. No, like that. no, what it is, is it's... <coughs> see, what you've got to be careful, and I, and I feel like I have to do this. For, the papers for, ran that story, yeah, on, didn't they? Yeah, for poor Charlie Bronson. Yeah. Is every time there seems to be a parole coming up, they try and connect any dangerous criminal mm. to him. Now, all I've said is I was in, in the CSC cells. There's like the units, the CSC. Wakefield like Monster Mansion. I've been in Wakefield segregation unit on CSC, but not on the wing. They wouldn't let me on the wing. Right. And the units next to that. So I haven't literally, I've been not literally on the wing with Charlie Bronson, but they keep connecting us mm. in the papers all the time. And it's, it's not true. Now, I have been down that route and in the CSC cells and everything like that. But it's that's not the case. I've actually been on the wing with yeah, him. Yeah, I remember I remember Shane kinda who's in the middle of the paper and uh obviously his story with God. So I, I, I remember thinking, I've never heard of him. I've never because I've read obviously most of true crime. Uh I grew up in Middlesbrough for most of my life. So I've always I thought I've never heard of him. So I remember seeing you kinda almost like being born in the spotlight, if you like. But yeah. Obviously, you've done, um, you done a documentary, Shane. You've done a, a book. But uh, before we go into it, let's start off with someone we know very well. Uh, this guy, Paul Venice, yeah, who um, Paul, yeah. some would say uh, is my lover. <laughs> <laughs> Check out I, our podcast with Paul Venice. I cannot neither confirm or deny those rumours. But Paul Venice, <laughs> I know him very, very well. Uh, I often ring him up threatening him, I send him videos in the bath, I, I, do, some, <laughs> I do some funny stuff, Paul, if you're watching, mate. But uh, no, you knew him very, very well. If anything, you kind of, that's how I know you. Yeah. So people know Paul Venice, the actor, or the, the going to be actor, uh, the addict, the in recovery, the world champion, <sighs> knockout machine, <sighs> scary, 
looks like Buzz Lightyear. I, I taught him. I yeah, taught you him taught him the, everything yeah, yeah. new. But who was <laughs> who's Paul Venice really? What's so you were like literally <clears throat> brothers. And where you come along from with Paul? When, when you say who, from, from when do you want me to talk about his past or from how he is now? Just, just from day one. <clears throat> so so basically, who is Paul Venice? Well, uh, I knew him when he was younger. So we had a, a few altercations when mm. I was younger because I used to walk about mentally ill. Mm. So I used to walk about with the knives around my waist. And Paul will tell you, like, there was times, some of the times I can't even remember that I was that mad. But I remember once... Were you on walk- drugs then, or were you just no, walking no, about? No, no, just normal. So you were just walking about full as... Just mentally ill. F-U-C-K, yeah. but you were just literally... Mentally ill. Psychotic, mental used patient. To, used to daydream about killing people every day and that. Right. Like, that's how bad it was. Yeah. So you didn't, so you went into drink or drugs or no, nothing like that? You were just completely full just on lunatic? full on mentally ill. And I just remember a lot of lads <laughs> on the field and they were looking. So I walked into the middle of the road and I was going... Staring at them all, mm. and that's one of the See, moments when Paul says, One yeah. of them said, Who's he looking at? and Paul said, Look, <laughs> keep away from him, there's something <laughs> wrong with him. Yeah, I mean, I and, know one or two who were there, Shane, and they're actually like quite, I suppose, people can fight. So, for you to just walk in there on your own and just start staring at this gang of um, like one was wrong. a professional boxer, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. that's slightly not quite right. Do you know what I mean? But you just oh, didn't care? You yeah. had no worries about yourself? Well, I, I I didn't have worries because I knew how far I was willing to go. Mm. So you, you could have been the hardest man in the world, but I know I'm, I'm willing to kill you once you've crossed me. That mm. was my mentality. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't the hardest person around. Of course I wasn't. Mm. I'd stand and have a good go. Yeah. But if I got knocked out, which luckily it never happened when I was young, um, not because I was hard, but if that happened, that would stew. And I would not be able to let it go until I got, went and killed them. Mm. See, that was the mentality of me. I wouldn't let it go. Now, they could have the laugh then, but in my head, it would play and play and play and play in my head that it would just wind me up to the point where I had to kill them just to settle my brain. It, it, does that, it, it's, and it's horrible. Mm-hmm. I don't... Um, it's a horrible, horrible brain to have. Don't, so, uh, Paul Venice, that was when you met him. Uh, I think the first... Words you ever said to him were very romantic. You basically said, "Step in and I'll kill you." And then uh, oh, Paul yeah, actually, diff- yeah. Paul actually said to me, he "said I looked in his eyes and it was like Ronnie Cray." I thought, because Paul Venice, <clears throat> obviously um, I know him well, and uh, I've got great love for him. But the thing is, he's not scared of anyone. But he looked at you and thought, he probably will do what he says on the tin. Yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, it was. It was <laughs> Everyone, people used, I'll tell you, I'll give you a few little in- examples what I haven't, how mad I was. I would walk in like parties and sesh houses mm. and there'd be like five or six local lads who were hard as, mm. well known for being handy. And within 10 minutes of being around me, they'd all just go, you're getting life, there's something yeah. wrong with you. So you were literally a walking life sentence, weren't you? Yeah, that's what they would say. They would say, there's something wrong with you. There's some, you're going to get lifed off. And I, and I was so confused because I felt like I was normal. So every time I'm meeting all these people who can have a good do or whatever, and within five minutes they're saying, there's something not right with you, there's something not right, Mm. you're going to get lifed off. And then I'd be like, what do you mean? Like, can you explain to me? (coughs) Explain to me. They'd be like, look, I just just can't explain, but you're going to end up getting life. Mm. And and I would be always confused because I Mm. I felt normal. And, And that was... That was my <laughs> sort yeah. of life. And I remember once, because I had a, a fascination with knives, like they were a god. Like, I I actually used to sit mm. and stare at them and twist them. And I had a Rambo one, you know, them ones with the compasses on. I just bought it. It was, like, at the time, oh, it was, like, precious to me. I just bought it. I'd polish it up. <laughs> no, mm. I, would, I would stare at it. And one day I went to a party. And when I was at the party, I, I forgot where I was, and I pulled my knife out. And I started staring at my knife and I must have been looking at it you know, for about mm. 10, 15 minutes, just forgot where I was. And then all of a sudden, I just went, oh, let's go and kill somebody. And when I looked up, I spoiled everyone's buzz, <laughs> right? They're all on E, they're on E, stoned. When I looked up, they were all crunched up, mm. like squashed up like that on yeah. the set E. All like Michael Myers has just turned up, hasn't he? <laughs> no, and, then one, and then one of them just went... Slowly came over, he went, Here, give us a give us a knife, mate. You're killing the buzz. <laughs> no. yeah. And yeah. I went, Oh here, yeah, sorry about that, lads. Mm. You know, and that that was like how I was all the mm. time. Constantly thinking 
the world's out to get me, the government's out to kill me. You know, if anyone crossed me, mm. I would think they were sent by the government to, to mess about with me mm. and stuff. Like, it's, it's, it's just not right. Mm. I was mentally, totally mentally When you unstable. started, I mean, obviously you got medication and then... Did no, like, I, didn't, I didn't get medication. I was mentally ill right up until I become a Christian. I, I, I didn't get any. Did, I refused. did you take tablets today? No, none. I refused. I wouldn't have anything to do mm. with mental health. The, so, only, the only one time I've had treatment is when I was sectioned off because uh, of how violent one of my crimes were. Mm. I got sectioned off and I went into the open secu the open bit in St. Luke's, it used to be called yeah. the mental hospital. Rosebury Park, now in the Middlesbrough. And I got restrained. Uh, I got restrained by these about four or five bodybuilder looking kind of men and they couldn't, they couldn't do now. So they had to run over with a, with a needle and he injected me and in, in me um, <clears throat> and I woke up three days after. I lost three days of my life. I thought it was the same day, mm. and then I went, oh, what day is it? Like, what time is it? And they, were, like, they told me it was three days down the line. They knocked me mm. out for three days. And then when I came back round, they all directed me in to see the doctor, and the doctor said, look, the strength that you had, we feel like it's uh, schizophrenia strength, so we're going to put you over to the, um, the secure unit. So I ended up going into the secure unit in the mental hospital in St. Luke's. And, and that was, I was in there for an assessment, Mm. And was in there for a bit, and then just. Whatever. I mean, Paul. Obviously, we'll go back to Paul, but that's what happened to Paul. I mean, that story he told you, Sean, about a guy chasing him, and then it obviously disappeared, and he knew. But uh, going back to Paul, you have your paths. I believe you've meant to to run into each other, and uh, I dare say he's changed your life. You've certainly changed his. Yeah, you introduced him to God. Uh, Paul was in prison one day, opened this book, seeing you, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you weren't so psychotic anymore. Yeah. And you, you'd put a bit of weight on, you were happy, and you were like, Paul was like, I know him. And uh, I think he started writing to you. you, you know, you just started this kind of long love affair or something. Um, and, you know, you've certainly been a massive thing for, for Paul's life. I, I see I see the future for Paul Venice massive because he's lived everything. Yeah. But you you didn't know him when he was on the drugs, did you? Or? No, <laughs> I didn't I didn't know I I was in jail. I was constantly in and out of jail for big right. sentences. So but so you basically you met him, you we, spent we, years visiting each other? Yeah, so I we, I had them incidences. Yeah. And I went off and ended up going to jail for a big sentence. I stabbed someone through the head. And then when I stabbed the, the person no, actually I stabbed I went on my own little rampage after that. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but at that time, when Paul was saying, like, it was only not long after that when I got my big sentences. Was it? I used to carry big knives around mm -hmm. my waist, so if they'd have come at me, and when Paul says, oh, mm -hmm. keep away from him, he's a nutter. Mm -hmm. If they'd have come then, I'd have probably stabbed them up, because that, that was my mindset at the time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long after, I ended up going into Hartlepool, stabbing the man through the head. Right. Uh, who was meant to be a nutter himself, and then oh. into Peter Lee, stabbed a man straight mm. through his chest. So you've obviously seen the rise of Paul Venice, though, from from him being a you know a volatile, angry well, prisoner, little, chip on his shoulder. Well, can I tell you a little <clears throat> a, a little secret? When I first got out of prison, so when I like Paul was younger when we knew each other, mm. but in that time, Paul had become like. Hard case yeah. in Middlesbrough, didn't he? I suppose the and and it was meant to be Andy Ladd, and mm. I remember getting out and thinking, oh no, mm. we had that incident mm. there. I've changed my life and stuff, and yeah. Paul's meant to be rock hard. I was thinking, yeah. I hope he doesn't remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And then I saw him once walking past, and he was like, "You all right?" I was like, "Yeah, you." And, mm. and he said he can't remember it, but I did. Yeah. I was thinking, "Oh no, I hope he doesn't yeah. do his in." But obviously, <laughs> so so you known him from from his bad days. Did you you literally watched him? Become British Commonwealth and, I watched, a, and a world yeah. champion. Yeah, I watched him and all. <laughs> I went to a lot of his fights and that. Yeah, I was loving it. I was jumping on the tables and that and some of them. Mm. I went to Newcastle. It was unreal. He had two fights and one one go straight after each other. Did he? More or less. Yeah, it was like a competition. Both knockouts. Yeah, straight mm. full clean out. Like and the lads, I think the lads were like one of them. Yeah, one of the men that is unbeatable today. Mm -hmm. He's a world he's, champion. He's world champion now, yeah. and, and no one else has ever beaten. No one. Yeah. Only Paul. Yeah. And he do, do you think he'll ever come back, Paul? 
as in boxing, fighting, yeah, he yeah. should do. He should yeah. just go for it and see where he can go. But, uh, yeah, everyone, you know, a lot of people in Middlesbrough know your story. You know how close you are. But, Pete, you, obviously, Sean, you've done the first one, but you didn't really touch on, in my opinion, being inside a prison, inside a prison. <sighs> I mean, Shane has been in literally the places where it's like a mad at his tea party, where everyone's turning to a werewolf. Um, how was it, right? At one point, you were never going to see the light of day ever again. So can I can I just explain? Can you give, can you give the explain. viewers a list of the prisons you've been in? <clears throat> uh, I don't know. Home Wait, House. Wakefield. Home House, Durham. Um, Full Sutton. Full Sutton, Franklin. Full Sutton, Long Larton, Whitemore. Wakefield, Seg. Uh, yeah. Not normal Wakefield. Wakefield. Moulins, Deerball, North Hollerton, yeah. flipping. I, I can't, I don't know. I just was going around. Yeah. But when I went into the dispersal prison, I was always doing my rounds, you see. It was always getting shipped out. So they would just, it would start off in Franklin. I went on a, a, a mad one in Franklin. It was like a war every day in there mm. for me. It was. Uh, and see, let me explain what CSC is, because some pe people don't know. Because you've got to be careful, because there's a, like there's a unit, there's the, the CSC, and there's like stages of things. Mm. So the CSC, it's like you go, you segregated off in the segregate, you go to segregation, but then it's like a segregation within the segregation. So like you won't open your cell doors unless there's six or seven prison officers in right gear. Uh, they have like this hatch, this metal hatch, where they like they lock a box on. Mm. And they'll open one side, put your food in. There's no physical contact, uh, and and it's just like if you're getting moved. It's, if you're going going onto the exercise yard, you're literally mm. having the seven prison officers in right gear. You have to put your hands on your head, walk backwards, and it takes you 10, 15 minutes just to get round the corner. And you go through all these big processes. So it's like segregation from the segregation, mm. basically. You're segregated off from the segregation. Mm. A sentence Shane's referring to lasted. Eight years, nine months. So that's how long would you say your life was like that? In the segregation unit, <clears throat> I'd say most of that sentence. Most of that sentence, yeah. Why were you so angry, Shane? Brutality. Mm. Had you suffered at the end of the governor, uh, the prisoners, and like, not the prisoners? My my battle like wasn't against and them. That. I'll go on the wing and be sound with the inmates. Mm. Just the screw the officers. Sometimes. How many times are we talking? As in brutality. In mm. when I was in Franklin segregation unit, it was on a daily basis. Was it? But I would they couldn't break me. Mm. See, listen, how many men, this is why I'm confident in myself. How many men mm. can go through six years or seven years of constant every day having six or seven prison officers coming in, mm. trying to brutalize you, trying to torture you. And at the end, you're still you're still battling them. You're still telling them, come on. Mm. You're still running to the door. Even screws, I even remember after about a, a year and after a couple of months in Franklin, I even remember one of the officers coming and saying, we've seen many of men break. Mm. There's something not right with you. Mm. They normally break. Are and, you talking, and talking about conditions where you were naked? I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about coming in, attacking you, mm. battling with them. But well, you can only go so long. Cold. Handcuffing water. you to the beds, leaving you there for days on end. I'm talk I'm not even gonna go into detail, but I'm talking about proper what you'd see in a movie kind of stuff. It's not for me to go into because I don't mm. want to put the system down. Yeah. The system does what it has to do. Sometimes if someone's going too bad, they try and break you. Get it? I, mm. I understand it. Uh there's just some people they, they take the beatings or they take a couple of hits and they're like, I'd sack that, I'm going back mm. on the wing, I'm being good. But some people can't cope with it, mm -hmm. and it makes them more angrier, more aggressive, more anti-authority, and that's what happened to me. Mm. I was just, it was, it become a, it become a, um, you lose track of getting out of prison. Well, that's what you did, didn't you? Yeah, you went but that's like because it. of what's going on. So you, you lose that track, you've got one goal, one, one focus when you're there. When them officers come, how can I get one of them and kill them? Mm -hmm. Now, I remember once they said to me, go into the next room. So I, I should have fought because the room I was in was cameraed. The cell I was in was a cameraed cell. So I went through all my process with the right gear, walking out slowly till your back touches. They said, go into the next cell. We're going to strip search you. We feel like you've got a weapon. But why didn't they strip search me in that cell? If I'd have just fought, but you don't think, 
So I went to the next cell, and as I went up to the to, to where the the window is, the I, there was just a split second where I thought this isn't right. Mm. And as I went to turn, they just went whack with the shield off my back. But what they didn't count on, because as soon as they obviously had a planned, because as soon as my hands touched the the wall, because instead of putting on the window, I touched the mm. walls at the side. What they didn't count on, there was a man with right gear on that hand, a man with right mm. gear with that hand. What they didn't count on is me, instead of taking my hands off so they could get me, I slid my hands round, turned, grabbed hold of one of the feet, picked them up and fell with them. Mm. And then I pushed with my legs, pushed right up and I ended up, if you've been in the jails and the sex, you've got like a corner bit and you've got a metal toilet. And I had them trapped into the metal toilet. And I got my hands up his shield. And I got my hands about that far up and I just whispered to him, do not let me get you today because you are not going home to see mm. your family. That's all I whispered. And then the panic, I heard the panic in him. He was like, <laughs> get him. Then the other officers were booting me in the face, grabbing me by the nose, pulling me back, whacking me in the neck, doing everything they could. But I didn't care. I was just focused on just looking at him. And I was going, don't let me get your neck. Mm. And he was, he was, freaking out and that was a every every day so at the end of all that was and the, was the days where you could hardly me. walk because you'd been beaten that badly yeah Did you ever make people like that in America? well listen to this this how bad it was see i thought it was just the officers you see but i i was black and blue at one point and they had me boxer shorts on and a doctor come remember a lot of them independent outside doctors were come round. And a doctor came and I said, see, my plan was get it marked down on my medical records and then I can get my solicitor later on when I move to another prison. Mm. I'll get my solicitor to reply for the medical records and then it'll have the proof I was marked. <laughs> so I'm, she's there and I'm saying, look, I've got a mark there, I've got a mark there. She's going, yep, yep, writing it all down, mm. writing it all down. But I couldn't wait. I just wanted my solicitor to get the records. Mm. So I waited a week and I... My solicitor replied, a week came. No, she was writing. Mr. Taylor is totally fine. Mm. Not one mark on him. He's fresh, seems healthy. Mm. But that doctor should have been writing down. I marked, I'm, and that's when I realised mm. the systems t to themselves is you can't beat them. You know, the, uh, you, no, you want to go against mm. the system like that, then it doesn't matter who's going in, even if it's the ombudsman. There'll be someone, mm -hmm. it, it'll always work towards the system. You can't, you can't beat them. But in, at the time, I was just like winning just one battle if I could get it. You know, I'd buzz off it. It would be like a little victory for me, what would keep me going for a couple of months until I could get another one. You know, or throw some... Uh, I remember once, I've never <coughs> said this, but I remember getting some poo and some wee and putting it in a shampoo Redox bottle, give it a shake. Mm -hmm. And there's a gap in the door, isn't there? And the, the officer come to the window and I was like, officer, I said, uh, blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't hear you because he's trying to talk to me. I said, come to the side. I can't hear you where the gap mm. was. And he had me a bottle of Radox there and I was just face And I just went mm. straight into his face. And, and that's the, it, it was like a, mm. it's like a constant. Didn't it? So this went war. on for years. So <clears throat> when you, when you buy them 10 by a foot cells on your own, did you not think, hang on a minute, Shane, this is. I'm losing patience with myself here. Not really. No, I, do you know what? I'm a, I, I like being, this might sound crazy, but when you, when you have problems like that, being alone is a good thing. Mm. Now, there's, 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 a, there's being alone and, and, and being alone, and how can mm. I explain that? Some people enjoy their own company, and some people are just alone, sad. Yeah. Just being alone... Doesn't doesn't some people thrive off that, and I'm one of them. Mm. I love it. So when even, I was in my cell, yeah, I love it. Uh, less people to do a dodge on you. Do you know mm. what I mean? So it's it's it's. I like it. Mm. I love it. Because we're not talking about normal prison, are you? You're not. You never had a radio. Or... At, at the beginning, I didn't. yeah, you did. When you were I, when you were behaving like this for years, oh, there was you nothing, never no. had. I was on good order and it's G-O-D, good order and discipline. So it's like, a, and then CSC within that, the good order and discipline just means that the, the government have permission or the, the governor to be able to keep you in the segregation unit for mm -hmm. long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And then you get assessed 
at the end of that period. So say that say it was a six month period or a three month. After that three month, they have to reapply to say why they have to keep like to keep you down even longer. And I was just down for years and years and years. You literally just, years like that. Yeah, and then I'd be moved. To, listen That's to this. Honest. <laughs> I'd be moved to one from one set. I'd be shipped out, mm. thingied up and everything, put on the paddy wagon, mm. took to another jail, and took straight to the seg. Now legally, yeah, when you you haven't done anything in that prison, you should go straight to the wing, and then if you do out, then you go to the seg. Mm. Now I was going straight on good order and discipline in there, and staying there for months, and then I was just getting moved somewhere else. Yeah. And if it comes time to put you on the wing, mm. they'll just come and jump you and say, you jump them, keep you down longer. But I, I, at them I mean? times, Shane, you were just not cut out to be put in that kind of environment oh, on the no. wing because you'd have had a car crash. And uh, I was talking to Ray Morton on today, the police officer on the way up here. And uh, in the, one of the, the early Lee Duffy books, which I didn't, done, didn't do, um, it describes how Duffy was on in 18 prisons in 26 months. He was actually in 26. And the reason by, why is um, they call it the ghost ship. So yeah, in America it's called diesel ghost therapy. therapy. Shanghai. Diesel therapy. Ghost therapy. So yeah. when someone goes to a prison, like Reggie Cray, he, um, he'd be in like a prison for a week and they'd come to his cell and move him. And the reason they do that is to break the spirit. So they don't, they don't have the authority, they can't be influenced by other people. Say, were you, were you, did that happen to you? Yeah, it's, 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 it, for me it was great because you get sick of the same prison. So to, to, <laughs> you get, if you're stuck in the same prison, yeah. every couple of months I'd be shipped out or whatever. Mm. It was great because it was something new. It was yeah. different. It would change. It was a day out on the bus get, and all that. Yeah, you would get used to that, and then you'd be shipped out again. Then you mm. get not what it's to do is if they feel like you've got any form of influence on yeah. the wings or anything. It's to make sure that you can't get on that wing long enough to make an influence to be able to start getting involved in things and start doing what you do. And if they feel like you have any involvement, like in the drug scene or whatever, which I had did, I did in some prisons with uh, heroin and stuff. Did you? Yeah, but yeah. So I was, was on good. Was... I was put on good order and discipline for it, man. Right. Uh, smuggling, uh, uh, smuggling drugs into the prison, mm. uh, it, and then uh, in Parkhurst Prison, I was uh, segregated off for it as well. So I ended up going to H HMP. Um, what prison was it? I think it was Long Larton, Worcestershire, mm. and that's why I ended up going to there from there. But. Yeah, I was. Uh, I got involved in it a lot. It'll be if they could get my security files. Mm. If they got my security files, they'll see straight away. So you at one point you were cut D, cut A, weren't you? Not cut A, no. What were you then? Just segregated off constantly. Just too much, too much of a risk. Yeah, you could just, not. You were like a stray dog with rabies. You just yeah, literally couldn't be trusted. I am a stray dog with rabies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously you've been around Shane. Listen, it's not. It's not proud. You, you know. You no, can laugh definitely. At, we can not. laugh about it now. But you must have been a cr you could, you've you know even in times when you were segregated off could you still hear people lunatics in the next door? Because <clears throat> I done them I done the Roy Shaw book with Gary Shaw and uh, he said do you know what he said at times I mean Roy ended up in Broadmoor and it wasn't because he was uh, it wasn't because he was crazy it was just because that was the the last the last place to put, and he, you know, and uh, he said he was surrounded by screams and cries of lunatics 24 hours a day. Yeah, Were I you would, like that, or? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. So, so let's well, not. let the system say could that you, you're Could winning. you hear, hear people? Oh, yeah, I've, 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 I've heard gangsters screaming like girls when they're getting beat up the screws mm. as well. Because you've come across and, some, and, some really notable characters in Britain, haven't you? Yeah, I've, I know, I've come across a few people, Can yeah. you name a few? <sighs> um... I oh, hope he's all right. Stevie Gillen. Stephen yeah, Gillen. You, you've had him, haven't you? Stephen Gillen's doing phenomenal. Yeah, he's unbelievable. He's, it's unbelievable what he's doing. Yeah. Empire. Mm. Yeah, so I, with Steve, Steve and him... I, I mean, not, you've got a funny story about him, I, haven't you? Yeah, Set well, you I'll, I'll not mention the other lad because I don't know if he'll want mention, mm. but I think Stephen's already said I, I'm yeah. all right to mention this little yeah. bit. But how I met Stephen, you could tell he's he's yeah. got his hands and everything. Mm. But I used to say, me can't eat up. I didn't, I didn't need to spend it. So yeah. let's just say, like, every week you can get 20 30 pound if you don't spend it it builds up for the next week and then builds up for the next week mm. and if you just don't spend it mm. i'll not say why i didn't have to spend it mm. but let's just say i didn't need to spend it because i got my own canteen off other people and that's as mm. far as i'll say about that mm. but i had thousands saved up 
in my mm. account. Steve comes along with his friend, shifty ass. Mm. You know what I mean? You know that gangster shiftiness mm. kind of thing. Comes along, he's like, eh, have a word with you. He says, yeah, of course. Where was that at? He said, uh, this was in uh, Whitemore, HMP Whitemore. So he's like, he's come in, he's like, look, I've heard you've got grands. First mm. of all, yeah. I'm thinking, how do you know? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> how does he know that? Yeah. But anyway, mm. he said, yeah. He said, well, I'll make a deal with you. He says, you spend £100 every week on the canteen, and I'll get £200 sent into you. I was like, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to turn that down. Yeah. So he started sending me 200 quid. It was coming. Yeah. I was getting 200 pounds just sent in for a couple of, and then mm. I ended up, I ended up getting muffed up and battling with us because uh, I was next door to his pal, and they come in, you know, the gear on. So a little bit after that, but that was the first time I met him. And then I started battling with the officers, and I actually got, I remember the lads and that on the wing saying, "Flip and heck, he's how long he lasted there." Like mm. I got, like everyone was talking about it. And then uh, even when they dragged me out the cell, they were saying, are you going to walk? No, all of them out of breath. I was mm. like, carry me. They're like, mm. you know, we're going to use your head with every door. I said, use it, you know, mm. <laughs> to stop it. <laughs> then I got shipped out to, yeah, so I was in Long Larton for a bit. Then Steve and, and that other lad came in there and 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 I was on the wings with them a bit then mm. as well. So it was just like, and then I was out after about a year after that and then I, I become a Christian actually. Mm. In that sentence. We'll talk about that later, but who was uh, the panther you were in with? Oh, that's, uh, I'd, I'd, I wasn't, I <clears throat> used to just see him. I think it was in um, Full Sutton. Mm. So I was in Full Sutton and you just see this old guy. The Black Panther. Yeah, the Black Panther used to be called, and he used to be you an old, is, yeah. he used to be an old guy who used to just like walk about and everyone would be like, oh, that's the Black Panther, that. Yeah. And at the time I was just like, oh, who's he? Because I didn't have a clue. Mm. But since then I've seen some documentaries on him and, how did he get that name? I think it was over, he uh, used to do robberies and all that, and there's something about a Black Panther he used to get left mm. or an ornament or, I don't know, something like that. But in the end, he ended up doing, trying to kidnap a young lass to get her, like, off millions of pounds mm. and try and do, her, like, a ransom, but it all went wrong. And, and like, obviously, she slipped or something mm. and ended up dying or something. And, uh, any others? Any other people uh, you come across? There's loads of people. Some people I can't, I can't say. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I've, I've, I've asked, I've mentioned them once, but they don't mm -hmm. want me to mention yeah, them yeah. again. Um, so, so that was that was your life for years. Yeah, fighting with the system. It was just the mine was mainly against the system. I hate the officers. Um, did you never think? Hang on a minute. These are just normal people going to work, families. So were they just these? It's hard. Just... It's hard to see that, Jamie, when they're coming in and and, and doing stuff, and you know. That not only had to do and stuff. Do you that, think they ever done anything with your food and that? And... Oh, the, the, it's guaranteed. If you're stabbing the prison officers up and that, mm. what do you think they're going to do? That's just normal. Yeah. That's just normal stuff. You know, at the end of the day, they come in with a mentality that we're the scumbags to top security prison. You, you deserve to be in here and, and we'll treat you how we need to treat you. You keep your mm. head down. If you don't, we'll, we'll do whatever. But they always say they do things, you know. And and that's the way that that's the way it works. That's that's how mm. it is. Everybody knows that. Anyone's been in a maximum security prison in a dispersal system, mm. I'll tell you now what it's like. And you can have a you, you end up with it. They've got a, a thing, haven't they? Called the POA, the Prison Officers Association. They're the gangsters. They're mm. the real gangsters in there. Um, that's what any any prison. A lot of prisoners will understand what mm. I'm saying right now. If they've been in a dispersal, it's the POA. Mm. But They're do you know what? Don't you find shame for people who've been in prison? You, you really learn some amazing things in there. Like, obviously, I I got eighteen months when I was a kid. I was a teenager, but things like cutting matches in half or yeah. fastening your bed down to the or Making you know lines. scrape the hole. There's so many things yeah, in, like in, in the prison environment environment that you think. How would you even genius, fucking know how to think yeah, that? Genius you, stuff. you meet some amazing switch <laughs> yeah. on people in prison. Did you find yeah. many things like that? Yeah, <laughs> that, well, I would just start into everything anyway. I was trying to do all sorts. Like I discovered how to take the, the things off. So they've got like special screws. You know, when you get them star screws and stuff. Mm. And I thought one day, oh, I'm going to try this. So I got like a knife and loosened it a bit. And then I got this uh, metal thing toothbrush thing and mm. melt at the end so it was just proper melting and I just went boom mm. stuck it on and it imprinted you know to the mm. to, to the actual shape of the thing and it loosened the screws and stuff and mm. then we used to make kettles with the marvel tubs 
you know, wire them to the lights and put them down. You used to get a razor blade, mm. put the two razor blades in, chuck it in the water, it boils your water in the marble tub. All sorts of and, stuff. Uh, the water obviously- lines, you know. So if you wanna, so if there's like, <laughs> if there's like, a, um, if there's like someone you wanna pass someone to, and he's mm. like five or six doors down, you'll get like a big wire what you make out your bedding, mm-hmm. he like a cotton thing. He'll make one off there. You get your little knife or yeah. a mirror. You put it under the door and face yeah. it that way. Boot it. It'll go flying down. Mm-hmm. Then he'll do it. It'll go over. And then when he pulls it back in, it pulls your line in. Mm-hmm. Like just little things yeah. like that. It's like it's Did mad. you see stuff like that in America? Yeah. I remember when I arrived at Supermax, what you said, they had all these fishing lines, they call them. And the weight on the end is a little toothpaste thing that they throw <laughs> it out with. But when I first arrived... Things were going from cell to cell on like the ground floor, but there's an upper tier and things were going. So I couldn't see the lines. All I could see was like an envelope in space <laughs> or like a Snickers bar or something. And it, it was like poltergeist. I thought all these things are just floating around. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah fishing lines. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and the shit slingers as well. You mentioned about the shit. Out What's there, they weaponized the shit a lot. They have a whole, whole run of just shit slingers. What's that mean? What's so like they they people who weaponize their poo against the staff? Oh yeah, or against other inmates. But yep. there was one guy called Magnum. He was like the Rambo of the shit slingers, <laughs> and he would like rig his whole cell up with shampoo bottles and tubes and everything, and get them. So they came in. They came in. They took everything out of his cell. They got him naked, handcuffed behind the back, put him in a dry cell with nothing at all, and then they checked on him every so many minutes. And then um, they underestimated his resolve. <laughs> so what he did was he fucking shat on the floor. <laughs> he fucking mouthed it. Oh. And he, he, he stood at Wait the door again. waiting for the guard to do a security walk. So the guard's face comes. They think he's got no way of doing anything. And he just unloaded. And he said the, the guard went, was so surprised. He went like that. And it went up his mask and into <laughs> his nose. <laughs> <laughs> But to, vi- but to him, that's a victory, you see. Yes. And that's what it is. <laughs> yes. And it's that little, it's like a battle and a war between you. Yeah. Not many people last it. Not many mm. people caught. You end up mentally ill or whatever. Yeah. I thrived off it, to be truthful. It just mm. kept me busy. Yeah. You know, instead of being sat in the cell. Yeah. You know. When do you, th- when do you think, Shane, that you started suffering with mental health? Do you think you were always like that? I think there was, uh, I, I don't know if I was always like it, but I, I do, I just... I remember starting to watch it. I was about 12, 13. Mm. No, about 14, 15. Still being a bit of a victim. And then I just started to just, I don't know, just started to watch films and started, mm. uh, my mentality started changing a bit. What films? Like, uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Uh, casino and all uh, that. Casino and stuff. And, and there's a bit in Goodfellas where he's uh, where at the beginning where they hear the bang on their boot mm-hmm. and they pull up and they open up and the man is still alive. So he pulls out the knife and he starts sticking mm-hmm. it in. You can hear it, can it's, like it's pretty graphic. Squelch. But yeah. uh, my first time I watched that, my hair's all stood on end. Mm. Not not the part, just the, the stabbing bit. Mm. My hair stood on end and I got this like feeling of a rush. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yes, I want to be like that. I want to mm. kill people. I want to actually kill people. And then I started getting it in my head. I thought, honestly, I, I just... You thought that was your vocation in life, was yeah, to kill someone? to go and kill people. And then I used to date, like daydream about how I could get away with it and plot mm. things and if I can kill because 10 people me and you, before I get caught. Me, me, me and, and you, Shane, we've, had a, we've had a few laughs over the text. And uh, this sounds... It's quite... You can, it's a bit funny if you take it in a, a black sense of humour, but you actually wanted to be the next Richard Kuklinski. Do you know who he is? Oh, yeah. The Iceman? Yeah. Yeah. I've watched all <laughs> his interviews and I've watched the movie. And yeah. uh, Shane would be fascinated by yeah, him. Yeah, so, so that just shows you where my mentality was, mm. is Richard K- Kuklinski, the inside the mind of a mafia hitman. Yeah. I'd watch that and get rushes off it. Like there's parts in it, what was my mentality? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And you'd look up to that type of thing. And, and he was my hero. So that just shows you if someone like that's your hero, you, you're not mm-hmm. you, you're not wired right anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, your hero should be like a teacher, a police yeah. officer, a, 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 a fire brigade or, you know, a government or a celebrity. No, mine, a mass 
mafia flipping serial killer. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That was who I was looking up to. He was interested, though, was he? Because he had a family and just, everything. Yeah, but it was just the way it, it was his de demeanour mm. to it. Do you know what my wife says? He was detached, wasn't he? He yeah. had a voice that you'd let you'd let him read your children bedtime stories. He's got the most fascinating <laughs> voice ever, like Dennis <laughs> Nielsen. Yeah, do you know he's almost like. Just, do you know sometimes me and the missus have, have listened to him falling asleep? Yeah. If you're listening to his voice. But uh, Shane, there's no doubt you've seen, obviously you've indulged, but you must have seen a lot of bad attacks inside prison. Oh, I've seen, yeah. What kind of things go on if you want to tell people who are watching? In a British prison system, right, what, what are the day-to-day -day things that people do not know is just... So in a normal prison, <clears throat> in normal like non-security prisons, yeah. it's like the risk of like boiling water and putting sugar in and pouring mm -hmm. it over your face so that the boiling water sticks to your face. Mm -hmm. Just the general stabbings, slashings, you know, uh, just stabbing people up, slashing them. You know, a lot of people get slashed, you know, they'll make like razor blades where they put three or four razors on. And the they used to do it with one. So they can't they, stitch so they can, Yeah, so it can't, be, it can't be glued or something. Yeah. So it has to be stitched up with these bigger bigger marks. Or so, I don't know what, what that is. So it's, you saw people's faces get melted yeah. off. Yeah, everything. Well, in the dispersal in the top security prison, see, you can cook on the wing, you see. So what happened is a screw, uh, a screw got his face melted off. So some inmates, I don't know why, but some inmates plotted, they boiled, boiled a, a pan of full of oil, cooking oil, and they ran out and they set it all up. He come on, caught him in the middle of, so he couldn't get off the stairs, and he just chucked the oil over him and just melted him mel like, so it got banned. So what the inmates started doing is getting butter. Mm -hmm. So you'll buy loads of loads of tubs of butter, and when you melt it, it turns. They call it ghee, and it turns into ghee. So when you melt it, it's all oil, and then you just drain off mm. all the rubbish in it, and then you've just got pure oil out the butter, mm. and then they'd use that, burn that, and then like boil that, and like so that happens. You can get hot stuff chucked over you and in the dispersal i think the difference between normal prisons and the dispersal is in normal prisons when people are running in your cell it's probably to give you a good hide and or have a scrap with you but in the dispersal they need they, they want to take you off the wing and and the reason being is because they don't want you to stay on the wing after you've attacked them because you're going to come back and retaliate and everyone's dangerous in the dispersal mm. so what they'll what it's all about is if they're going to get you off, they want to get you off. So that's kill you or seriously put you in hospital. Mm -hmm. That's the intention. So there's that little bit of an extra bit of tension when you're in a dispersal of looking over your mm -hmm. back, watching yourself, making sure someone doesn't get one over you. So you just, I used to just keep myself myself, but my battle was mm -hmm. a system. Yeah. So it you, against so you the were, against the, you weren't against you set you set yourself your next door neighbours. It was the system. It was a screw. Well, if someone come and put it on me, then obviously I'm I'm not gonna I'm I'm gonna retaliate. I'm not gonna stand there and get mugged mm. off. And I would have if I felt like someone was gonna do mm. something, I'd be running in and stabbing them up. And I've had a few times when I've run in cells in jail and done a few people. Mm. And in fact, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but there was a lad in there. Um, it, I was on the cleaners, and someone had wound him up, you not know, to get him going because they wouldn't have they wouldn't do it themselves. So this lad, I don't even know, I was going to mention his name, but I'd rather not. But I, I remember uh, he come up, come running up the stairs. He went, you get in here, took his top off. And uh, he, I walked into the cell. I went in the cell, I took my top off, walked into the cell. And to my benefit, he pushed me that hard, like we're arguing. And he pushed me that hard that it made me bounce off the wall back to him. But that was great because I've managed to crack him. So he's pushed me that hard. I've jumped back. He's in for murder, by the way. Jumped back. And I bounced off the wall and just went crack and I dropped them straight away. Mm. The first hit. And I thought, he's not getting up. So I grabbed his head and I was just mm. laying into him, laying into him, laying into him. Just booted him in the face. Just, and I didn't realise what I'd done. As I was walking out the cell, a woman officer was like, what are you doing? And she saw his face. And then she started running down the landing saying, get behind your cell. I went, I knew I was going to seg then. So I went off, off. Mm. And going so, nowhere. Two things, Shane, I want to ask you. Um, obviously, you're very qualified to answer this. So British prison system, the first one is hooch. How much of that goes on inside prison? All, all the time. <laughs> How do you do it? There's all sorts of ways what I didn't used to do, but there's, you can get bread, ferment bread in water, put it mm. in a bag, keep it sealed, let all the yeast come out of it, mm. and then you start from there. You can do it by getting making or pure orange juice go off. 
mm. and then start feeding it all with sugar and stuff. And how, how potent is it? Oh, it can be. It can blind you if you do it wrong. So you, it's a horrific hangover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it can. It can. Well, it causes riots sometimes. Mm. Everyone gets drunk and then kicks off. <laughs> how long does it take to make days? It can take a while, yeah. It depends on who's doing it and how good it is. Mm. And you get one little bit of germs in it or any, it can mess up straight away and go wrong. But you've got to keep it right. So the main way to do it is one's person will put it in his cell, he'll have a bag, chuck some water in, chuck loads of bread in, mm. and that's to get the yeast out of the bread. Didn't Wildman do it? Wildman did loads, but we had it made. Cause but didn't he actually do it outside of prison, like just for the crack? Um, he did a lot in prison because it's so hot in Arizona. Yeah. It cooks against the wall. So if you're in an Arizona cell, almost 50 degrees, your wall is like, it's mm. like an oven. Mm. So they, they get the bag and put it against the wall and the heat goes into the bag. And like you said, then it's like, they've got like, um, they put candy in there for the sugar. Yeah. They put bread. And then in the jail we were at, the sheriff, like, you see him on the news, he's, cleaning up rat infested neighborhoods of grapefruits mm. and the next that'll be our breakfast the next morning <laughs> so everyone just you know get the fruit mm. in there the, the juice the sugar the bread mm. but you gotta burp the bag every so often yeah otherwise it explodes yeah 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 it's just getting the yeast basically you need that yeast don't you and then you feed bread, it don't yeah. you did you do that yeah. much um, was it like an escape from prison yeah it was i didn't use it i was <laughs> see like i was paranoid so i i was i would never get wrecked i would never get and out like that mm. it wasn't for me that all i was all i got involved in is when i went to uh parker's prison someone clued me right up and i started using my head mm. and i started making lots and lots of money in uh out of drugs and stuff mm. in fact but i was heroin, dragged in the, the heroin, cycle. Said, yeah, yeah. yeah and heroin yeah, 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 started yeah, yeah. Uh, heroin get, uh, coming through it and it was, it was mint how, how much form. of that is inside like being oh, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. there's more it's in the jail than the out Mm. More in jail and on the out. Did, did people owe you debts then? And did you have to like enforce debts to, for that? No, so it was, uh, so it, it, it's more like, uh, so there was me and a gateshead lad, and a lad called Michael Giscom. He was in a disperse as well, black lad from uh, London way. Uh, and he was super game as well. And we were just canteens, you just get your canteens in. But the biggest thing is money, so money would go to an address, you see. So you go on a mobile phone and when once you had a customer, he's got your details of wh where that money's got to go to. So he'll just ring someone up on a mobile phone, say send £200 to this address and put this code on or put this name on. So when that gets to that address, I'll ring up on another mobile phone. Is that there yet? Oh yeah, there's something come through with one, two, three on. Or there's £100 with, um, you know, the name Riley on. Mm. And he'll, it guaranteed you're being pestered until they get the money. Is the money come yet? Is the money come yet? No. And so mm. you just got to wait. And every couple of, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of days for the money to get there. Mm. Once the money got to that address, he'd come and I'll give him it. So there was no I mean? uh, on tick? I wouldn't put it on, no. Certain people, but only if I knew them. Only if we, like, we, we knew they'd pay, because a lot of people, you just, mm. actually, I'm <laughs> telling a lie. I did get ripped off once, but I got set up. And it was uh, a lad come on the wing with a pot on his hand. And my mate was warning me about him as well. And he kept coming up saying, hey, you put it on an officer, I'll do it. And my mate come up, he went, watch him. There's something not right with him. But you know when you sort of, at the time, you hate the system that much that you don't care, it might be right. So just to take that risk, if you get caught, you get caught. Just because he, if he does it, buzzing. So I went down, we said, after a couple of days of him saying, I'll do it, I'll do it. I went down, I said, look, uh, I went to his door, I said, are you up for doing that? He went, yeah, I'm up for doing it. He said, uh, I said, I'll give you 10 bags of heroin now. And I said, once you've done what you need to do, you'll get dragged to the seg and I'll get you 10 bags of heroin passed down to the segregation unit. And he didn't do that. So he obviously got the 10 bags of heroin, sniffed, probably smoked half of it, got wrecked, mm. and then plugged the rest or whatever. And then about... On the night time, we just heard someone knocking on the door saying, Shane, get yourself ready, pal. I said, what for? He said, uh, that lad's gone off the wing, the one you paid for the hit. So I knew what was coming. Next day, the come. What did you ask him to do? Uh, get everyone, to, all the prisoners, because we like to have our own little bit back to shit and piss in the why we and poo in a bucket, fill it up, mm. you let it ferment, and then chuck it over the, the prison officer that you don't like. Mm. 
it's called shitting up the prison officers. Right. No, and they yeah. hate it. Yeah. They'd rather you'd run up and stab them or something because you could catch diseases. Yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. It's just like a bad thing. And the humiliation and the degrade of it. I think he grasped you up then. Oh, he did grasp me up. He went off and then the next day, uh, me and my pal were both dragged down the seg. Mm. And, and then I was in the segregation unit, decided, sack it, I'm going on a dirty protest. Mm -hmm. Start rubbing poo all over myself, all over my cell. And said, let's go what, to the sat wall. and sat there for hours, innit? Sat there for days, what you know about hours? Jesus. Are you, what, familiar, what, are you what familiar with the Jimmy Boyle story? Every time you poo, every time <laughs> you poo, you, you don't just do it once, you know, every time you poo, you've got to freshen yourself up because it flakes off and that, doesn't it, when it gets yeah. dry? I don't know, I've never done it. <laughs> <laughs> are you familiar with the Jimmy Boyle story? Jimmy Boyle? Yeah. Is he out of Scotland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, yeah, for some Dirty of it. Pro, that's the original yeah. kind of uh, Bellini was was IRA were doing the yeah. dirty protest. Was, uh, the, he was never going to see the light of day ever yeah. again. And uh, my dad was in Bellini. It's like a form of protection as well, mm. because <coughs> they don't want to run in your cell and bash you when yeah. you've got poo all over yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you wet poo all over. They don't want to come in. They'll be barking. No. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, <coughs> there's two reasons. As mm. one is keeps them away from you. And and obviously too, it, it they got to come yeah. in and sniff it every day and yeah. makes a life hell kind of thing. My dad was in Bellini and uh, a lot of the screws would give him a hard time because obviously the, the thought were related to Jimmy. But Jimmy's, uh, he, he, I mean, he's he's very private now. I've got a friend who um, who rang him a few years back and he said, uh, is Jimmy there? And I said, who is it? He says, it's his friend from Glasgow. And his wife said, well, Jimmy hasn't got any friends from Glasgow and put it down. But he's an award-winning sculptor now. You know that, don't you? Wow. It's like millionaire changed his life. But a very, very famous name in um probably the Mr. Number One in Glasgow, you know, if a kind of been gangster. But uh he obviously he was known for when people say dirty protests, I think of him. So that was something you've done quite a lot. A few times, not all the time, but I did it a few times, yeah. So then I got bored and stuff. My favourite right. time was with the the shampoo bottle. It was just right. you know the victory. You know, and uh, obviously Shane is someone someone very familiar with the the pri the British prison system. Homosexuality. How much of that goes on? Because people think the films. No, it's not. I like, never seen none of it. It's not like in America. It's not like it's. Does it? It's did different. it go on in all them years? It will have, but it was it wasn't public. Mm. Uh, it wouldn't have been public, if, the, if that makes sense. It'd be behind, like two lads behind the cell door. But it was not in a top security mm. prison. It, was, it wouldn't have been public. Yeah. They're getting done in. Because you've got to remember, there's a lot of people who aren't, aren't like America's totally different, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But in, in over here, you've got to remember, it's full of all the local lads, full of mm -hmm. all the local criminals, all the local hard lads, all the local drug dealers. They don't like that kind of stuff. What do you think they're all just going to sit there and watch two lads start kissing and doing mm. stuff? They'll be like, what are you doing, man? Get away, do that yeah. somewhere else. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen behind closed doors. It probably does. You don't know what happens mm. in them cells. Mm. But, but there's out none in of the, the open... And all this. Uh, well, I've been in jail most of my life. I've never heard of many people getting... It happens, but it's... Have you heard of any? Like one? one not while I was in jail. I haven't no. been on a wing and heard of someone getting... Mm. But it happens because I have heard of it happening. Yeah. But it's not like, so in America, it'll be like, you know, probably was it, constant. Was it a lot in America. You have to go to a class in America to get taught or not to get. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's not like that. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a totally different kind of world to American yeah. jails to over yeah. here, I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, definitely. Sean, totally. you know, you same, know how. Same with everything's more organised, like even the normal street gangs. They're like an organised. Family, crime yeah. family or something, the yeah. way they go on. Over here, the street gangs are a few little chavs standing on the street corner with some Bella Brusco causing a bit of trouble because they're carrying a the knife, they think they're G's. Do you know what I mean? It's big organised crime Totally different ball game, isn't yeah. it, over in yeah. America? Yeah. Um, obviously, I've been with Michael Showers today, who was very close with, um, well, Delroy, and uh, it was his brother and Paul Sykes. And now, someone this week, I won't mention his name, give me a bit of a roasting. On his, uh, on, his, on his channel. And he said, that Jamie Boyle's full of shit. He doesn't know nothing. Now, I wasn't in prison with Paul Sykes, but what I'm going to tell you is, I've spoken to four Wakefield police officers. One of them was the top chief of police. And he said, listen, I did not like the man, but there was never any convictions. And he said Sykes was and he was all doing this. Michael spent many years with him. Uh, Chris Lambriano was next door to him in Hull for three years. And he said, if that went on, 
he wouldn't have been allowed to walk with the with, with the rest of us. Um, I went in prison to uh, visit Paul Sykes Jr. And he said, listen, if our dad was alive now, he'd admit it. Yeah, I've had sex with men. But... And all this kind of nonsense and a kind of... It's the first, the worst thing someone can accuse you of. Yeah, it's uh, it. And so, it's so you know, easily this day and age. You know, so it's listen, you know, Sykes, all this listen. stuff, what, what you're writing books about him for, films coming, how oh, I used to... This is, you know... It, you used him as a boogeyman, didn't they, to keep people in line? Yeah, I've spoken to... <laughs> Sykes um, will be put in your cell and you're going to have... <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. spoken to lots of... I mean, and I mean a lot, ex-screws... And uh, I mean, even Paddy Maloney, who you've had on your on your show a few times, Sean, he was a young lad in Durham. And the, the screws would come and say, if you don't behave, I'm putting Sykes in with you. It's a bit like Purple Lackey. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, but sometimes isn't that because he was a handy lad and he was one of the boys on oh, the Oh, he was wing. a monster. He was so because big, sometimes scary. he's one of the boys and he's like, <clears throat> you know, it, you can use that sometimes as well against you, not because... Of se like mm. sexual. So things. you never seen that in all the years you did. In, in all the years, I, I'm not like I say. I've heard of. I have heard of inmates being mm. raped in the British prisons. Of course, I have over the years and stuff. Yeah. But when in I've media, been on a wing, but when you've I, been I, inside I, prison, I, well, I was in out of prison all my life from a teenager upwards. When I was in North Allerton, I never heard of anyone getting. Raped, and half my mates who were in with me will tell you that. Mm. I was in Deerbolt, never heard of anyone getting. And I was in there for years. I was in Franklin, Full Sutton, Long Larton, Whitemore. Now, does homosexual acts happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there'll be partners who'll probably and they'll go behind the cell door and do whatever they mm -hmm. do. But it's rare in the British prisons. Mm -hmm. It happens, but it's not like like in America. It's probably like ten a day or something. You know, or is maybe it, is more. It, so it happens I don't a lot. know. It happened so much that they introduced a law called the Prison Elimination Act. Right, well, so... Which is just a joke because it's like a box-ticking exercise whereby you've got to watch a video now when you go in. There's predators in the day room. Young people are coming in. They take food from the predators and the predators say, you got to pay for that. Well, I'm going to pay for it. i got no money. You're going to get stabbed up. Well, what am I supposed to do? Go in that room over there and do whatever that guy says. And once they fall for that, that's called becoming a prison punk or getting turned out and they're rented out as prison prostitutes. And the conclusion of the class was to stop it you got to report it report anything you're a snitch or fight to the death yeah well that's, that's what everyone in the class said you need to man up and, and fight yeah so yeah it's it's, it's a joke it's a joke mm. but the thing is uh, jamie you're not you said did you see anyone get when when there's a you're not going to see it mm. they're going to do it in a blind it's spot be, yeah that's what and, and, is, and is the guy who's getting Gonna is, he gonna, is he going to say it? And yeah. keep it quiet. Exactly, so exactly. that's what I'm saying. But reported, I mean, you know, like things like that can happen, but reported. I've never been on a wing. Because if you're on the wing and someone gets you hear about it, you'll mm. know. Someone cries, you know what I mean? So I've never known it to happen, but I'm definitely not stupid to think that it doesn't happen. Mm. And that in them circumstances, if someone's probably been, but he's mm. so probably is ashamed of it, he's not said now and keeps it to himself. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But so when not... did you when did you first start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? It, it, it was when I ended up in there uh, because uh, you went to church for tea and biscuits, free biscuits, and no, that was it. Well, I went to where uh, it was. I ended up in. I got shipped out for the the, the smuggling drugs into uh, mm. Parker's prison, and I got shipped out of there. And then I went on my dirty protest, what I've just told you about. And then I ended up getting shipped back out and I went to, um, is it Full Sutton, I think, in, in Worcestershire? York. Is it no, Worcestershire? York. Full Sutton's York. Is it? I thought it was yeah. in Worcestershire, Full Sutton. No, Long Larton's that way. Is it Long Larton? Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, so Long Larton. Yeah. So I went to Long Larton. And when I was in Long Larton, went in there. And I was in a couple of weeks. And then they just opened me door and said, I'll go to education. Now, you've got to understand this because I see God in all this to be truthful. Mm. Because when they open your door, it means you've got to be on a list. So they'll have a list, and your name will be on education, gym, works, visit, and they'll come and open your door. And they opened my door and said, Go to the education. Now, when you get to the other end of your destination, there's another two officers also with that name list to let you through. Now, when you get there, you'll say, Oh, what, what are you for? Oh, I'm for education. If your name's not on that list, mm. they've got to send you back to the wing, you see not let you through. Mm. So think of this for a minute. They've opened me cell door and told me go to education. When I get to the other end, I'm not down for education. Mm -hmm. And Divine, he sent, intervention. Uh, yeah, he <laughs> should have sent me back. But I stood there and, and argued and debated. So I was like, oh, no, you've sent me all the way down here. And I was arguing. 
And I must have done one of the officers' heads in because he stepped back and went, go down to the chaplaincy. Mm. And so I walked down to the chaplaincy and I walked in. And when I walked in, there was just a circle of lads and 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 basically watching this video with this posh grey-haired lad, no talking, hello, and all that, you know. And I sat down and I thought, I, I watched the video for a couple of seconds and I thought, oh, no, it's one of them crazy Christian things, you know. <laughs> and so I was thinking, when this video finishes, because obviously everyone's in the video, you don't want to just get up and walk out. So I just thought, I'll, I'll wait for the video to finish and I'll get up and I'll go. And... Uh, Soon as the video finished, the little woman didn't even give me a chance. She just said, what's your name? I said, oh, Shane, Shane Taylor. I said, oh, your name's not on the list. I said, oh, I'm buzzing, I'll go then. But as I was going to go, one of the lads went, you get strawberry gattos and biscuits and that, you know. I went, miss, can you put my name down, please? <laughs> and I started going for that very reason. Mm. And then just kept going on it, kept going on it. And I would debate and, you know, oh, God's are oh, you all a load of rubbish and blah, blah, blah. And then one day, there's a, a day they dedicate the Holy Spirit mm. and they just pray. How, how long did it take before you were really hook, line and sinkered? I, I wasn't hook, line and sinkered until I had the experience. See, oh. I was gone, but nothing <laughs> was doing out. It was when I was prayed for afterwards and, and I had an experience. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Have you ever been to Broadmoor? No. Did they try and put you in there? The, I have, I, the problem is, is when you're anti-authority, and you don't respond to the government at all. Mm. It means you refuse to speak to psychiatrists. You refuse to speak to anybody. If they try and give you treatment, you refuse to take it. They can't do anything, if that makes sense. So they, they've got to have some sort of assessment from you eventually. If I carried, if, look, if I carried on, there's two, two, if I didn't become a Christian when Ram I did. Rampton. I would, well, my mate went in there. The, so the lad who I um, stabbed the screws up with in our mouse. Mm. On that same sentence, he ended up in Rampton uh, mm. for the criminally insane. You know what I mean? Rampton, what's yeah. it like there? And he bounced at... Uh, That's where Ronnie Cray was. Was it? That's yeah. where he, he, Beverly he, Allett and all them. It's... He bounced... Uh, <laughs> he was trying to convince him that he was sane no, when he got in there. A young Ronnie Cray that was. Then he went Broadmoor. And then he but, bounced um... the chair off his head because he thought he <laughs> was following him. <laughs> Funny. What about... Have you, have you ever, do you think you've ever been given <coughs> Lagacta? Is it the liquid kosh? Well, that's what I think I got when I fell asleep for three days, I was just saying earlier. Mm. Uh, they just didn't, they, they, there was well five of them. Your they were and everything. I just felt, I, I just remember I was awake and then like... Slows your, slows your movements, slows your brain down. Yeah, I was, well, I don't know what they're giving me. I just know I was out for three days and that was it. And and I was on me, I was in there for months and then somebody sort of clued me up. And, mm. and then said, look, start saying this and go along like this and say this kind of stuff because if you carry on this way, this he said, I've been in here 20 years. Because you were only a young lad at the time, weren't you? Oh, I was young as, yeah. You're in talking your 20s. 18, 19, <clears throat> 20, something like that, if that. It was just a, it was just a thought. It was because I didn't have any... I, I didn't even have any fear against authority. Like, I'll give you an idea. Like, I remember... Having loads of air, uh, we'd just done a, a burglary and had lo loads and loads of stuff. And the police come and everyone ran. And I just stood there. And the police officer got out of the car. He's like, What are you doing? I said, He said, What's that? I was like, Get your hands off me. So, mm. you know, I said, Take your hands off me now. I said, These are mine and I'm taking them home. You know what I mean? And, he, mm. he, and I went to pull a knife out on them and stuff. I didn't run from authority. I did, at, at one point, I remember my mate, why well, my ex mate, he could clarify this. Is uh, I remember being uh, banned from Pete Lee. I was under an order not to be able to go to Pete Lee. And I was on the run on a curfew. So I couldn't go. If I was caught in Pete Lee, I'd be on remand. And I, and I had a certain curfew. So anyway, I had loads of stuff, loads of clothes. And this Jeep, uh, BMW Jeep thing, or I can't remember what it was, it just pulled up. And there was a. a Prison and um, police officer in uh, one we hate as well. He knows exactly who, are, mm. who we are. And I just I went to run. And I thought, you know, I've had enough of this. And I just chucked the bags down and I ran towards the police car. I went, come on, and flew off. Just drove off. Didn't mm. come back and out. No back up mm. and out. Just he just drove off. Left us. Like it was crazy. Me, my mate was like, we were looking at each other. Like you could have just put me arrest me and put me straight on remand mm. then for. Did you, do you know, stuff. like Shane, with um, obviously. You had quite a fearsome reputation inside. Did 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 people try and use you and try and befriend you to make you do things? And also, did people 
like take think right well I'll I'll give Shane it so I get a name off you was that kind of thing or were you that dangerous that pe people never went I think you? when I was in normal <laughs> jails up in the north uh, uh, if certain people knew me they would have just avoided me like the plague because they just uh, I remember a lad I, I was going to say his name from Middlesbrough mm. uh, who, who he he said to me I didn't know this at the time because obviously I didn't but I was in home mm. house and he said, Shane, he said, I can have a good scrap. And I said, but you used to scare the living daylights out of me. He said, there was mm. something in your eyes. He said, we all used to just walk past you and that. And mm. I used to be paranoid thinking, someone's saying something about me, why aren't I? He's not talking to me. Mm. So I'd be stood up against the wall <laughs> like that. Everyone's going past me and going round me. And if I'd say all right to someone, he'd be like, yeah, you're right. And, be, so and you, I was you... thinking, so I was mm. getting paranoid, thinking everyone's talking about me because... Everyone's avoiding me, not realizing mm. that everyone's avoiding me because I was a nutter. And so you I were basically Pepe Lackey in a gym. <laughs> you were just like, just no, go, go away. Just keep away from them. Yeah. Not because I'm not. Don't put me in that shit with Pepe Lackey. Yeah. I don't like feeling the muscles. <laughs> you know what I mean? The ginger acne. Pepe Shane. Yeah. <laughs> ginger acne. <laughs> no, but don't put me in that shoes. People didn't avoid me because I wanted to feel the muscles. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's, <laughs> let's get that right. But just because there was something not right with me, so it, mm. people pick up that, you know what I mean? So they just avoided me like the plague in, mm. in that sense. And only a few people from my area would come up, like come over and talk to me. And even then I'd be like, because I used to be, I used to have, the, like Paul said, mm. I used to have eyes where they like to be wide and I'd be scanning everywhere. I'd be paranoid. I'd be mm. thinking everyone's out to get me all the time. So I was talking to you and now I'd be scanning everywhere and, I just was un, wasn't mm. right to be around, to be truthful. I wouldn't have been around. It, it, must, have been, it must have been a total tiresome existence. It is, it was. Just to be permanently on edge. On red alert. Yeah. Fight, kill. People are trying attack. to kill me. No one's out to get me, but in my when head. When you were in your were. cell, were you just like, right, yeah, I'm all that. right now till the morning? Yeah. <clears throat> That's the whole point. That's what I'm saying. So you I wore like a being mask on my own. Yeah. yeah, it's always a mask. It, every, it's always a massive. Were you nobody. scared or were you just that really like J just in Glasgow? No, I used to get mad. in Glasgow. They call it ra radio it. rental, which is effing can, mental. Can I explain what what the feelings like? Yeah, the feelings like this. You feel like people are out to get you, and people are being plotted against you. So you stand in there constantly thinking, "Come on." Somebody do something so I can destroy you and show you what I'm about. Mm. So you're constantly waiting. So you're paranoid waiting. So you're on edge, alert, red alert. But at the same time, you get angry. Because there's nothing happening. Because you think, no, you, you get angry because you think, I want it to happen. Yeah. Because when it does, they're going to know not to do it again. And I want to pass that message out because I'll mm -hmm. destroy them. Now, I remember the lad who asked, in the head in Hartypool. I remember when I first went into this prison, it's about 15 Hartlepool lads over in the corner. But I'd already made my big chiv as soon as I was on the wing. So I'm stood there on my own. I'm the only Pete Lee lad there. It's about 15 Hartlepool lads. Because it's quite a rivalry, Hartlepool Pete Yeah, Lee, well, it? my mates were battling <laughs> with them not long ago. But my, my, there was, um, so I'm stood there and I've got this blade and this lad come walking over and he had a batteries and pool balls and a sock. He went, oh, I'm going to use these on someone. But I thought, he's just checking. You mm. know what I mean? So I pulled my, step forward, pulled my knife out, and I went, listen very carefully, you, you little mug. Mm. I said, I done one of your boyos in. He got stabbed in the head. I said, if you're going to do anything, I said, I'll fucking kill you. I said, and go over and tell all them now, come the fuck on. Sorry for swearing, I don't like swearing normally, but that's just the reality of what I was like. And then he, he went back over to them, and I was lip reading now, because you can hear some things by watching the lips. And I saw the other one going, just do it, man. Like I was going, just do it. So I stepped off the step, off the wall, walked into the middle of the wing, stood there like that and went, come on. And I was doing Here's that. Here's Johnny. <laughs> I was just saying, come on. And they all looked <laughs> and they were like looking at us. I was going, come on. <laughs> like that. Well, like, uh, and, uh, the and, and, then, <laughs> and then I pulled my knife. I, I had my knife and I was going, like face, I was going, come on. Like that, and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't come. They all just sort of went off, off and just all just disintegrated. Mm. But that, that keeps me on edge, you see, because I know they were plotting to do some of them. Mm. They were, but, the, but, but because you know of what? my madness <clears throat> and because how game I was, 
They, 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 had, they didn't have that gameness. They don't have the gameness to run up the prison officers and stab them up. They don't have the gameness to get a life sentence. They don't have the gameness that if you come running at me and I pull a knife out and slit your throat, they don't have that. Mm. They're just little idiots in jail trying to get a little bit of a rep, but all they want is a little fight. They don't want to come up against somebody who's willing to kill them. How There's easy was it to make a knife? Like that? Oh, you can make them easy. You could you can make them through all sorts. So you can get the, you can get like no the bed your your beds are metal, and but they've got like metal things going along, and then along that way you can get one of them off and just rub it on the wall until it goes thingy. Mm. You can get two brushes, set it on fire, get about three or four razor blades while it's all like thingy. Just chuck them in so it melts in, and you can just slash them. Uh, the the da- more dangerous ones are the dead thin long ones. So if you if you could find like a bit of a pole off a fence and it was like really low metal but about, about that long, you just scrape the end into a point. You imagine that going straight through you. Mm-hmm. It goes straight in. You know what I mean? It's, it, in fact, it can go in easier than a thicker. Another way, believe it or not, is uh, the bog brush. So the end of the bog brushes, what you get, mm. you can uh, file them down off the wall and file them down into a dead sharp point. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That, but again, you've got to put like, you want stuff what, this is how I used to think, I don't know if that's normal, but you don't want things that are harder. You know what I mean? That's going to be hard. You want something what would just slide in. So if it's thin, metal, point on, you just boom. You know what I mean? It'll just go straight in. You don't have to put any pressure into it. Wow. It's like a butt, like butter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's what you want. I mean, there is some despicable acts of violence and like inside. Uh, uh, did you ever see when there was like five onto one and all that and some horrible bullies and? Yeah, I've I've seen it. I've been involved. I remember when the Bradford riots went on. I can't <laughs> remember what year it was, but it was around about two thousand and one, two thousand two, or something like that. I can't remember the exact mm. date. But all all the lads came in, Asian lads and stuff, and they started there uh, taking over in the sense of like taking the pool, but mm. the pool stuff. And I remember them coming up to me. See, they're all like, I just think that when they, you've got no guts, they always go up to the people with the guts and wind them up. Mm. So I'm stood there. I didn't even play pool. <laughs> I didn't even play mm. anyway. But one day the lads come up and said, look at that chain, man, look. They took the pool the table. Mm. I was like, all right, I hope mm. they're good at pool. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. He went, no, but think about it, chain, man. It's North East Jail. They're coming up here. Like, this, that's the table we used to play on. It was like, and? They were mm. like, yeah, but it looked like mugs. So it wound me up. So I, I went, right, leave it with me. I, I said to the other, I said, get a couple of lads. A couple of lads come. I said, right, you're up for it. I said, I'll sort it all out. You, if When all the other lads join in, I said, just jump in. They were like, yeah, no problem. So I walked up the pool queue, and then one of the uh, uh, Bradford lads or whatever, the whoever, he had like a, a the pool cue he was playing pool. I went, he gives a look at that. He gives a pool cue. I went, whack. I went through his head, but he put his hand up, mm. snapped his wrist. And then I, all the other lads come running around and all the Middlesbrough lads and all that mm. just ran over and they were all scrapping. But listen to this. They didn't even see me do it. Once I did that and started off, I jumped into the doorway, chucked the pool cue and I just stood there like that. Mm. No, the officers did. Ran past everyone fighting. I wasn't fighting. They didn't see me hit them. Mm. They didn't see me do anything. They ran past all the lads fighting and come and got me and dragged me in the seg. Mm. And I actually, the next day, I made that to them. I said, did you see me do it? No. Did you? And I, they actually had to put me back on the wing afterwards because there was no evidence. <laughs> but the, that's what they did. That's how bad it was. They ran past all... There was like three or four lads all fighting each other. And they ran past them and come mm. to me. Then there was another time uh, these uh, and th- there's people who witness this, people from Pete Lee who, who watch this now. They'll clarify what I'm saying. But there was uh, um, there was these uh, lads from London. There was a riot in a London prison. They all got sent up north. But one of them wanted to ship out, and so he was trying to do stuff so they'd ship him out of that jail to get back down south. And this is no word of a lie. And if if people who were in prison who was listening to this now make a comment to say that this is no lie, what I'm saying, because mm. people don't believe it sometimes. But there was about 15, 20 Middlesbrough lads, about 15, 20 Artipool lads, about seven County Durham lads, and I was in them, Pete Lee lads and a couple of Seaham and Merton. 
and then like the Bradford lads over here. And every time, you know, if you know people, you can mingle in amongst mm. the groups and stuff, but mainly all the Teesside lads are together and all that, right? This lad, black lad, ripped up the death and he, he just top off, went running towards the Middlesbrough lads, right? And he was going, come on, and jumping towards them. And I'm not lying. Listen, if there's people, make a comment and they said, I'm not lying, that this has happened. All, all the lads from Middlesbrough all jumping back, going, <laughs> like, going like that. And he was going, come on, come on. Then he did it to the Hartlepool lads and that. Then he did it, got the Russ, and he got the man, I just looked at my mate Michael, well, my ex-mate, Michael English from Pete Lee. And I just looked at him, I said, are you up for it? He went, yeah, I'm up for it. So I just ran, ran towards that lad. I just swung a couple of punches at him. And then all the, the black lads jumped up at the back. And I thought it was for me. Now, see all them lads who were just backing off? They were all stood behind me, saying, go on, Shane, we've got your back. Come on, no behind me and my mate. And I, was look, I just looked at them. But as this was happening... All, all the black lads jumped up and, and then it was like a little standoff and then all the, all the prison guards come running in between us, me straight to seg, him straight to seg. Next day, I walk, they got, got us back up, said, is this all going to be all right? I said, yeah, no, no worry. Next day, comes up, walking past them. And he did that thing, you know, when they go, mm. when they do that thing, they go, like bomba clot or whatever. Yeah. He did that to me as I was walking past them. And in North Allerton at the time, they had trays, metal trays, and they were like um, like metal at the time, the plastic now, but at the time they were metal. And I just ran, ran up them, just bounced the tray off his head, mm. and just started laying into him and stuff. You know what I mean? Do you ever, do you ever look back now? Shane? That was just like normal. Yeah. Well, obviously, <laughs> people know your people know your story. <laughs> you found God. You seen the light. But do you ever look back now? Are you forty? I'm 41 coming up, yeah. So and you I look feel now old, and yeah. you look back and you think, if anyone's watching out there now, what would you say to your 18 year old Shane, 20 year old Shane? Would you think, what a load of crap that was? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. Don't know. You think um, all, that, all, that, all that hate and anger, you just look back and think, someone just said, hang on a minute, just calm down. It's just a load of rubbish. Because that's all it was, wasn't it? There's no goodness, really, was it? Years of wasted regret. years. Regret. How did it feel like when you knew you were so wrong? Mm. Just like your whole life's been a lie. Is that what it was like? Because mm -hmm. um, you, you, when you were naughty, obviously you were... Slightly different to him, you know. I was drugged up. Yeah. <clears throat> so when I sobered up in the jail and looked back, I was like, what the fuck have you just done for the last 10 years? Because drugs scrambles your brain. Mm -hmm. So you think you're like behaving normally, but you're actually doing all this crazy stuff and you're reinforcing yourself with people around you who are doing the same crazy stuff. So there's no one to mm. put the brakes on and say this is yeah. abnormal. I mean, to be honest, you're the sidekick, God rest him. He's looking at me now. Wild, Wild man. man. Yeah, yeah. And to look at him... You'd just be like, he's crazier than me, so I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, you, were, you weren't running about with an axe, stabbing people up, but you were killing the system. You were doing criminal action, and, and obviously it wasn't good. Causing harm to society, yeah. getting people on Completely drugs. ruining yeah. lives. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, for you, when you crossed over that bridge like him, but obviously, how did you deal with it? Because how did you, I mean... Sean first, how did you just think, right, shit? I just thought, right, I can't change my past. <clears throat> All I can do is go out and tell my story and I hope young people don't make my mistakes. So you've done that for the last so As soon years. as I got out, I just started talking to schools, still speaking to schools now. And when you get all the reaction from the kids and they ask all these questions and, like, you know, this, years later you get a message from them. I was so inspired by your talk, I went mm. on to do a criminology degree. Yeah, and now that. I'm this and that. that. Yeah, what, what, what do you think of doing Isn't it, it great? What? You know, is it fair to say, I'm not trying to upset you, I'm just trying to talk facts. It's fair to say that you've probably indulged in monstrous acts of violence, left, right and centre. What you? I've never spoke about and couldn't. How do you now, when you look back at 40, you know, because you've got five young children and young, do any of them know? I tell them, I, I like them to know because I like them to know where I was and how I am now. 
So I like them to know that because I like them to know about the power of God. And so I don't hide anything behind them because I've never hit, I never lie to my kids and I don't want them to think that either. So that when they get a bit older, they're going to find out anyway. So they might as well find out by me. So you've basically brought them up known as long as I remember. Like I our dad was a bit of a, <laughs> yeah. our dad was a bit in the funny farm. Well, actually Angel's just done a, um, a school thing on criminals and I was the, how was the criminal she did the right up on? Yeah. Oh. And then she's going to take a, a book and a DVD yeah. in for the teacher. Wow. <laughs> but <clears throat> I can understand yours because greed, money, Excitement. fortune, Excitement. narcissism, e ego. Ego. sociopath, where yours was just, I can't think of anything other than just being a total badass. Mental health. And wanting to kill everyone in the world. Mental health. How much do you think mental health, do you think... I think there's a few number. I know what the question is going to be if, if I'm right. If tell us if I'm not, but it's. I think there's a number of different things. Yeah. How much were responsible were you? Do you think you were fifty percent? Because no, I think I'm hundred. I don't. I don't buy by that. I think if you're mentally ill to a point where you because there's diff, there's different forms of mental health. So there's mental health where the person doesn't even know who he is. I would think he's right. Not far off. At no, certain points in your life. At certain points, but it, what I mean by that is you can. there's someone who's in cuckoo land. You'll go and try and have a conversation with them. They're not here. Mm. Then I don't think they can be classed as being capable of doing what they did. Yeah. But remember, when I was doing what I did, I still had a sense that what I was doing was wrong. I did have my problems, but I still knew when I was stabbing people it was wrong. It's just my desires were twisted. The things that would give me a buzz were twisted. But I knew it was wrong. But I got a. F the first time I stabbed somebody <clears throat> is to me at the time, uh, it, it's unexplainable that feeling. When that knife goes in and it slides back out, the noise it makes, the rush I got. Now that's clearly mental health, right? You, you're stabbing someone and the feel of it gives you such a rush, such a yes, that you want to do it again. There's something wrong. But I knew I was doing wrong. I knew I could go to jail when I was. So as you were doing it, you were thinking, "I need to get away with this. I need to plan my escape route." So you oh no, knew... I didn't do that on that one. On that one, two lads jumped off it with the pulled out knives, and I was in a standoff. Mm. So every he was there with Is his that knife. An pull? He, no, this one's in Peter Lee. Is that the nightclub one? Yeah, uh, like the club, not club. like club, the club, club one. He stood there. He stood there, and the bull pulled out knives. Now what's happening is I'm in the middle. And as I'm going towards him, he's trying to stab me. So I'm turning and going towards him. And then what I thought was, see how calm I was. What I thought, this is mad. I'm in a life and death situation with two people. And this is what I thought to myself. I thought, I know what I can do. If I, Because as I was pretending, to, as I was going for him, he was coming forward. But what I noticed, he was coming forward as in, <coughs> plunging with his head. So I thought, I'll pretend to go for him and he'll come forward and I can get him in his temple. And... In his temple? Yeah. If it had hit him, it would have went through his head, the, the strength. And what happened is he's come, I've went to pretend to go for this one. He's come forward with his head, with his knife like that. I don't know where he got taught, but that's, no. And I just, out the blue, just swung with all my might. And he just got his head back. If it had hit him, it would have went inside. With the force I did it, it would have went straight through his head. Bloody he hell. just got his head back. And it just must have missed him. And these are the words I heard. He means business him. Oh, well, let's go. And they both mm. walked off. Mm. And then I, then I was saying, get here. Mm. You pull the knife on me now. I want you more than him now lying down on the floor. The one I just stabbed who was dying. So all of a sudden, I've got five or six people all pushing me back saying, Shane, just leave it. Come back another day. Just leave it, Shane. Just leave it. They're pushing me and I'm getting to the street and I'm still shouting, I'm coming for you, you're going to die. Mm. And I got right down to the end of the street and then I heard the police and stuff. So I ran in my aunties with all the blood all over me and I was going, I've just killed someone. My auntie went, get out of the house. <laughs> oh, get out. I was going, why? She said, <laughs> no, like buzzing. He's like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then God. I just went out. I went out and um, I was running about and then I was on the run. And, and then I just thought, sack it. You know, I, was, I, I just want to go on a mad rampage, uh, just booting people's doors in. And, and 
being a nasty, horrible. But when did person. when did when did it fully? Obviously, you got your experience. But there must have been a point, literally as blatant as that, where you're just being like, I'm a really bad person. Like, uh, could, because I know, obviously I know your story, I've read your book. It was, oh, sorry, go on, I never let you finish. Though. Where, did you just have to spend the next couple of years saying sorry? And even even when you were saying sorry, people were like, oh, piss off, Shane. Take your satanic board somewhere else. Go worship the devil somewhere. People didn't believe you because you were that... Focused on killing everyone in the world. Well, I, I'll tell you an incident. It was, <clears throat> to the first part, it's um, it was more of a. It all came when I had the experience. Had that and when I did the Alpha course and I had that experience with God, and I had that electric feeling and boom, and then I had that mm. experience. At that second, see, it wasn't a gradual thing. The minute I had that experience, I felt for the first time in my life felt remorse. Mm. I suddenly started looking at things from what I'd done. See, all I'd ever done was blamed everybody else, you see. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was him, he grasped me up to the police. Oh, it was the police's fault, he arrested me. Oh, them screw of scum, they locked that door. But the reality was, I committed the crime. Yeah. I put myself in jail. And every action is a reaction. When I was being brutalised, the reality is, I stabbed prison officers up. What did I expect? What did I think the officers were going to do? What did I, did I think they were going to come in and put me on the bed and get me some pink slippers and mm. tickle me feet with a feather and give me a cup of coffee when I ask? No. Every action has a reaction and has a ripple effect. Mm. No, you want to, you know, it's just like me and you or, or us. We've got our friend. Someone stabs our friend up. We aren't going to like that, lad. Mm. Why are the officers different, you see? So I start to understand that what was happening to me was because of me. And because of my actions. Mm. And I'd never felt like that before. And then I started sitting on my bed and crying when I was... It was did almost you, was it, like... Did a, you have a, a cry, like a mourning for life? Go yeah. through a grieving process. How long did that last for? <clears throat> Still goes now. Does it? Because... Because I've got things in my life what no one ever knows about and no one ever will. Mm. And when I tell people... it's When I say just the things I can say because... I've been like caught for, or because I'll only men it's if the, it's, I'll only mention it mm. if it's known to the system. Because I'm not being funny. If I sit here now wrapping off a million crimes, the police are watching it, and I'll be arrested by it tomorrow. And I'll, you know, so it's quite obvious. It's common mm. sense that people don't say everything, every single thing. My testimony, I say what I feel's right enough to what's what. But even that to me is like a war. It's like. Yeah. It's like the the tip of the iceberg of what I've done. And when I see people going, ooh, ooh, I think, whoa, mm. that's like nothing, really. Mm. And and so I have to, I, I, there's things inside that I, I do, like I, I've done, where I, I think I've, I remember saying it before, I've been washing up. And as I'm washing up, things what I totally forgot about, because I've done that much crazy stuff, that popped into my head, you know, mm. I've I've gone to places for people. Uh, I've gone ran in people's houses and done crazy stuff. And I was wanting to go in and kill them, and and have the people who like try the people who want me to do it are in front of me pulling me out, telling me no, stop. And then they've said I'm not using you again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I get to I, I'd get carried away, mm. and so it's a little bit like you know Paul Venice or anyone who's a handy lad. They get called. They'd get called back in the day I'm on about. Someone would call them and say, oh, can you sort this lad out or whatever? Because he's a handy lad mm. and he's up for a scrap. But I would get them calls for someone who was an absolute psychopath who everyone didn't want to mess. Mm. That's who I had to go for. See, we've got... So when I'm running in them houses, I'm running in expecting someone to run back and, 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 and it's on. Yeah. And you could die in there. Yeah. Like, I mean, two questions. Is how... Time. When you... When you seen the revelation and you turned over, people were like, oh, piss off. He's on drugs, him. Like, so people yeah, wouldn't believe you. Yeah, it was, more it was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I was talking to someone before, I won't read his name, I won't tell his name, but he said, when I first met Shane Taylor, I'll never forget the words, because I didn't know you then. I just, I remember opening the Gazette and seeing this red-haired lad, England top, <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> tall, tall and handsome and all that. And uh, and he said, I was going to get signed up for Brad Pitt's model. He, but... he said, <laughs> Shane, Shane was satanic when I first met him, and only God could have changed you. Yeah. Um, you know how? How? Um, if the first days, weeks, the screws must have been like, hang on a minute, what's that tail is yeah, acting the, a bit peculiar. Weeks, yeah, they were. two weeks, expecting the bullshit to drop. Yeah, they were. And you're running about because as soon as yeah yeah, <laughs> and it's it's almost that's probably even scarier. He's running about with beads on and the Bible and this and he's like, I'm gonna you're totally fucking my head up, you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like I preferred him when he was a nutter when he was trying to kill people. <laughs> so, how long did it take? In the prison system, it never. And and in fact, actually, I'm lying because I think I remember about three months or four months before I got out. Yeah. There was a there was a big room. And it was a big, massive, long table. And the pastor come to me. He said, we don't do this, Shane. He said, but the one, uh, the number one governor wants to come and have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. He said, there'll be a, a load of people in the room, but don't I, worry. to analyse you? No, to, to, they wanted to see what, the, what, the, what the, the madness was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went in, number one governor's there. You've got the head of security, the head of... Um, prison POs or whatever, you've got social services, probation, imams, what's the mm. Jewish ones? Rabbi. Rabbis, all around this table. And he, the number one governor just said, uh, right, we're going to ask you a few questions. And I said, yeah, go on then. He said, do you think you'll come back to prison? Because they're all looking for glints of madness. Yeah, but I jumped, no, but what I did is I, I, I started preaching, saying Jesus Christ <laughs> is real. And he He's confirmed coming to it? my life. And blah, blah, blah. And I went on for about 15 minutes and then I stopped. And then the number one governor like looked and he looked at everyone and he went, does anyone else want to ask any questions? And I went, no, you're all right. No, put their heads down. But I just preached. They don't do that normally. I don't think, I don't think they do them meetings, but they were just so curious. Like I remember, yeah. I, I remember <clears throat> once the, the number one, I didn't know I was the number one governor. I was in the chaplaincy and I'd been a cleaner. I'd been a Christian for about half a year. And uh, number one, I was talking to this woman and I thought, because she's in the church, oh, she'll be probation or something to do with, like, helping the lads or something. So I'm in a full-scale conversation with this lady. She didn't tell us who she was. Mm. And I'm in a full-scale conversation with her. And she's saying, oh, hiya, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm a Christian. I've heard you give your life to God. Isn't mm. that amazing? I'm like, yeah, praise the Lord. He's coming at my life. No preaching like mm. an idiot. And then she, I'm chatting with her for about... 10, 15 minutes, full-scale conversation about the Lord and God, and she's saying, keep it up and hope you get out. And then she went, I went, also, oh, are you probation? She looked smirked. She went, I'm the number one governor, right? Now, if that was before I was a Christian, mm. I'd have laid her out mm. for tricking me for a start, mm -hmm. you know, making me think that, yeah. You know, I, 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 we, I had no... In fact, at one point, I remember when I was going on an adjudication with the governor, the officers would be in riot gear, but so would the, the governor and the outside adjudicator, which is a judge. Mm. They'd all be in riot gear with the helmets on. And I'd still have to be handcuffed. And I would still try and have a go at something, mm. you know? And it's what the system does to you. It, 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 put, it can put you in this one-minded war. You and them, you don't care if you get out. But then when I become a Christian, I can't explain it. It, it, it. You can't explain it any other way. You can't explain scientifically. You can't explain it psychologically. Mm. I was thinking exactly the same way, plotting to kill people, involved in drugs, involved in everything on the wing, right up, even when I was on the course, the Alpha course, throughout the weeks, until I had that experience. The second I had that experience, it was like something left me. It was I can't explain it. All I could only human term of explain it was it was an energy rush in my body. It got powerful and powerful. It started coming up and then it just shot up my body and I uncontrollably sobbed and cried my eyes out. And from that moment on, I was a totally, totally different person. It totally changed the way I think. <clears throat> now, do I struggle? Of course I do, I'm human. But the way I was, it was almost like everything was different. It was it, the way I thought, my thought pattern. Had, it's almost like someone had come in with a key and just went click yeah. and everything just changed. Every, I, I, getting these emotions I'd never had before, 
this is not like a gradual thing. This was right up that second when I had what that year experience. Was this? 2000, I got out in 2007. So, so you're talking around about 2006. Right. Now, Shane Taylor, 40 year old, middle aged. So you potentially, you're halfway through your life, but everyone knows what Shane Taylor's done in the past. Um, but what, what are the plans now? Because we've heard you on your podcast, we've seen you on other podcasts, second time we've been to Sean's. But you're talking about, people talk about a message. You've got a message more than anyone because you've lived it and you've repented and you've been through the worst of the worst. So isn't it better to spread your message and say, don't do as I was. Look Obviously. at that daft, daft young lad, chip on the shoulder, head full of nonsense. Wouldn't it be better to go now and spreading it? Because I, I, me and Paul Venice, we, we want to do things. Uh, I've got him for home house prison. I, I have been doing that for... Middlesbrough College, uh, North Allerton Naughty Boys School. Um, but to really just go on the road, have you ever thought about maybe building up a little help centre for yourself? Like, Because you, more than anyone, know how to do it. At, at some point, things like that are going to happen. That's a fact. But at, at, I've been going around for... <laughs> 15 year going all over the country into prisons doing my testimony and stuff mm. I mean you give your testimony out in front of thousands of people haven't thousands you? yeah but the, the best thing for me and I'll tell you what the best thing is it's it's you say about what's your plan what's the future thing well my plan is always this first of all I know God's real and I will do everything in my power to give my testimony and do my talks and to reach out to anybody who's struggling who finds it hard uh, to give the life to God because that's the way. Now, in that, I also get an absolute buzz. And, I, and I'll tell you why is because I feel them. Is when you get the lads who are in a criminal life and they'll message you mm -hmm. saying, What do I do? Mm -hmm. I want to, I've watched your testimony, I've, I've seen what you do, but I just don't know how to do it. And all my message to them is always going to be is, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. Because I know where they are. And it's, it's hard because mm. when you've got that mentality, you don't want it, mm -hmm. where you don't want to back down. So someone mugs you off. You would love to just be like a normal person, just walk off from it and say, you know what, I don't care, mm. big deal. But see people like us and the lads out there who probably is listening. You can't, and it bothers you, and it plays on you, and it's, mm. it mentally destroys you. And you, there's one thing is revenge. Mm. And I hear so many people call out to me, do you know what I mean? Mm. And it's sad because I've been there. Mm. I mean, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt him, but Sean, you won't know this. Uh, Shane... Um, I mean, he's, he's toured with Nicky Gumbel and all them, is it? Nicky Gumbel, yeah. He is massive in the Christian world. Like, you know, Sean, you're showing up with the true crime world. So, I mean, not so much last couple of years, but he was going around talking, meeting everyone, them footballers. Um, so, you know, there is... There is... Well, there's, there's hundreds of people, <clears throat> lots and lots of people who give their lives to God because of my testimony. From all forms, warps of life, I've, I've had... Prison officers, mm. police officers. Uh, but you've also say, met... Won't say who, but pro, uh, pro, uh, professional footballers, mm -hmm. um, criminals. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, give the lives to God over. and, and Or if it, they've not given the lives, it's put them on that path of trying it out and going down and trying to find God. And, and, and they might not be there yet, and they might be just trying and There's searching. There's a lot of people half and half. How did you deal with, right, being in half? And what I mean is you're in limbo, wanting to know God, and it's fine, but people going, here, Shane, give me that now. So do you follow God, or do you, do you, does the devil pull you and say, I'll, oh, go, I'll go and iron you out in five seconds? Yeah, well, so how do you deal with it? When it, it? Mentally, it's the hardest thing you can possibly do. Because it's almost day. like having a sleeping tablet and, and having an ecstasy. No, yeah, you don't know really what you're to do. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Am I awake? Am I asleep? That's my struggle to this day. Yeah, and I can I see know, your, your struggle. I know that I don't care about... This, I, I'm not just saying this. I don't care about human beings. They do not scare me. In fact, the bigger <laughs> the better, because when I do come and take you out, bigger name for me when I go into jail. That's, that's how I think. I don't really give a damn about that. Mm. But... 
I know what happened to me mm. and I know God's real. And so when I have them struggles, it's like sometimes it is, it's like a, a devil and an angel on each side. And one Even minute today. it's like this. And when people go, well, it's when people do things against you, what a, unforgivable in the sense of if you're a Christian, mm. yeah, you've got to I mean, go you, you've been route. in the public spotlight, I mean, for years, but particularly maybe the last 18 months, other podcasts. So, Sean, um, obviously done bits of myself, but you must have had message, oh, Shane Taylor, who do you think you are? I never get them. I don't get them. Shut and off. And it's not just me. <laughs> it's not just me and Sean. I don't get them, and even if I did, I wouldn't respond. Yeah. Is it I hard? Just, just Is it? Never bothered me. Listen, I've always been an outcast anyway. Yeah. It makes no difference <laughs> to me. I always will be. And I don't, I don't mind. And I probably will be for Jesus too. Mm. Because that's the kind of people Jesus really picks. If you look at, if you look in the Bible, it's always the, the mad ones and the, the lowly of society Jesus yeah. goes to, yeah, yeah, picks yeah. them up and, and they go off and do great things. It's them the self-righteous, judgmental... Yeah people who think they're up here who are looking down on them who tend to be the enemy of God actually in the Bible uh -huh. mm -hmm. and this is what we fail to realise that God comes for people he comes for everybody and he's always there for everybody but sometimes the pride of those who look down on people and think they're better are the ones who um, are the ones who are harder to get into the hearts because mm -hmm. you can't get it because it's harder because they're just mm, mm, mm -hmm. me I don't need God what are you doing in the gym these days? Oh, I've been training like mad yeah I'm training Training all, I train four four and a half hours a day in the gym with me and my pal Molly. How many He's how strong. many body parts? Eh? How many body parts? Every, I the... train a part a day, four hours. One part for four hours. So chest, back, shoulders, arms, legs. Because I mean, I've seen pictures of you back in your day, Shane. I'm big now, but you won't. No, be but you you were in can't a can't see it now. But men's the shape, one. like oh, I was ripped. You look like a stripper. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, oh, obviously, thanks. you put no, you put a bit of weight on. When now, you've, you, <laughs> now, now you've got, you've kind of found your mojo back. Yeah, I'm back. In the so, for people watching this, how can people contact Shane Taylor? Just my e email or Facebook. I'm on Facebook. If you want to add me on Facebook? Uh, I'm on um, Instagram. So Instagram, Facebook, or my email. If if I what's your email address? Uh, PT Shane. 89 at gmail.com Twitter? Uh, Twitter, I, I have it, but I, I take the app off and every now and then YouTube. I go on. YouTube, I'm on YouTube, yeah, Is so it? just type in Shane Taylor on YouTube. And uh, as I said, you're halfway through your life, so, you know, you sound like you, you, you're back with your training, a lot of good things, uh, bonfire night out there, my dog will be going <laughs> nuts. My dog will be turning at the Shane Taylor in my house. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. But you know, I, I just I feel Shane right that you wasted at the minute. Oh, I am. I'm not on a good. Listen, Paul, Paul I don't, Venice, I, I'm not going to say why. Paul Venice, if you're watching Paul Venice, I'm not going right? to say why. But I'm in a I am in a bad place at the minute, so I backtracked off. No, from but a lot you of wasted. Stuff. You've got so much. You've got this message of potential. Yeah, and God, trust me. Do you know? God's and it's like Paul, Paul Venice is the same. You're the same. I meet a lot of interesting people, a lot of wacky, quirky characters. But <laughs> you've got you've got a message that, you know, the last couple of years I've been in naughty boys school with people, um, and these certain young kids won't listen to parole boards or teachers. But when I've been with in like um, Peter Lee naughty boys school, I went to a year or two back, and when when a character like yourself went in, the young kids were just like listening and all. And um, and that I think you could, your story is really um, it's thought provoking, it's powerful. I I started going to church a couple of years back um, through Graham Seed, obviously we, Graham Seed. Yeah, he's familiar with him. Yeah, you should um, get him on. Yeah, he's, he's got, he's got, he's got a testimony. massive story. He's got a great. You should uh, get him on. When I met Graham, I fully understood how people joined Charles Manson's cult because I, he he could have got me to do anything. And uh, I kind of probably made the mistake of worshiping him rather than God. Yeah, a lot but, of people um, can do that. And that's like yourself. So, oh, there's a lot of, you know, this, it's hard to say mm. this. There's not a lot of Shane Taylors because you were a one off, but there's a lot of Shane Taylors out there. Yeah, of course. All desperate, lost to addiction, um, to just shit, just nonsense, which they're going to get to your age or even younger and think, what the fuck was I doing? 
but you can go and help them. Yeah, definitely, and that's my target. That's who I. Sh- Sean, I, I will Sean be. does it. Yeah, um, a, you've seen Sean on National Geographic. You're in schools most weeks, aren't you? Yeah, and you're telling your story, seeing the good it does, is like therapeutic as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, that's what, that's what... my target is though is the lads who are on the street right now, who suffer with a bit of mental illness, they're a bit nuts. Mm. A bit off it, they take drugs. You'll find that a lot of handy lads, I don't know if this makes sense, but you'll find that a lot of people who have a good fight with a super game, they've always got like a, some form of mm. an addiction or a, a crazy thing about them. And he's suffering and I, it, 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 it drains my heart, you know, when people message me and they say, Shane, how do I do it, man? I'm, I hate my life, I'm struggling, please just... What do I do? Mm. I struggle with this, and they start opening up, telling us how they're thinking, and and and, and, I, and as they're talking about, I'm like, yep, yep. I used to think like, yep, yep. Oh, that's me. Yep, self harm, yep, yep. and it's and it's like, yeah, the self harm is destroying your life, though. Mm. So self harm. Some people don't do it by self harming, you know, because some people see that. I, I personally see self harm as in if you kill yourself and stuff. And this might sound harsh, it's, it's weak. You've let life mm. win. You've never done that. No, because my self harm is if I was going to go out. I would just get myself a, a couple of big guns and just go and kill as many of me mm. any before I go and then just go to jail. That's, that's a form of um, self-harm because that's what it, that would be my way of taking mm. myself out. Mm-hmm. My way wouldn't be do it myself. My way would be I'm going to go out so that I hit the world news or something. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go out big. That, that, that's how I would go out. I wouldn't go out by killing myself. Not that I'm going to, and mm. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's the way my mind thinks. But so does many other people out there. And the, the, the minds, the one, this is what I remember. You want to change, like them lads out there, they want to change. They're sick of taking drugs. They're sick of messing their lives up. They're sick of going in and out of jail. They cry out to someone like me and say, how do I do it? Help. Some of them just say, Shane, just thanks. It just you've helped me by just having a chat with me because you've related with me. Mm. Thanks for that. And then a week down the line, they'll ring me again. I'm struggling again. Oh, and that might just be enough for some people. Mm. You know what I mean? But eventually, when the time's right, I've got like five kids at the minute under the age of 11, so time's harsh, like for me. But when the time's right, when my kids are a bit older and independent, I will be dedicating my life to go to them people. Even if I say, even if they're struggling, I say, do you know what? Where you're at? Oh, I'm in Liverpool, are you? Two hours away. Do you want us to come and talk to you, mate? Mm. I'll come, we'll come down and I'll get you a McDonald's. I will then. And let them talk. Then I can it's- pray for them. That's what I'll be doing. That's a fact because I will never, ever. There's two options. There's two ways I'm going to go in life, right? I want to go the wrong way, but when I do, I'll probably be 10 times worse than, mm. uh, than I was because I've, I've lost everything then. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. If you lose everything, I'm going to be probably 10 times. I've had everything and lost it. Or I'm going to be following the Lord. And this time, I'll have gone through so many battles and struggles mentally that when I come out of it, you won't be able to break me as a Christian. <laughs> so that's the mm-hmm. two options i I mean, your, your story, really, I think Shane was very much another realm more at one point. And you, oh, because, that you could been, relate to him. I was planning to do that. Mm. Uh, and it, you can put that on because it's not an issue. It's just something I was planning, but wasn't going. I didn't follow through because I changed. Mm. I was planning when I got out. The two prison officers, mm. yeah, who were brutalising me. Mm. I was going to get them. I was going to find out where they lived. And I was. My plan was there was another seven people. Mm. Uh, and my plan was is to find so out you where they lived. List. Oh yeah, I was going to find out where they lived, followed them, find out where they lived. And the reason why that was to do first is because I didn't want to just get two of them and then get caught. Mm. I want to have enough time to be able to get from place to place quick enough over a couple of days to kill them all. Mm. And then once I'd got to the end, then they can do what they want then because I've done my plan. Now, that's how I was thinking. Mm. And I would have acted it out. And one of the officers, uh, one of the officers from Home House who I stopped, he was going to be in it. I wanted him in it. Do you know? So I had this list of about 15 people and I'm telling you now, people mm. can think what they want. I would have got out and I would have went on a rampage. And mm. when I first got out, you've got to remember, I didn't have a family, didn't have kids, didn't have God. I just had this anger. I'd been through, and this is what the system failed to do. See, shove, shove you in the seg for years and years. I got released from a top security prison. Mm. You're meant to go down categories. I got released from, uh, is it, did I say Long Larkin? Mm-hmm. I was released from Long Larkin out the gates. I got released from there, met my mum. But obviously, luckily, 
God had caught me and got a hold of me and changed my heart before then. But if he didn't do that, I'm telling you, I wouldn't be here. I'd have rather been killed or I'd have killed as many people as I could. And what's, what's your conscience like today? Do you... My conscience is uh, horrible. Uh, because look... I, I know, I've watched on the news and uh, I'm very well aware of you going around and saying sorry and some people have just told you uh, some off in front of his face. Have, uh, there's been a lot of them. I think a lot of the people, there there's maybe one or two, but a lot of the people who, when I first got out, I think they were more relieved that I was forgiven them. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was one of the, the man I stabbed through with the thingy. Every time I used to go to Pete Lee, I noticed he would never be around. Mm. He would never be around at all. And, and I just had the feeling that when he, I was coming into the area, he was getting told and he was keeping away. Mm. And one day I walked into the, the pub and I saw someone who knows his family and stuff. And I just walked up to him and I just said, look, held my hand out. I said, look, tell him it's real. I really am a Christian. Mm. I'm really sorry for what I've done. And I really want to say sorry to him. And he looked at me, he was like, mm. do you mean that? Now, I don't know whether he was thinking I was saying it from to get him in the club mm -hmm. or something and I was going to do something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, five minutes after, lo and behold, when he was telling us he'd never seen him for ages, <laughs> lo and behold, he soon had him in five minutes when I was saying I want to mm -hmm. say sorry to him. And then it was like a, a way he's over. He's just like, no, will he come in? Yeah, will he come in? Over. And he sat down and I sat down and I just said, look, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry for what I've done. I said, will you forgive me? Mm. And he said, yeah, I'll forgive you. And then he just stepped, stepped back and he said, you know what? So it takes a real big man to do what you've just done. Say, Sorry, wow. that. Did you go through that? It's powerful. And that's what he said, well, you know. You know, Sean, you've brought a lot of shame on your parents. How did you deal with stuff like that? So in my case, the victim was the state of Arizona because mm. I was a drug trafficker. So the one, I couldn't actually talk, approach anyone like Shane could approach someone. Mm. But yeah, the harm you cause your family, man, when your mum's flown 5,000 miles to visit you and you, mm. you see her all all just like looking anxious and sad in the visitation room and she's had to wait outside in the desert for hours and they've had sniffer dogs on her and patted her down and all this shit and oh it's horrible isn't it mm. to see, put you that's what that's one of the questions i was going to ask you throughout all this uh, shane parents siblings what what was their role as in like in things that were going on with you were they trying to like trying to bring you back down to earth were they visiting oh, mom, you in prison yeah my mum was always trying to stop me yeah. Kate, but she was always there for me as well at the same time. In fact, I don't think I would have been strong enough if my mum wasn't there. Yeah. You know, if I ever went to jail, she's always there, always like forgiving me in that sense, always giving me post slaughter, is always doing mm. no, always there to this Brothers day. Brothers and sisters? Yeah, my, no, I, I don't really talk to half my family now, really. Dad? Uh, I've got a stepdad, mm. yeah. So, but I, 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 he was just scared of me. Mm. You know, and I remember. Um, I remember, cause, did you know something? When you're mentally ill, you don't realise like, what you like. And so I remember I got out of prison and I actually didn't realise that my own family was scared of me, do you know? Mm. And I just remember um, being stood out the front stood out the front, and I just remember we were just chatting, it was a sunny day. And I just remember saying to him, look, uh, do you think I've changed? And he didn't reply. I said, what do you think then? Do you think I've changed? And I just remember him looking straight at me and he said, yeah. Mm. So I'm not scared here anymore. Um, and I just remember that, like, that it was like a shock to me. I was like, what, you were scared of me? Mm. He went, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's, a, it's like you say, you want to answer to the all the young lads out there. It's good, not going to lie. Mm. Live a good life, it's great. And it is good, it's fun, you look big to your pals. Yeah, you're the boy or mm. But you've all got to grow up, you see. And you know them people who you boy and they're going to end up having families and moving on. Mm -hmm. When they move on, you have to live with what you've done. Mm -hmm. and you have to pick up the pieces. And you have to pick up your mental health. And you have to pick up when you make messing your life up all the time because you don't know how to live a normal life. And guess what happens when that happens? All them lads you were trying to big yourself up to, they can cope. Mm. They move on. They end up with families. Their life goes well. They end up with good jobs. What are you doing? Going in and out of prison. In and out of prison. You get out. You can't stick to a relationship because it's, it, 
you just don't know how to. Mm. You, you, you've got your family, but you don't know how to cope with it. You suffer with your mental health. And it's bad, you know. And then when you get older, you, you have, to, uh, just to say this, you know, you always think, you'd think different now to what you did when you were 12 to when you're 20. You know, your mindset keeps changing. Mm -hmm. But when you get older, you actually do genuinely start looking back on the things that you've done and you regret it. Like you really, really regret it. Like mm -hmm. I can't explain to a point where it's like trauma. You know, you sat there because, you know, with me and my circumstances, I've done that much violence, that many crazy r things. Like to have images of like what you totally forgot about, you know, because you've done that much, you forget about mm. it. So one day you'll just be cleaning the dishes or you'll be hoovering up or you'll be doing something. Not that I hoover up and clean the dishes. I'm just, mm. no, no, I do sometimes. <laughs> but when I'm doing it, you um, suddenly getting an image in your head of when you ran in a house mm. and you're putting a knife to the, the dad's throat and the mum. He's got all of the kids, and the kids are screaming in terror. Mm. Now, that didn't bother me before, mm -hmm. but it bothers me now. But it bothers me even more when I've got my own children. Mm -hmm. Because my head sometimes replaces that scenario mm. and not being my kids. Now, that's a trauma that you can't ever take back, mm -hmm. ever. Once you give a kid that sort of experience of a man coming in, a horrible man, with probably a crazy looking face, putting a knife to his parents, um, that's a nightmare for a kid. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff you'll regret. And I know a lot of people say, I wouldn't do stuff like that. Look, when you're in that game, mm -hmm. and you're running in people's houses, you don't care. You know, no, you're not going to harm the kids. It's not what you do. Mm -hmm. But when you're running in and you, you're putting knives to the parents or you're beating the parents up or you're smashing them windows, them, pu them little kids are the ones who are going to have them nightmares mm -hmm. over that. That's something that will probably haunt you if you're 90 year old, won't it? Yep, that's an old. How happy was your mum once you transformed your life around? What was the, the change well, from your mum? It's interesting because when I first become a Christian, I rang my mum up. I said, Mum, in the jail. I said, Mum, I've given my life to Jesus. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. She went, Oh, shut up, you idiot. And put the phone down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Put the phone yeah. down on me. Yeah. So I got out first couple of years. Oh, here we go. God squad, Bible basher. Yeah. Here we go. Couple of years down the line. Hmm. He's not, he's not in jail again. Yeah. <laughs> couple of years. Yeah. He's still. So this God then, so um, so what happened, you know? So she questions me. She doesn't believe, but she questions me. But she always says, "I'm, I'm I never thought I'd say this, but I'm, I'm proud of you." Oh. Yeah, mm. and she uh, and, and that uh, bothers me in, in a way, like it mm. not bothers me in a bad way, but it's just I tortured me, mum. Yeah, just being around her. I don't mean I tortured her physically myself. But mentally, yeah. you know, from a kid, when I'm not coming home at night and she's ringing the police and she used to say to me that every 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 day when the door knocked, her heart would sink and she'd run to the door thinking it's the police going to say, oh, your Shane's dead or mm. he's found in a gutter or he's gone missing. Uh, then when I went to jail, you don't, this is another thing what inmates need to realise. When I went to prison, you're in jail, you just think it's you. Look, I'm serving the sentence. What are you on about? Mm -hmm. You're out. You can have fun. Yeah. But my mum said to me one day... Said, Calm stands still, doesn't it? She said, when when Christmas came and I'd I'd go upstairs and I would cry to myself because you weren't home. Oh, bloody hell. Mm. But I never saw that. I just didn't think of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So while my brothers and the open presents and doing stuff, my mum would go upstairs and cry because I wasn't there. Now, not to mention the biggest issue is when you're in and out of prison for years and years and years, you lose friendships and relationships because they can never be the same because you've missed that much of it. You know, I went in jail. My brother was a bairn. Come out of jail, he's 20-odd. I've not been there. There's no connection. Mm. He's not like a brother to me. 
I, I love him as a brother in that sense, but there's no connection like normal brothers would be. And it's the same with everything else. I have no connection. You lose all connections to people. Someone who was your best friend before, you get out 20 years down the line. He's married, kids, moved on in life. It's not there. You've missed out. And I remember the, how they looked when I first went to jail. And I actually thought that's how they looked still. And then when I got out and saw them, and they're, they're totally different people. You just, you, life, just, you ruin your life. You don't think you do, but when you're spending all your teenage years in and out of jail and that, mm. you don't realise what you're doing. You're missing out on them times where you can go out and do stuff together, go out and have a party, go out with your mates, go out get your motorbikes and go and have a ride up the field. You don't do all that because you're stuck in jail. Then when you get out, you're out a couple of months because you're in a cycle and you're back in again. And then by the time you turn 20, 30 year old, your life's ruined because you don't know how to live. Mm. You, you, you don't know how to get a job. You don't know how to, or even if you want to do, you've got a criminal record long in your, in your arm. If it's not the church or a charity giving me some form of chance, I can't get a job. I apply for them. But you'll, have, you'll get them people saying, oh, oh, well, I didn't like the work. I'd love a job. Yeah. But the reality is if it's not some Christian giving me some mercy and grace, no, no one gives me a job. And what makes it even 10 times worse is because I'm so public in Middlesbrough. Yeah. Everyone knows who I am. So when I go for a job, I've seen it. I see them, I walk in and they're like, oh, he's not getting one. That's very you know true. I mean? he's, uh... So because I've made myself public through the church, it's been a hindrance <laughs> because now it's not the church employing me. Mm. I'm now knacked for a job because I'm not public. It's, destroyed me getting yeah. a job there's got to be someone out there watching this oh, well. in Middlesbrough who can give Shane a job do you know <laughs> not gonna happen. I'll comment on that is I've known Shane now for about 18 months but I've known of him 14 15 yeah and I've always thought that's that excuse my French fucking mental bastard <laughs> that's that that's that walking loon somewhere so a lot of people and I'm open minded so a lot of people who aren't uh, yeah, I'm just a scumbag. To yeah, the man. I'm I just get him out. Just do you know what yeah. I mean? And I can I can relate to that. And it's only certain people. You have been very uh, like a, in a public spotlight. Certainly for fourteen uh, since you got out of prison. Massively, you've been in a lot of papers. Chucked straight in the deep end and um, uh, been in G GQ. Went in the GQ magazine, went in Sun newspaper, went in beta, go, go in all the magazines and I stuff. I think I seen you in the Sun as well. Yeah, in the Sun. So you know, uh, I knew the Mirror. It, the Mirror's just recently published it, yeah. didn't they? And, and uh, unless you know the full story, you, you, you're going to think of bad things, aren't you? 99% of people, though, I can guarantee, I'll be more trustworthy and more loyal yeah. than the majority of the normal people who go and who've mm -hmm. never committed a crime, I can tell you that now. Mm -hmm. But it's just the reality of it, and it doesn't bother me, because I, I, I live by faith anyway, so it doesn't bother me one bit. I just, I, I don't care. Do God do? does what he does. He puts <clears throat> me through. So I believe every circumstance you go through is for a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what the reason is all the time, but maybe that's something God needs to take out of me. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm full of pride. Maybe God wants to put me in circumstances what are so bad that to eat, to, to overcome it, I have to overcome pride beyond your belief that if I overcome it, and I always say if, if I overcome it, how strong am I going to be? Now, mm. is God put me through things like that? I don't know, but all I know is I've 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 got to hold on to God. If I don't hold on to God, I know exactly where my head's going, and I know exactly where my route is, and I know exactly what my plans are. Down in the bad fire, and it, yeah, it is, <laughs> and, and and I know exactly. He's got the chief stoker job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? I think regardless of what you do, and just look how um, Sean he's prolific. I say to anyone's got a YouTube channel, two videos, listen to it, you're wasting your time. I'm, you know, probably the most prolific author in Britain. And whatever you choose to do, Shane, there's no point doing it for a week or two weeks. You just... Got to be dedicated. You have to be. Yep. And you know what? I some I seen someone last year and he hadn't seen me for years and he said, your name is everywhere. And whether people like me or hate me, but you've got to be... Whatever you need to do now, I think you opening some kind of health, uh, help... Christian Centre, you've got friends who've done it. You know, I'm Paul Venice, I've been telling him, open a gym, open a gym. 
And uh, I think you know, Oh, I know I'll be good. That's the route I'm going down. But like you know, I said, it's you've got to remember I've got five kids under the age of like eleven at the minute and they, they do take a lot of my life up. But mm. I promise you now I'll I'll be dedicated my life will always be dedicated to God. And mm. when I go down that route, if you know, I used to say I will never ever fall. That's what I used to say. Mm. But I'm in a position now where I've gone through that much this year. Mm. That boy has it been a struggle, yeah. and so I. I mean, I, I, say, I, I hope and pray, <clears throat> and I do hope and pray, and I do pray that I stick with the faith, stick with God, because if I do, I have huge mm. plans, and I don't care who's with me. Mm -hmm. me, and, me and certain people are going to be doing it anyway, mm -hmm. and we're going to be going round, and and we won't just be doing it to get a bit of funding either. This is going to be a different kind of thing. Because I find that sometimes in the Christian faith, it's all around based around funding, yeah. and it's based around numbers. And what happens with that is a lot. The real deep help doesn't get done. It's all about just getting someone looking saved, and sometimes and there's an extra number for the more funding at the end of the year, especially if it's government funding. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be under any funding like that. You know what I want to be under? 10, 15 lads, and if it bills, let's all chip in. Mm -hmm. Let's all go down. Let's all go down and walk to a homeless guy and tell him, come on, mm -hmm. come in. We've got a building up here. We're going to get your, get your wash, wash your clothes, come on, and go out like that, not get funding off anyone. Just do it off, off our back. If, if, if you know one of us have a free house or one of us have so we'll go and take them in bath and feed them I'll, if i have to but now apparently there's legal terms for this but mm. i wouldn't mind on the morning cooking a cook breakfast every morning and having all the homeless people mm. sat outside my um sat outside my house lined up waiting to get a free cup of coffee and a free cook breakfast <laughs> but apparently if you do that now it's illegal because mm. you have to go through health yeah. and safety procedures if i have to do that i will if I, but I'm going down the route, uh, trust me, when the time's mm -hmm. right, my life will only be on. It's not to do it in public eye. I'm not going to be standing up in a church and publicly telling everyone, I've helped, I've helped a thousand homeless people. Oh, mm -hmm. how great I am. Because the reality is the Bible says when you do things, do it in private so that only you and God can see. Don't see it so that people can see you in the public. And I just think when you have to, you know, declare how many mm. people you've saved or how many people you've fed or how, I just think that's you know do it you don't have to declare that God will mm. you know God will see what you've done and that's what I do you wouldn't believe the things I do what people don't see and I don't need to say it and I don't need to tell it well God knows what I do all the time mm. it's, it's, it's even if I'm walking down the street no I do things I, I, I go off I've left myself went out sometimes I just do it and I don't do that, I, I, and, and I just feel like I want to do something different. I want to do something what's not connected to having to stand on a stage and brag about how many people are, I've saved or how many people's been fed or how many criminals aren't going to prison. I'm just going to go out with me and a few of the lads, whoever gets wants to dedicate themselves with me, uh, possibly homeless people or possibly ex-offenders, and we're going to go out and we're going to all chip in with a bit of cash each, and we're just going to go out and preach the gospel to people and actually help them. No, I mean, like, bring them to your own home and chuck them in your own bath, mm. chuck the clothes in your own wash, and go and, get, go and buy some clothes yourself, mm. what we'll do off our own back. And, and that's my plan, <laughs> to do stuff like that in the future, believe me, and it's going to happen. And God will bless that in however way he does, because he sees what... You do in private. But for anything to grow like that, you need social media pages for publicity. So it's... I'll tell you where the publicity comes. You're chasing comes. your own tail, Shane, on no, the you No, because it's not... A, it could, because everything's always around numbers, you see. Mm. Everyone wants to say... Everyone wants to help 100 people so they can look good. The reality is, if I go out on that street one night and I save that homeless person, and he starts to change, and he gets help, and we start going out, and then he comes back on the street with us, mm. and then he goes and helps. That's called a ripple effect, mm -hmm. but a ripple effect, what's happening underground in a sense, where it's not public, and it's just happening. And before you know it, you'll have people mm. who are getting saved, getting helped, but they're just getting saved and helped by just the local lads who are just... They've been saved, so they mm. want to put something in. And, you know, over time, 
you know, even if you save 10 people in, in five years, mm-hmm. you, you, it, you've still done great stuff. Mm. You've still gone out with your heart. You've still gone out to save people. It's not about numbers. It's not about mm. getting the big numbers so you can, you know, get bigger funding at the end of the year because I don't want to be under that either because that mm. puts rules. It puts, And not only does it put rule over you, it's almost like you've got a, I don't mean this in a bad way, but if you had a big donor, and he's a huge donor. What do you have to do to keep him on your side? You've got to keep Sponsor. him happy. Yeah. You've got to stick his bum in a sense, you know. And so you become controlled easy by doing that. And that's not what I want. I just want to be out there with the lads, mm. getting getting a few people saved, helping a few people. God sees what you do in the in the in the quiet and see where it leads to. You know, and and if they become Christians, direct them to a good church in your in in, in, in your local area, what you like. And you know, before you know it, you might even be slowly mm. building them churches up with homeless people and ex offenders. You know, uh, for a lot of churches don't even do that. Mm. You know, Oscar Wilde said, "The greatest thing in life is not to ensure we never fall, but to ensure that we never fail to get it when we've fallen." Shane, you fell. I think you still will fall. But is is all the badness? I mean, all the darkness out your life's gone, isn't it? As in, uh, what do you mean? Prisons, violence, fights, oh, yeah, yeah. chaos, uh, mayhem, yeah, destruction. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? 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 A, listen, you've you've done half your life, if you like. So you've got, you know, you maybe another half on the front. You're middle aged now. You've joined the club. You're the same as me. You're fat, middle aged. And uh, but mostly in middle age, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good luck on and all that. But (laughs) now, you know, you've taught the talk, walk the walk. Now, maybe next year, do you think I'm going to do this? I'm going to do that, and put it no, you just got to focus on my kids, uh, bring them up and and focus on them, and and Mm. then what I'm going to uh, because you had a book out, you've had documentaries out. Oh, there's about there's I think there's five books out with me in. Right. But the the other ones are like, you know, when you get them testimony ones, yeah, there's 15 yeah. in and yeah. stuff like that. But there's one main one. So that's not your priority? To no, say, oh, it's not my priority up. because the book doesn't, I've dropped out of the book. I don't yeah. I don't get anything from it. I don't earn anything from it. I don't want to earn anything from it. I'm not, I don't mm. care. If someone wants to do a book on my life, just come and speak to me. I'll, I'll do one. The only contract you would get is not, oh, this will go off. So I'll, I'll, the contract will be this. If anything's said in there, defecates my name of something I haven't done, then I want to sue you. Mm. That'll be it. Mm. So if you want to do a movie on my life, you want to do a documentary, you want to do a book, go ahead. Mm. I'll sign it that I'll give you the, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give you the go because ahead to you do have, it. Because you've, you've been in various documentaries, the Christian Channel. Uh, I've got one on my house, actually. Um, you know, it, it's... So what's, what's the future now? Are you just... The future is just a couple of years of sorting myself out and see where that goes. Because mm. you're not the focusing full, on my you're kids. You're not the finished article yet, are you? Oh, hundred percent. I think I've got it. I'm go, probably just going through now. Obviously, it's private, but yeah. I'm probably just going through the biggest struggle I've ever had in my fifteen years of being a Christian. Mm. Now I am going through the biggest battle I think I'll ever have, and it, and it sometimes worries me. I don't even know where I'm going to end up. Sometimes. Are you ever scared to think? Oh, hang on a minute. I'm going to go and open that knife drawer. Is that still a possibility? Oh no, it's the it's the plots. What's in my head? <laughs> it's the problem. Yeah. But there's none of that. The there's connections not... I'm connecting up with. That's the problem. Yeah. Um... But I just, I know I trust in God, and I, He's overcome my mind before, and obviously He's gonna. I, I pray and hope that He's gonna overcome this. How often do you pray? At the minute, I haven't been. Right. See this is what and, and that's a good so thing. Lost your, lost and your that's faith a good a No, that's the good thing. The good thing is this is is, is letting people know that look, just because you're a Christian, because people think when you become a Christian, you suddenly become this angel and life's totally perfect. No, it's not. And that's why I think a lot of the lads respect you and say, Look, you're an inspiration, I respect you. Because they know the mental battles you're gonna have to go through, what I've gone through. They know them struggles when someone mugs you off and you have to sit back and hold your breath when really years I've, ago I've if they did it him. you would kill them yeah right and 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 that is the has been a big struggle for me mm-hmm. like i've had people who i've seen some on social media yeah and well, I, I, I get it but like you've had it but it's and, the, and i've sat back thinking how are you going to react to that well my reaction is is some like i say 
the biggest and hardest thing is is you have a mental battle, and this is what people don't get. But people like me, it's the mental battle that you have after. And just because I'm a Christian, it doesn't mean I don't still have them mental battles. It doesn't mean that when someone's disrespected me, I'm not sat there stewing on it for months. But what it means is when I've got God, I pray and I try my best to keep my focus on him. And, and I don't get people sometimes when they go to people like me. They think it's a joke. But what if I did? What if one day I just sat there and thought, you know what? Sack it. Mm. I'm going on one because you've got to remember I've got everything to lose now. And if I lose that, I'm in a worse position than I was in the first place. These people are really sneaky, Shane, as well. They goad you and pretend to be tough. But the minute you do something, they, run off, to, they run off to the yeah. cops or mm. put you away. I've had this. I've had people goad me, goad me and goad me. And then when I've, like, over the months, and then when I've retaliated, they went, ah, see, you thought you were Christian. That's mm. not Christian. What are you going to come do? Mm. And, 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 and then I sort of that made me realise. I'm at a point now where I would never be goaded on social media. Just block them. No out. one could How say no. Sh- 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 I wouldn't even block them. I wouldn't even block them. It's fun. I actually find some of the things funny. Like well, uh, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, don't block them. It's in fact, it's a viewer. You know, get yeah. your extra views. Yeah, I do encourage a bit for the viewing, but sometimes it can get really bad if they like to go on your parents' Facebooks and find mm. things out about your family oh, I've and never had start not, sending yeah. messages to your family. It can get really toxic. I've yeah. never so had that. You have to be that. careful how much you encourage them for views. Yeah, it's a whole. It is. It's. I mean, Joe Rogan said YouTube is the sewers. Yeah, and, the um, comment section. You know, is the sewers. I, Jimmy. You know, yeah. Jimmy. Why would you let something bother you mm. of what someone's saying who's behind a, a thing anyway? Because they're probably having a Why does you know, it Josh matter? Warren said that. I mean, he said... It doesn't matter. Hey, Ricky Atten, nicest guy in the world, big hero. And people are like, oh, he's, some, he's had some terrible stuff. Why didn't you kill yourself and all this? And Josh is the nicest person ever. Like, if you, the person you meet you think's nice is even nicer than that. World champion, or was a world champion. And he said, why do you care about John 118 on YouTube with six subscribers? It doesn't matter. But it's a brutal world and I don't know how you, I don't know how. The thing is, it's 99.9% love and support coming in all day long. But we have something in our brains whereby one little tiny person says one little bad Mm. thing and we focus on that person. (laughs) (laughs) We should be responding to all the love and support coming Coming in all day long, not yeah. these no, idiots. That's, no, that's it. If someone comes and says bad stuff about me or out, even if someone come on a podcast, I'd just be like, and someone mentions it, I'd just say, oh, God bless now. I wish him well in their life. Mm. Not interested. Yeah. I just think it's kiddish anyway. Like, I, honestly, I just think responding to stuff and all these things, and like even with your little war things, I just think it's like, it's like a ch- it's childish it for is, me. I'm is. too I'm too serious. In to actual play fact, games. though, I mean, you would never actually started anything, but that's a different story. No, but, I'm not bothered. But you about can't. That. Yeah, yeah. But you I'm just meaning help. it's not a, because it is a childish. It's, just, you, it's like kids at war with school. someone. Your, your brain does go to like a child's brain level, yeah, and mm. you like you want to destroy the other, the enemy, and then you're so abrupt. You're thinking, what have I just done? Yeah. But to <laughs> outsiders, it's like. What on earth? It's, it's like kids, you know what yeah. I mean? And it's, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm like. I just because I've, I've I used to watch everything, and then at the end I was just like, I'm shut. I don't watch them when it's all yeah. negative and yeah, stuff, and yeah, just yeah. can't be chewed. Fair enough, maybe once or twice, but mm. when it's going on for months yeah. and stuff, I'm not yeah. interested. I don't care, and I have no bad art towards anyone to be truthful. Mm. So mm. it doesn't matter who the podcasters are, it doesn't matter who's. Other. I mm. have a lot of love for everybody, mm-hmm. and 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 that's what I'm like. And I don't pick sides. I never will. Mm. I I I. Mm. I, I, I I've always been like that. I'll never pick a side. People yeah, have got to yeah. understand that. I'll never, ever do that. I'm just me. Uh, and I, I'm just mm. basically, I have a lot of love for people. If people do things for me, no, like you put me on your podcast, others have put you on past podcasts. Nothing but love for you. For mm. I mean, what's your passions put, these days? Doing that. What's you your vices? Because I mean? you don't drink much. You don't, you know, so listen, people into drink, drugs, dogging. Just every cross dressing. <laughs> no, just you've all you've got to have you've got to have a vice, right? So what does so now? Because you don't drink. Do you've you got to have a vice, but he brings up dogging and cross dressing. <laughs> but you don't I know what he does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no, seriously. Like what what do you do now? What what does Shane do? Where they, hang on, I can't wait to get up and I'll go this and uh, so what's your thing? Gym on the morning. I, gym, I like I'm enjoying training. I train from. 10 in the morning until about 1 o'clock every day with me and my mate Molly. Mm. And then uh, uh, just watching the kids, staying in with the kids and, and, and sorting them out mm. uh, and just 
I think God has put me on a... I've had 15, 16 years of constantly out there in the public. Out there, I went to the Royal Albert Hall and massive, been to big conferences, focus it's called, there's huge people there, been all over everywhere and everyone publishing things about me. I just think I need to take a step back. Mm -hmm. I need to focus on what's going on in my family and around my family. I need to focus on keeping myself right. Yeah. That's the biggest issue. Um, and then I have to just focus on if I if I if I overcome where I'm at, then there's going to be great things. What's going to be happening for God? Massive, He's a powerful massive speaker things. As well, Shane. He's a great speaker, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be massive. And there's a few things in the pipeline anyway. Mm. What I've been speaking to people about on Netflix films and stuff mm. like that. I mean, so, do you ever think I wish I never? I wish I could go back to 15 years ago when no one knew I was. Because life was easier, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But before, well, it's 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 no, not that. It's, of it's, you. No, it's not about the repeat. I'd, <laughs> I've I've been a black sheep from the beginning of my life. You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't bother me. People have said things about me beyond your belief. They think I don't know, but I know. Mm. And but I I just it's it's something I've grown accustomed to. Mm. Being an outcast to me is actually a good thing. Keeps people away from me. Yeah. <laughs> I can stay on my own. Yeah. I can be at peace on my own. And I can relax. And I can um, enjoy my own company. Yeah. I, mean, to, I was watching Does this sound mad? No, it doesn't. And I know people are Tom Hardy, I watched I an interview it. with him recently. He said, once you get to an age, you, you, you realise how good it is to be hid, hid away, yeah. eating food, just away from Chilling all out. the... You know, you're quite a private person, and you should believe it or not. I just but, like to chill out on yeah. my own. Yeah. Well, I believe, yeah. I believe though, there's, a, there's, a, there's seasons. You see, the Bible talks about seasons in life. So there's seasons where God's gonna pull you back, mm. and He's gonna deal with issues, and He's gonna make you stronger, and He's gonna send you back out there twenty times more stronger than you were the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's what's coming, and I know that. And now it's just, just, just wait, you know. Mm. It, it's, 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 it's see what God does, mm -hmm. you know. And and I, I'm telling you, because next time, I'll be going there with no fear of what people think about me. Mm -hmm. And that used to be a hindrance to me. You see, I'd get up on stage. Oh, what if I don't tell me testimony good enough? Yeah. I'd, I'd, oh, what if they don't like me? I'd meet posh people, you know. You know, be. Hello, so how is one? You know, and I'd be like, oh, I'm around a posh person. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what to do. Yeah. And then I'd say stupid stuff just because I was uncomfortable. So I'd just come out with silly things and yeah. they're looking at me thinking, what's he talking about? And like, and then I'd walk away paranoid thinking, I'm going past, once I get past all that, I'll be jumping up on, I'll be in the middle of the town centre preaching a lot. I'll be doing mm. everything. And, and I think God, it, it's just been, I, I dare say this in the wrong way, but you get trophied a little bit. When you've got a testimony, churches well, can sort of... Well, that's what you happened. That's what happened yeah, to you, church, I think, the first church, couple of yeah, years. Yeah, churches can sort of... To be of... honest, I mean, Sean won't know, <clears throat> but when 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 kind of Sean, um, Shane come on the scene, he was kind of used as like a, a room. Like a, he was rented out. And every, oh, chair, every church, everyone had this... And I, I was used to read the paper, that's Shane Taylor. He's everywhere. <laughs> And then, you know, and it's almost like, you know yourself, some, some churches are probably very judgmental. Yeah. So they'll use, yeah, it's a business to some of them. And, um, you know, maybe you were used and abused and a bit spat out because you had a full-time job out of it. And then all of a sudden it was just gone, finished. So hang on a minute, these are supposed to be godly people. They've just trapped me in the worst possible way. I think now... I don't, I, I, I sort of don't... I... I can see how that is like that and comes yeah. across like see, I know, that. I know a bit of that story. Because, yeah, because I could, I, could also, I, I could also see it like this, but you could also see it as I wouldn't have gotten a job off anybody else and they've gone out of the way and given me a job for four years. Mm -hmm. now, that's good is on that what you've done it for, four years? That, yeah, that's yeah. good on my CV. It gave me experiences. And so sometimes God intends everything anyway for, for that to happen. Now, I can see it. and, and I I'm, mean, you every and weekend I can, were booked listen, up. Oh, yeah, and I can see. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot of people, you are trophied a little bit. Mm. Now, in some cases, not purposely, people just hear this, 
great testimony. You just want you down. Not interested in anything else. Not interested in you. They just you get down, trophy, buy. You know, and I have I've had it where I've gone down, someone's been all over me, texting me, messaging me like we're brothers. I actually felt mm. like we were becoming brothers. Went down there, give me testimony. As soon as I give me testimony, walked away from the church, mm. tried to text them, don't even reply. Mm. Now that's the fakest kind of friendship and love to me mm. you can ever get. Like, oh yeah, you're my pal for the, over the months and texting me all the time, telling me how much you love us as a brother for three or four months mm. until you give the testimony, you give the testimony, you walk away, try to message them, they don't reply. So, you know, so I've experienced things like that. But again, it's just a lesson for me to know that you, you can't rely on men. you just got to rely on God and God only. Because, you know, like you said, you said with Graham, you, he become like a God to for you when you start following yeah. Graham. So that's the reality of it. And that's what I think God puts every true Christian through because I think all Christians at some point will start following the pastor or following the leader. or and But as time goes on, God starts to take you away from all that because if you, he starts to make you realise, stop focusing on them. I'm going to take them all away from you. I want to show you. I want to put you on your own. So what I'm going to do, and this is the plan, I think, I want to put you on your own because you've relied too much on men. And mm -hmm. your focus has been over there and over there, but it hasn't been up there. And so what he does is he makes everything go wrong for you sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Christians can't see that, mm -hmm. but everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's to make you step back and say, wait there a minute. And you start focusing on God because you realize when you're going through your little struggles, all them people who were there, they're not really there. Mm -hmm. When you're going through your struggles, it's you and God and only you and God, not you and your pastor, not you and him. It's you and God, and how do you deal with it? Do you fall away and run away from God, or do you get stronger? And that's what God does sometimes. He puts you in the wilderness, and, he, and, and there's a reason, and he knows the reason, he knows the outcome. I don't know what that is, but we'll see. And, and if it, I come out of that, I'm going to be 20 times more stronger because I'll just... My biggest issue, my biggest fear was to be made a laughing stock out of, be humiliated. And there's things that have happened in my life lately that you can't get any more humiliated and any more degraded. And that's what plays in my head every day at the minute. People are laughing at me. And that's what I think. And a lot of people knew things and stuff like that. They were meant to be my pals. And the the anger and the the revenge and the, the things that are going through my head are constant every day, every day. And I cry out, God, get a grip of my mind every day. And I have faith and hope that he does. He, he's, he's kept me this long. But what I'm saying is, if I overcome this, what did I just say? My biggest fear was being humiliated, a laughing stock, be degraded. Now, if I can overcome that, I've just overcome my biggest struggle in life. What's going to break me after that? Nothing. Now, is that the reason? But, yeah, I'm going through a hard time, and sometimes I worry about where that's going to lead to, and, and, and am I going to... Fail, am I going to fall? And, and you know, I'm not saying that because I'm not going to be fake. I'm not going to come in here and pretend my life's been all like fairy dust since I've become a Christian because that's what makes, that's why not many people change, you see, because it's not easy and you're always going to have the struggle, but it's do you overcome them? And that's why I think criminals respect people like me when I've changed because they know how hard it is and they know that that struggle's always there. They know that you're always going to be there and it's just by the fact, sheer fact that you've overcome it for 14 years, they're all like, in respect, you inspire me. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. Because they know, they know the mindset, they know what it's about. You know, when you get humiliated, degraded, they know what it's like, the mind battles you get. And, and vice versa, I know what it is for them. So that when I'm talking to them about change, do you know what I mean? I, I, we can relate. Mm. And so let God run his course. Hopefully he keeps, I have faith and hope 
that he keeps me right. And if he does, I'm going to be a ten times more powerful a Christian than I've ever been in my life. I'll be totally different, as in boldness, uh, lack of fear, lack of botheredness of what people think, lack of care, let you laugh, get get on with it. Mm. You know, you've got to face God, some of you, at some point. And I know some of them don't believe it, but they will. Mm. People respect how honest you are as well, Shane. No, I'm, I, I, I've yeah. got to be. Obviously, I can't say everything. It, mm. Some things are private, like between us, but mm. it's uh, been a tough, tough year and a half. I don't talk to anyone anymore. I've dropped everybody out. I'm talking when you said family. to me, Shane Taylor's here, I was like, I haven't heard from him for six months. And uh, he just kind of dropped me about six months ago. <laughs> thought it was my aftershave or something like that. <laughs> I, I wear bruff, like, seriously I do, I've been wearing bruff for about 15, 16 years. And he just was like, and I was like, I, I was a bit annoyed, I was a bit like, oh, I get loads of trolls, Sean, piss off, uh, Shane. <laughs> and then, uh, you know what I mean? So it's been nice to see him today. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, I just, I, th I think for what you've been through, this probably what you've got to go through, and I've got an inkling, but uh, it's none of my business, but, it's nowhere near what you've been through, but I don't think you'll take that next step until this is out of the way, all this mess is made up. Oh, 100%. Can't. I have to, have to get past this bit. Mm -hmm. have to. And it's this bit what determines what happens in life. I, I think you'd be great on your lad's Bible and all this and all the more bigger things. and kind of, Not that there's much bigger things than Sean Atwood, but, you know, just his message out there for the help and there's a lot of, Shane Taylor's in the prisons. The, you see them all the time. And not only that, I think it's cool health. and glamorous to be Just, around drugs and all that. And it's not that. It's mental health is a huge thing now. It's huge. People it's don't massive. Realize how many, how many and lads I'm, now take yeah. drugs and, and half the people who were taking the drugs getting wrecked. It's it's a form of self harm. They just don't give it. They give up on life. They don't care. They just want to be. They're just going to be ruthless. They're just running around wild. Just take drugs to block mm. the mind out, block it mm. out. Life keeps going wrong for them. They just what's going on, and, and it's like you know, it's finding yourself in life. And then you know, like I say, some people messaging me saying, "Shane, I, I like I, I, just, I can't even remember his name, his full name, but I, I can't say it anyway." But when he messaged me the other day, and he said, "I've seen your podcast, mate," he said. I had to message you. He said, I've never, ever related <clears throat> to someone so much. It's like talk. It's like you were in my own brain talking about how I am. He mm. said, how are you, how are you doing it? And uh, I just get a buzz out of that. And, and, and It's rewarding, it's, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's at some point, though. I need a follow-through. I need, I need a follow-through at some point. It's, at this time in my life, I can't. But at some point in my life, I'll be following through. Like I'll be going out my way, like when yeah. people message me, I'll be travelling to them. And even if it takes three hours, I'll just drive mm. down or I'll get one of my pals with us, yeah. you know, and, and drive down and just mm. meet up with them and just chat with them and pray for them and, and, and hope and try and direct them and help them to a, direct them to a local church, find a good local church where I know that they will help and go out the way and stuff. And that's my future plan 100%. Mm -hmm. But like I say, at the minute... The last year or so has, you know, been it's it's a it's a constant mental. It's been battle. a bad year for a lot of people. Yeah, you so have just... not the greatest. No, last year was rough, but since Wildman died, I was like really sad as he was sick, and we were crying at his funeral. Mm. But after the funeral, everything just turned around in my life because yeah. he's been looking out for me, and I've had a I've absolutely fantastic year. Mm. Yeah. Good. Like you said about that person, it's like you're in each other's brains. It's like me and Wildman was in each other's brains because mm. we'd known each other since we were kids. And when you've been through so many things with someone, that person's no longer there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it messes no. you up. But after the funeral, I just felt his spirit come into me. I'll tell me. you what, and I, yeah. I, I've never told you this, but obviously when he, when he died, God rest him, it was the day that you interviewed Dominic Negus. And when you watched the Dominic e Negus interview, you knew before that. Yeah. And How did and you know I knew before that? Because I watched that. And at the end, when you're talking to Dominic and you're talking about friends, you're nearly gone. And, yeah. and I said to the wife, oh, my God, he knew. But I got the call on the way to that interview. And I was in shock. I was in shock. That your body? I didn't even know what was going yeah. on. And if, I was anyone, like if anyone's watched Dominic Negus, uh, Sean did it um, last December. 
And you can watch that Dominic Negus. I love Dominic. I'm going to spend a bit of time with him. I've done his book. Um, Dominic, very, I turned up at Dominic's house, very drunk, and he let me keep my job. He, <laughs> he, he, he didn't beat me up. He's, a, <laughs> he's, he's got a big, cuddly teddy bear. Dominic, if you're watching, I love you. But you can watch that, and it's almost like you can, you know, you were for two hours, you were you professional and all this, and at the end, you just crumble. I was on autopilot. And I thought, my good God, you yeah. knew. Yeah, yeah, I did. I just found out on the way to that interview. And I just went on Because I autopilot. remember saying it to Dominic. I hadn't registered. No, no. It wasn't until the next yeah. day it sunk in. I said to Dominic the next day, I said, you're lucky, you know, mate. I said, because his best mate I, died, but he can't have known. And then you watch that and you're yeah. like... And you, he wanted you to write his book, didn't he, and everything? I've done it. Peter Wellman. Oh, well, hopefully we yeah, can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, I was, I've got to give yeah, you can uh, still do it, can't Peter, you? Peter yeah. Wildman a shout because he said, Jamie... I mean, a lot of people have asked him, he did tell me, but, you know, of course he's in the public spotlight. I mean, you could have done it, maybe you're a bit too close, but he said, Jamie, I want you to do it more than anyone. And I took that as an absolute <laughs> fucking honour. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we need to get with his cousin, Hammy. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like, I'd like to think we can do that next year, because I've had about mm. seven or eight messages in the last year saying, did you get enough of Peter? Is the book still going to happen? Are you going to get a lot more than after this? So, <laughs> but yeah, no, seriously, I'm looking at Peter there, mate. So if you're yeah, watching it, he'll be yeah. drinking upstairs. And it'll be happening anyway. How yeah. did he... What What was the reason? Or is it private? All right, so Peter, um, my theory is, you know, he, he just lived like large. He gave up in the end. He lived he? large his entire life. I mean, the things that he did, the people he clicked up with, the amount of drugs he did, it was all mm. superhuman. Yeah. Right. So he, he must have like had some comprehension that he probably, you know, he was going to do himself in at some point. Now, he quit all the drugs... After prison, he come out, but he, he couldn't quit the alcohol. So every day he was, you know, even when I met him at the airport, I took him litres and litres of cider. He's drinking loads and loads of cider. But it was sad, he was battling with his weight and his weight went up to 29 and a half stone. He's still drinking the cider. And I noticed the problems because um, every time we did podcasts together, I would take him home, but he would always demand I stop at Bargain Booze. And, I, and then over time, I had to park in the handicap spot at Barking Booze because he could barely walk in the shop and get oh, back yeah. to the car. His mobility was gone. And then on the podcast, towards the end, there was fluid coming through his trousers. Yeah. And um, he said, oh, it's just, it's, I'm going to make bottle it as wild man water and bless people. <laughs> this was his spirit. This was his spirit. And he, he didn't want to go in the hospital because the old people needed the hospital beds because of the pandemic. This was his spirit until the end, cracking jokes. Mm. Um, but there was a situation, I've never heard fear in his voice. And I spoke to him and there was fear in his voice for the very first time. And I put this video out saying, wild well, man needs help and hospitalization. How long ago was that before the... He that was several months because he, he told me, you know, he, he had spoke to doctors and he was doing better and his weight was going down. And then bam, that, I just got that call on the way to Dominic, ne Dominic Negus. They'd passed that night. He'd been rushed to hospital with breathing difficulties. And um, I think his wife said the mask had slipped off him in the night or something, the breathing mask. Mm. One thing he did tell me was, about the month be before he passed, was um, something weird was going on with his body. He would just be awake for a day and then he'd sleep for a day and awake for a day and sleep for a day. Because mm. you were worried. You rang me once and you said... Listen, because I said, look, Peter, tell him to come up. I'll put him up and uh, we'll have a palm on and all that. And uh, you said, listen, he's not kind of like normal. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what he does, he'll, he'll go to bed on the Monday and get up on the Wednesday. And I said, sure, I'm weird anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but yeah, I'd like to think it could be done. I think, uh, you know, he absolutely merits some of the stories, mm. some fantastic stories of him going around, coming home, not knowing where he's been for three days. He, you know, there's there's people, there's hellraisers, and then there's then there's him on his own. Yeah. He is like someone you've never ever read. And have you got all his stories? Well, well, yeah. There's, there's yeah, enough yeah, people yeah. about. I mean, and, he, uh, he's got hundreds of videos on YouTube of him telling all the stories. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so fortunately, you know, it was all yeah. Um, he lives on on YouTube. Yeah. Do you know, it's quite funny because he got me into trouble last year. I was in his Please studio. Did. Yeah. I was in a studio and uh, the wife's like, Jamie, don't be drinking. I was like, no, no, I'm not. Anyway, he had this, he had this, do you remember this box of wine? 
But it was about four litres. It was disgusting. So, country wine or country manor or something like that. <laughs> but he didn't give me like a glass of wine. He gave me like a pint. <laughs> so, I'm going home with Paddy Maloney and I'm drinking. I thought, oh, I've got the taste of it now. So, I said, Paddy, pull over. So, I've got, got loads of drinks. So I got in. I was absolutely hammered. And she's like, oh, what have I told you? I said, it wasn't my fault. It was wild man. <laughs> he, he, he forced me to get drunk. So, yeah. but, uh, God rest him. Yeah, Pete, if you're listening, that was your fault. Multiple, multiple <laughs> organ failure it was in the end. Right. But, you know, he had, he had a few heart problems in Arizona because he, he'd, he'd smoke a load of crack and a load of um, crystal meth. And he'd be up for two weeks. He'd just go walk about. You know. Sometimes he'd end up in the hospital yeah, or he'd just walk into a stranger's house and they'd call the cops on him. <laughs> but when, yeah. they, when, he got, when we all got arrested, they had to put a stent in his heart right away. Right. But he had other heart mm. situations in, back when he was in but his... One of the most from, from the drug intake. From the drug intake. Of one of the, yeah. This is an amazing story. This has got to be in a book. <laughs> is, so he goes to work. He's got this amazing job. He's a, get wild man over. Oh, he's like the wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> Suits. <laughs> Sean, English Sean. John Lennon's cousin or whatever the story is. <laughs> Paul McCartney, was it? My, my aunt was telling me I was Paul McCartney yeah. when I was a kid in America. And then all the American girls were coming over so, to talk yeah. to me. I was like, yeah, I like yeah. this. So he's this cool guy. Everyone gets attention. Peter comes over. He goes to, goes to where, comes in, opens the door. There's crack dealers, prostitutes. <laughs> he's just totally made his house like a crack den. <laughs> yeah, wherever he went, all the street people, he invited them in. So you'd, someone would be cooking up crack in the kitchen, you'd have <laughs> transgender, yeah. Native American uh, sex workers, yeah. uh, Russian mafia, Italian mafia, all the guns, maf- just everything. Gu- guns, every, uh, yeah, gangbangers. <laughs> it was a, such an eclectic yeah. mix of people. But Wildman brought them all together. Yeah. And that was the thing between me and him. I was shy and anxious as a kid. Mm. Wherever Wildman went, he just lit up the room and would talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. Right. So I got to meet everybody through him because I didn't, I wouldn't do that. I was, I, yeah, I had social anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Class. Well, you know, he'd, he'd often like go missing and, and he'd say, well, Peter, where have you been? You've been gone three days. He's come home. She feet battered, no shoes on. And he'd, he'd be like, well, the last thing I remember was smoking crystal meth and then, and he's gone and he, yeah. he doesn't know and he could pass, he no idea. Do you know that was just a normal Saturday night? Turn of, was... turn of the millennium. Yeah. Took him to Las Vegas for the millennium party. We go to some club and he's fucking off his head on all kinds of pills and meth and everything. He's got a tin of fucking drugs. The bouncers like fucking are hassling him. They won't even let him in. So he's like, you guys all just go in. So we, we go in and, and he, he wanders off. And then the next thing, next thing, it's three in the morning. Me and my wife are in a casino, like playing the slot machines. <laughs> All the security just run through the hotel, <laughs> right? Next thing, these massive American security guys are herding wild man out of like, I don't know, Caesar's Palace or wherever the fuck it was. And I'm like, whoa, there's Peter. All he's got on is his pants and he's, he's topless. And he's, he's just got his pants on. He was fully dressed when he went out, but now he's just got his pants on. Yeah. So we run over to the security guys and we're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's with us. And they're like, he can't speak. He's so messed up right now. He doesn't know who he is, where he is, where he's from, yeah. what hotel he's staying. <laughs> I'm like, no, he's with us, he's with us. And he's just looking at me like, oh, he can't speak. He's all right, he can't speak. So I had to, I had to talk, talk them into, fucking, into uh, releasing him to yeah. us. <laughs> but he just, he just went full on. Yeah, any man. amount of drugs, any danger, he just yeah. went full on in everything he did yeah. throughout his life. He was like, you know. But he lived a hell of a life. Yeah, he... Um... He was someone who just 100 mile an hour. And if there was saying, there's a, do you ever seen the honey badger where they just stick the head in bees? <laughs> that that <laughs> yeah, was yeah, it. Yeah, the yeah, danger. Yeah. He danger. Just, just right, yeah. like that. Do you know right, what I mean? Yeah. But he was a one off, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, in Arizona, he was he, he had cartel relationships, Colombian, Mexican yeah. cartel, biker gangs. When he goes to prison, he knocks out the Aryan Brotherhood guy and they give him his job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he just clicked up with like yeah. really dangerous. People and uh, yeah, good. <laughs> well, thanks guys for coming on. This has been Absolute amazing. Pleasure. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, if you've if you're watching this, you've enjoyed this. It's been nothing but love and support coming in. So please let us know in the comments what you think. Really nice of Jamie to organise oh, all this and, yeah. and you know be here this evening. So please support his work. He's got his channel 
He's got all kinds of true, uh, true crime stuff on his War channel. War crime publishing. Plus loads of uh, audio books we've done. Yeah, with uh, there's lots of uh, Paul Sykes, Roy Shaw, Lee Duffy. Uh, I'm moving into football. You're educating now. me about all those guys? Uh, you, no ne idea. you never Sykes knew who Paul was Sykes was, and I was like, what the yeah, hell? Yeah, um, yeah. Do you know, but I just like to, I just like interesting people. If I'm, you know, I wasn't exactly like Peter, but if someone said there's an absolute nutter, don't go near him. Yeah. I have to, go, I have to go and find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I like kind of strange, bizarre people. So yeah, um, yeah f moving into footballers though, uh, footballers, boxers. Alex Reed, if you're watching, working on him. Oh, working on everyone. Just... Shout out to Alan Thompson as well. Alan Thompson, yeah. Paul Venice, uh, Dominic Negus. Met a lot of interesting people England last footballer. Yeah, last oh, yeah. couple of years. Yeah. I've just done his book. Um, but yeah, you know, I've done true crime. I'm I'm, late, I'm having a bit of a break for a couple of years because, yeah. yeah, I'm actually I'm writing a book at the minute about Jack the Ripper. Sweet. So yeah, there's something about Whitechapel. That's what Morrissey said. There's something about Whitechapel. Not much, but something. <laughs> Anything you want to say, Shane, to the viewers, no, the just, young people watching this? Then just thanks for having us, and just uh, you know, if I can change, you can you can do it. it you know, it's hard, but you know. I've got plenty of friends as well. You know, I've got another friend who's recently just been planning to go on an absolute wild one. And uh, I've managed to have a good chat with him, talk him out of it and make him think right, really. And he's mm -hmm. messages today saying he's going to try and get into church and all that. So uh, you know who that is if you watch. Um, keep with God, man, no matter how hard it gets. Just keep with God and he'll keep you with your family, uh, with your kids, and keep your eyes. Because if you're stuck in jail for 20, 30 years, uh, do you know what I mean? Mm. On the waist. Who's going to look after your family? you know what I mean? Think about your mum as well. Like what and your mum, yeah. yeah. You, everybody, yeah. everything. You know, you've got no control in jail. And anything on the out, it's, it's you know, just left behind, isn't it, really? Especially if you get a big sentence. Sack that. Mm. You know? So you've got another guest tomorrow, Richie Horsley, good friend of mine yeah. with Warcry Publishing. Bit of a, he's an ex bare knuckle boxer, Dorman, lots of stories with uh, Richie, so you'll enjoy Richie's company. Appreciate he's a great that guy. as well, Jamie. Thank My you. pleasure. Yeah. Right, so hope you've enjoyed watching this. Give us a hug, big man. Oh, oh, I don't need a hug, I'm going home with him. <laughs> All right, today we've got Shane, who was described by the Home Office as in the top six most dangerous prisoners in the country. And we've got Wildman co-interviewing in the Liverpool studio. Wildman's playlist is in the description box below this video. Over 100 videos now, hours and hours of content if you want to check out the Wildman stuff. So Shane, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having us. How did the come to this conclusion that you were one of the six most dangerous prisoners in the UK? Because I was just attacking, attacking officers and hate the system. We started off basically me going to jail for. Um, I was first originally charged for two attempted murders. Two attempted murders. Are you able to um, describe the story behind them, or can you not talk about that? Yeah, well, I can. Well, the, the first attempted murder was uh, there was a lad from Hartlepool who was meant to be a nutcase himself, and he'd just getting out of prison. And we confronted each other over something in the middle of the town centre in Hartlepool. And, and that's when he pulled out a hammer. We call them mash hammers, the square ones, what you do pavement slabs with. And you can get the big long handled ones or the short handled ones, yeah. you get a short one of them. And he ran up to me and he smashed me across the top of my head. But as he was doing that, I, had, I used to walk about with uh, this, you know, the kitchen knives. I used to have the full set all around my waist. Okay, and I would walk the streets. And I um, basically pulled out the biggest one, which was the nine inch kitchen blade. And I stabbed him straight through the top of his head here. And it come out of his eyebrow there. Uh, and then, obviously, everybody scattered. Everyone shouted, please. Everybody ran. He was left with a knife. See, when I ran away, because what used to happen to me, I was a bit mentally ill at the time. Mm -hmm. So when, when I felt threatened, I would I'd go blank. And so I didn't really know what was going on. All I knew was he hit me across the head with a hammer. And everything else I'm telling you is what was in the depths and what like witnesses had said. But I ran away and I got a mile away from the scene and I come back round and I was not come back normal. And I thought I had the knife still in my hand because I had the handle in my hand. And when I had the handle in my hand, everyone was like, just look white, like 
pale white, like they would just look scared, like they'd seen a ghost. And I was like, "What's up with you? They went, "You've killed him." I said, "You just stabbed him." Yeah, I said, "No, I've got the knife in my hand." And, and I looked, the and I go, and he had the handle, and I'd left the handle in. I've let the blade in his in his head, and it's the handle had snapped off, and I'd we'd, we'd ran. So that was the first attempted murder. So if he drew first blood. You reacted in self-defense. Is it because of the nature of your reaction with the knife? It becomes that serious a charge. They can't, you can't say it's just self-defense. You look at it's premeditated, though. Only if you're actually carrying a blade, you? kind of if, kitchen set. Yeah, if, if you pick, <laughs> if you pick the brick up, yeah, there and then and did it, it's it's not premeditated. Right. But if you've got like you know more knives than fucking Rambo. Rambo, yeah. <laughs> Were you in some kind of gangland warfare that this was no, going I've on? No, I've never, I've never been in. I used to think I was a gangster when I was younger, and I, yeah. when I was running about like an idiot. But when I look back on my life, I was, I was just an idiot. How old were you when this happened? I was young. You talking? I don't know about nineteen, eighteen, nineteen when that happened. It's good that you describe yourself as an idiot because the kids watching this, we don't, no, want, we don't want it to be glamorized. A hundred percent. What do you say to kids who are carrying knives like that? Just it's wrong. And you think you're big and tough at the time, but it's a, it's a big mistake. At the end of the day, you can kill them. And not nine times out of ten when people carry knives, it's it's not to, um, to stab people. You know what I mean? It's, some people aren't capable, but they carry them and then you end up getting into situations where they end up stabbing someone and then you end up killing them. And then it's like you've ruined their life and you've ruined your own life and your family's lives and their family's lives. And the ripple effect of who that hurts is just... It's a big mistake for me, and the reg for me changing my heart. See, this is the difference. Here we go. Um, yeah, this is the difference for me. Is when you're in a life of crime and you're going around stabbing and hurting people, it's good, and you don't care. But what about one day if you suddenly change your heart and you realise um, what you've done and you, you have them Im images in your head? Of what you did to people, and you've got to live with that. You've got to live with that for the rest of your life. And at the time, you might feel okay about it, and at the time, it might be good. But you're going to grow up, and one day, you are going to regret what you've done. And so, rather than have them regrets, it would be good not to have them. Do you know what I mean? It's, you, as, mu it's as much as I can say about it, really. If you, if you thank God, though, God will forgive. Yeah. That's a really powerful message, Shane. I really appreciate that because yeah. we do have so many young people watching the videos and. We don't want them to be picking up knives and, and ending up spending the rest of their lives in prison and the mum, seeing the mum in court and all that stuff. It's, yeah. it's absolutely heartbreaking, isn't it? And the mum of the victim as well. Yeah. And her family. But you come at you with a hammer. I mean, people nowadays, they're getting stabbed for the phone and stuff. It's terrible. But, I mean, for them to come at you with a hammer, there must have been some... Oh, there was things in the background of why that happened. This wasn't just a thing of like, you know. It wasn't just you met on the street. No, it wasn't was it. someone. What, what was the background? Are you able to talk about that? Not really, but it's just about basically two people. So you have two people who are handy and two people who want to meet up on a field and fight. Well, Viv but then you, and but, yeah, but and then you have people who are classed as a bit psychopathic and a bit nuts. And then it's like. Who's more crazier? Who's willing to go as far? As far? Like so you, you, yeah, you, yeah. Well, so you t you turn up with a knife, you, t you turn up with knives, and you fight. And who's 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 going to run? And who's going to stand and take the knives? Who's going to stab it, stab the living daylights out you and kill you because they've got the guts? You know. And and I'm not saying this to brag, but I was the kind of because of my mental health, I couldn't let things go. And so I, I and the more I left it, the more aggressive and angry, and the more I would think about killing them. And I was I don't know, but I was diagnosed with having psychopathic tendencies by a psychiatrist and paranoid delusions in the sense of if someone disrespected me, for, it wouldn't go out my head, and I would sit on a daily basis and Season. plan, and and think, I'll kill him, I'll stab his neck, and and I'd daydream it, and then I'd walk down the street, and then I'd feel like people were laughing at me. I'd think, like, look at that, he's mugged you off, and they're all laughing, they all know about it. And then I'd go home and I'd be like, yeah, he's mugging me off, is he? He's mugged me off. Right, I'm going to kill him. And then I'd start daydreaming about how I was going to kill him. And I've had an incident where somebody bumped into me. This is crazy, this, but someone bumped into me. And it wouldn't leave my mind. So about six months or something, it was in my head. And I was thinking about killing him and that. And I turned up at his door six months after. I was like, oh, then get out, uh, to go on a bit mad. And he was like, what on earth you're on about? 
he totally forgot. Even on the same day, he forgot he, it, all this happened. But I'm still there six months down the line wanting to kill him and thinking about it. And it wouldn't go out my head. Fuck and that was the kind of person I was. I wasn't hard, but I was game. Yeah. I wouldn't back down from anybody and I'd have a fight. And I would fight people. I wasn't like, I wouldn't do not do that. But there was something not wired in my head. And I just, even if I had a fight and I got beat, I wouldn't be able to leave it. I'd have to come back. I'd have to kill him. I'd have to stab him. I'd have to, I just couldn't leave it in my brain. You'd take it to the next level. hundred, Yeah. Which I've proven, and that's what I've, I've, I've sort of done in my life. Well, you look like a big, handy fella now, but you yeah. said you were even bigger back then. I was about 19 stone. Full were you of on weights and stuff? Yeah, weights constantly. It's why I stopped the pres- like I, when I went in prison and went a bit wild. It's why I've like done crazy things, because they wouldn't let me go to the gym and stuff like that. So I've kicked off and ended up with bigger charges in prison and stuff. Did you get on the steroids or drugs? I've been on steroids, yeah. Drugs was just more like a, I couldn't, if I took any weed or at the time it was tack weed solid and I would just go paranoid instantly. If I took whiz, I'd be paranoid to death. If I tried to take drugs, I would just go super paranoid. And at the time I used to think, because I was paranoid, I used to always worried about being shown up in a fight. And so I would just constantly train. I wouldn't take drugs and I would just train constantly because I always felt like people were out to get me and I had to be ready at all times so that I could win like i can't explain how my mind used to think when what? i was in prison sorry when i was in prison over there i i generally took semi-geesics make semis yeah you know, like you get twos and fours they make you sleep good but um you see some of them especially the scottish they're just smacked out they must do more smack in fucking prison than they do outside yeah there's loads of drugs in jail and that fucking crazy it's more in jail than on the out sometimes isn't it and then you got Sunderland and Millsburg, like you say, Hartlepool. And don't they call them monkeys or something? What, monkey hangers, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they get called. And the the storyline behind that, because <laughs> the mentor have found a, a monkey on a boat and thought it was a spy. <laughs> so they hanged it, and so they get called monkey hangers to this day. Yeah. <laughs> but they get insulted at that, so I'm not meaning to insult people. He said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, just to put this on the same playing field then, I've got so many stories about Wild Man's paranoia. <laughs> he'd stay up on Crystal Meth for a week at a time and then he'd think like the Mexicans were coming to kill him and stuff. But there was one night in particular, me and a bouncer, this bouncer had been telling him stories of Wild Man before Wild Man arrived in America and he thought I was embellishing. He goes, I finally met Wild Man and we went out and Wild Man just picked me up like I was a rag doll and threw me around and all this stuff. So I'm, me and this bouncer in the front of the car, Wild Man's in the back and we're driving away. I'm like on, on ecstasy and stuff buzzing and Wild Man's just looking at me, just staring at me with his bloodshot eyes. He hasn't slept in a week. I'm like, what's up, lad? Like? He's just staring at me and he goes, I know you two are taking me out to the desert. <laughs> we're like what we're you, your best mates we love you what are you talking about <laughs> I know too much you're taking me out to the desert aren't you you build yourself up don't yeah, you and, you might, yeah. and I'm thinking if he believes this he's probably got a weapon on him any minute right now <laughs> I'm driving there's going to be a fucking knife going in my neck or something no it's going to choke us <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be like a lot of that. You get the rest together, bang them together, and joke them out. Class. <laughs> so you said um, there was a second attempted murder. What was the backstory for that? Well, that one was this. Some. What happened is someone passed a, um, a lie around that I'd done some to a uh, chased an, an older woman or something, mm. and he passed that around to get an, a, a lad who was meant to be a bit handy at the time to get him involved, and it wasn't true. And I was selling ecstasy at the time, but mine probably wasn't as good as yours, but no, <laughs> I used to sell them at the time. It was only a few, and I, I had a, a bag of 100E, and I went in to get rid of them because someone had passed a rumour around that they had um, heroin in because I had brown speckly dots mm. on them, and someone said they'd been mixed with heroin. And at the time, it wasn't a big thing where I come from, so no one would have them. So I walked into a club and didn't realise that they'd passed this rumour around. Mm. And there was a local lad who was pretty handy at the time. Um, I give the eight me mate, when he have a free night, there's under eight for you. And I chucked them to him and he's there with his pals and his long leather jacket, you know. And he went, hey, I want a word with you. And I remember going to the side and I sat down with him 
And I, he, he said what he'd said. And I went to explain myself. I thought, wait there a minute. I don't have to exp explain myself to him. And I sat back. And he, he's going on and on and on. And then I just remember looking to the side and thinking, he's just pulled me up here. The whole club was silent. Everyone knew I was getting a bit mad now and everyone was getting a bit fearful of me. And I just had this sense, if I don't do anything to him here, he's just pulled me up. If I walk away, it looks like he's pulled me up and I've backed down. I'm going to lose first. And I'll, Yeah, that's what I thought. So I made a choice there and then. I want to make an example of him so all these people in here know what's going to happen when you pull me up. And then as I'm thinking this in my head, he said the wrong thing. He come forward a bit on the, on the table and he just said, hey, you want to mess about with the big boys, do you? Mm -hmm. And something snapped in my head and I went into his face. Remember, I'm, a, I'm not a gangster, but I thought I was. I put my head in my face into his face and I said, no, 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 no. You just messed about with, you know, come outside. I said, I'm going to kill you. So I walked outside the club and it was on some steps. It's called the Royal Arms area in Pete Lee. And he didn't come out, so I thought, oh, he's flapped it, he's back down. And uh, I went to the top of the stairs and there was loads of people in front of him. They were saying, do not go out there, he means what he says. And they were trying, he's like, no, when you've had a drink, move out the way and yeah, stuff like that. And uh, anyway, I heard one of them shout, leave him. He's being warned, leave him, let him go. And uh, they all stepped out the way. He come out, I, I went to the top of the stairs with a knife, like, you know, my fam fam famous pack. And I just basically <laughs> pulled out the nine-inch kitchen blade and I waited for the door to open. And as he come out, I turned around and just stuck the knife straight through his body. Oh, my God. And I pulled it in out. The chest, in the heart. Around about there. Oh. I pulled it out. And when I pulled it, when I pulled it out, it made like a, oh. like a sound like that. No sound going in. So I'm guessing it must be oh. like the, the, the wind, the air sucking in. Yeah. Oh. So when I pulled out, it... And then he just... What was weird about what I can see is when I did it and pulled it out, I looked. I actually thought I'd missed because there was no blood. Then all of a sudden, he just dropped. And then it was just like, like just so fast as if there was a tap. It was that deep cut. I've, I've seen him before. Where I've seen a guy get slashed. And you actually open up for a bit and there's no blood at all. You it think, was weird. Is that yeah. weird? And next minute, it's and then because just it's so deep. And that's what's happened. And he basically, that it was just like a tap I was on, and it was just it went from having nothing to literally it was just like a tap. Then two lads jumped off this step, and they both pulled out knives, and it was like a standoff. So I'm in the middle, and when I'm going for him, he's trying to get me. And then when I'm going for him, so what I did is I thought to myself, see how calm I am in this in this situation. Everyone to be panicking, and I just thought to myself, wait there a minute, he's coming at me, but he was forward, so he's. He's like jabbing at me. Yeah. And he's 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 forward and I thought to myself, I can get him in the temple. I thought if I pretend to go for him, then I can just swing and get him. And so I went to pretend to get him, and as he come in, I just turned and just swung and he just got his head back. And I just missed him and he went, Whoa. He said he means business him, are we? And they both walked off. Did you think about throwing the nerves at him? I didn't know. I didn't. Well, if I'd have been in trouble if I threw it, and then they both stood with one. But yeah. <laughs> shit. <laughs> so I'd have been a bit. Like in his pack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'd have been in tr trouble a little bit. But yeah, just sort of. Uh, and now I'm on the run. Um, see, because the first one, what happened is there was not much evidence on it, so they had to bail me for further investigation. Mm -hmm. So they bailed me on a further investigation, which shocked me. But sometimes I think the police just want you to get lifed off and they know you're going to. So like, yeah, get him out again. Go on, he's going to do something. And that might be my paranoia. What but... was your bail on the first one? Uh, the bail was attempted murder. I mean, well, how much do you have to pay to get out of the bail? Oh, you don't. You don't. Not in this country. They just let you out? Yeah. Yeah. Attempted murder? Yeah. No, it, it's due to lack of evidence. So what's, it is, there was no evidence at the time. There wasn't much evidence. Right. They've got to build up for the Crown Court. Right. Yeah. And, and, they're hoping and they're hoping you'll do something else. To make well, that that's what I'm, I'm yeah. guessing. But uh, yeah. what happened was is, so then I'm, on, I'm, I'm bailed on that one. And while I'm on bail for that one, this happened. And now they're after, now they're like blocking estates off and, Raiding people's houses, who I don't even know, and then the people who I do know, they were they went to a different area, come in with the uh, not guns like dogs and the riot gear and all that, went straight to the pictures of me, smashed the pictures out and took the photos, like it's illegal, really. I think that you take that's someone else's house, you can't go and take the property without any. But they were just going in people's houses, smashing their, getting the pictures out and taking the pictures with them.
They're yeah. making themselves a nuisance because they were thinking, oh, these are going to get fed up if he's looking for them. Well, one of them is going to dob him in. You yeah. know what I mean? They were torturing, like, yeah. just all over people, do you know what I mean, to get me in. And they even had, like, um, photographs what they were given to every, all shops around all local areas. And the reason why I knew this is I walked in the shop one day. And you know when you just see that the, the, the shop woman just like, as if she knew who I was, she was just like, and like just act, and I just thought, nah, and I ran. And I went out and I ran. And they were telling people like, no, if you see this person, you know, ring instantly and stuff. And within like five, ten minutes, the whole area was just absolutely covered. You so see, I couldn't go out anywhere. I couldn't do out. You see the notice board with like people selling fridges and that, and a big wanted picture with you. you <laughs> know, what's going on here? Yeah, no, yeah. It's crazy. How long were you on the run for? About three or four months. What was your strategy? Uh, get revenge on everybody I can before I get caught. So you wasn't just trying to hide, you were trying to get revenge as well. Yeah, so there was one occasion where. Um, I pulled up, I haven't mentioned this, I don't think, where I pulled up outside of a house and um, I was actually going for the motorbike. There was a nice motorbike there and I thought, oh, I'll get that one. And as I was pinching the motorbike, someone hung out the top window and went, oh, you, what are you doing? So I went, pinching your bike, what does it look like? And as I looked up, <laughs> I realised it was someone who hit me man when I was in prison years ago and I was like, younger. And uh, basically I just sort of like... Um, as soon as I saw him, I, I wanted him to see me. I'm on the run anyway. I thought, so I could get lifed off. I took my um, helmet off. I went, you know who I am? And he was like, who are you? And then he realised who I was when I told him. And I started booting into his front door, uh, kicked his front door in. The, him and his family um, barricaded themselves in the back room so I couldn't get into the, the back room. And if, if the truth is, and I'm not going to hide who I was, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed of who I am. I had no... You know, you get criminals. I don't know if you can say this. But it's criminals who think they're morally right and the moral because I don't do this thing and I don't do that. They justify things. What yeah, are but justifiable. The criminals are criminals. Just make it. But they're trying to make themselves feel better. Yeah, that's all. And that's what it was. You know, but I was, I had no morals. Like I would have killed anyone in that room if I got in it. Like I just didn't care. And you know, scumbag or not, who cares? And if I can't get you, I'll come after your mother. If I can't get your mother, I'll come after your wife. If I can't get your wife, I'll get you back. You know, and this is how I used to think. And it's morally wrong. And when I look back, and the thing is, is I've got kids now. And so the biggest thing for me, you know, I was talking earlier on about you've done things in your life and, and you've got to live with it. And I've got, like, I've got like five kids now under 10. And the thought of them having to experience um, being like dragged into a, a room and have to be barricaded in because some crazy man is trying to come in and get them. It's like an experience I would never want my children to experience. And so the, the, this is the things I live with. This is the things I have on a um, a daily basis. I remember washing up one day and there's something I've done in my life. So I've done that much uh, and I forgot all about it. And I was just washing up one day and it just it just hit me. I just it just I got the image of this stuff. And because uh, I used to do that all the time, running people's houses and the families would be there, and and I've got images of like kids screaming and the parents have got a hold of them, and I've got these images and me putting knives to the throat saying I'm gonna kill yours with a psychopathic look, like I've got to live with, um, I've got to live with that. Well, people can see you're a changed man, and yeah. you're extremely honest. You know, a lot of people sugarcoat what they've done and you've come in here and you've just like laid it all out nothing to hide and you know just nothing but respect for that and you're not glamorizing it either you see quite clearly you're upset over it you know what i mean respect that though man and you've told the young people this is what happens when you get into that knife game and um don't do it basically as well so otherwise a real man will come and get you with a fucking lot of ram gordon ramsay's fucking style <laughs> Imagine these two showing up at your house because <laughs> you think you're smart because you're a drug dealer or something just starting out and these two come and tax you. <laughs> All right, so you're in the house. They've barricaded themselves in. Do you try and get through the barricade or you just get out there? I try to get in and then obviously you know you've got a, like a time limit for the bobbies there. Yeah. I'm on the run anyway. As soon as my name's mentioned, they'll be everywhere. 
Did you so get at least the key for the motorbike? Yeah, I didn't get the bike. I just jumped on the one I had and done one. Yeah. And then I just went on an absolute... Do you know when you give up on life and you think, you know what, I'm, I'm going to jail for a long time, suck it. If I get life, I get life. And I just started... Um, so there was, like, and I was I was horrible to me pals as well. I, I, I was taxing me, but like going to my mates' houses and just saying, oh, how much is there on the side? And they'd be like, a couple of grand. And I'd be like, right, thank you. Oh, we man, we met them. Shut up, bang. And and I'd just start taxing everybody and just went absolutely wild. And there's a lot more, there's other stuff I've done, there's other stabbings and there's other things, but I just, I've never been caught for them, so I can't really Let's say Let's not that. discuss them. Uh, yeah, so yeah. what I mention is what I, what the police already know about, so that's it. That's all I can say. So were, were there any big time names? Like a lot of people have come on here talked about Viv Graham, Lee Duffy, people like that. For your era, were there any big time names you were associated with? Uh, associated with is this is what I'm saying. I, I, I thought I was a gangster. I thought I was with loads of criminals, but not not big, no big time gangsters, no big time faces. I bumped into some very big faces, and I've been around and done things with big faces. But I'm not. I'm not a gangster. I'm not a gang member. I'm just some absolute nutcase who wouldn't back down from anybody and was just an absolute psychopath who the gangsters would probably avoid. <laughs> and if anything, if not avoid, thought, oh, great having him on my side because no yeah. one else, you know. So that's all I was. I was nothing special. But at the time, I thought I was. I'd watched too many Tupac films and too many Goodfella films and I'd run about thinking that running about, being crazy and being a nutcase and having people walk across the street when you, I thought that was a gangster. And it's not. It's called gangsteritis. Yeah, well, that's what I was. <laughs> and I admit it. But at the time, I would have, if you'd have said it, I'd have been like, I'm the biggest gangster in this jail. Who wants, oh, well, then let's go. Anyone wants to fight, let's fight. And I'll beat them. And that's what I was like. But you were healthy as well, though, weren't you? You wasn't getting all drugged up and doing needles and out. No, no, I was uh, very fit. I've got, uh, well, you can't see it now, but I've, there's pictures where I was 19 stone, absolutely ripped to death. Uh, psychopathic. Um, I bumped into. Um, Actually, is it, I wouldn't say he's a big name as in he's like an international name, but there's someone in Middlesbrough who is a pretty tough lad and he is well known. And he's a, a fighter, super heavyweight world champion as well. He's called Paul Venice. Big lad then. Uh, he, yeah, he's a, he, if you look at his fights, he's called Paul Venice and he he's a very, very hard man and a, a very tough tough lad and well known. And he's he basically um, he says a few things about me. Uh, about me being a bit of a nutter, and, and in one of them, he just says uh, basically that he um, he knows he could beat me. He knows he would have beat me back then in a fight, but at the same time, he knows how much of a nutcase he is, and probably he's asked to watch every bush he walks past when he, you know. <laughs> so sometimes I think there's different kinds of a reputation. You see, why well, I'd say there's three. I'd say there's the big boys, and they're in it for the money, and they're in, and it's all about becoming powerful and and like mafia kind of figures and ecstasy kingpings or whatever you know but and then you've got on that under that level you've got two kinds of reputations so you've got people who can fight and not they can fight and they're hard and not many people Strange. can beat them and then you get the psychopathic people who yeah. people just think avoid him don't cross him because he'll turn up at your front door and blow your head well, off the guys who fight as well avoid the psychopathic too yeah and that's what i'm on about you don't i mean like I'm going to have a straight room with anyone, but I don't really want to fancy someone with like 10 kitchen fucking knives, you know what I mean? He's and like, I think it's the gameness, because anyone can carry a knife, but not everyone's got the capability to kill. And I, Oh, I, no, Even no, people no. who kill, like really, I, I, this might sound crazy, but there's people who carry knives and the, 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 their intention's not to kill anyone, and they get into this mad scruffle and fight, and then they, like, they end up stabbing them out of fear sometimes. They didn't, didn't intend to kill them. And then they're like, they're, you know, it, it's not in them. Well, nine that times out of sense. ten, it's like if you corner a rat, it'll attack. And that, that's basically, when you've got a knife, nine times out of ten people aren't carrying it to go and actually it hurt someone. They're carrying it so it's they defense, don't get hurt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then when it kicks off, something happens. But because of that, afterwards, they've just got a big and say, yeah, I'm a murderer. Yeah, I've done this. You know, when they're in jail. But the truth is, it's not in them. Whereas there's people who it is. And, and that was me. Like, I, I, I daydreamed it, I literally daydreamed about killing people on a daily basis. When you stuck it, did you have a limit of, like, you thought, I'll just put half the knife in? Or you... <laughs> no, I just I just did it, yeah. I was asked a question, uh, when I was interviewed for the news thing, the man said to me, uh, would, would you 
of being bothered if you killed them. And my instant reaction at the time was, no. That's all going for. That was my intention. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you don't stab someone in the head because you want to... The only thing is I was a bit clueless at the time and didn't realise that the head probably is the hardest part of the body. You know, if you want to kill someone, well, I better stop going at that. It must have been a good life, though, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it wasn't one from Iceland, today, was it? <laughs> it was bent. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one, yeah. <laughs> My favourite ones I used to like was like them Rambo knives. Mm. And they got a compass on the top. Oh, yeah. And you can unscrew them and you normally have matches and all that in. Oh, fishy I used to have them. I used to have them. I used to like, like walking about with them as well. I used to love them. Commando knives, aren't they? Yeah. Because it's like, it's weird. Because obviously I must have been mentally ill. Because I would look at knives as it, like they were like a god. I, I, this might sound like I would sit and stare at them and turn them round. And I remember being in a party. I killed the buzz. Everyone's wrecked. Listen to this. So everybody's <laughs> wrecked. This is funny, this. And there's some handy lads in there as well. They're all wrecked. And I pulled my knife out because it was new. And yeah. it was one of them Rambo ones. And I'm turning it. I'm looking at it. And I forgot where I was. I actually forgot where I was. And I'm turning the knife round. And, and, and then I just got this urge, like, go and kill someone. So I looked up and I went, oh, well, let's go and kill someone. And everyone was all on the ends of the city like that, all crumpled up to one side. <laughs> and they were just, like, staring, no fear. And one of them just slowly come up. They went, oh, you mate, you're killing the buzz and took the knife out of my hand. And then, you know, wow. and this is what I was like. This, I was a bit just mentally ill. Yeah. I wasn't no criminal. I wasn't no gangster. I wasn't anything. Just mentally ill. And people just avoided me like the plague. And that's it. Uh, and and that's all I was, you know. Did they pull you up for that? Did they give you, like, Thorazine or out? I've been under the mental... I was uh, sectioned off. Mm. I got sectioned off. Uh, it used to be called St. Luke's at the time in, in Middlesbrough. And I was sectioned in there. I got sectioned in there because the police said they just... I had no fear against the system. I had no... So, like, I even remember pulling a knife out on the police officer. It's the worst place you can go, though, isn't it? Section 18. It's like, it's fucking hell. It's like one flew over the cuckoo's fucking nest. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I've met some characters. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Why did you pull a knife on the cop? Because I just didn't... I thought, like, they were authority on, and I thought, I'm not running from you. I'm not scared of anybody, so you, you think I'm going to run? I remember having some videos. This is crazy as well. I'd just burgled a house with somebody and the police come and they skidded the car and everyone scattered. That's a normal thing for a normal person to do. do. You've got yeah, to get away. Yeah. So I'm walking along as if they're mine. He's <laughs> like, can you come here? I was like, no. He's like, so get off. He's like, oh, we just had a real losses. Take your hands off the knife. Take your hands off them. And I pulled, chucked them all on the floor, pulled my knife out and ran towards him and he was running around the car. And then that's the first time... Um, Psychiatrists sort of get started getting involved in my life. Should have showed her a blockbuster card. <laughs> and then the, <laughs> the other one was uh, I had a gun, and uh, I, I just wanted to see what someone would be like. And so it was a security guard in Middlesbrough Town Centre, and the football uh, thingy was on football game, and I uh, pulled the gun out on the um, the security guard, and he ran at us, <laughs> made me run away. He ran at you, <laughs> did you? <laughs> he ran at me, and I ran off. <laughs> I was only young at the time. Is that what Cockle said? If it's a gun, run at him. If it's a knife, run off. Yeah. Is that what he yeah, said? He, he did. He ran at me, but it panicked me because I was flipping neck. And I was only, I wasn't going to do out, but it was just to scare him. And I had armed police raid my mum's house. I had the armed police all over the place. Uh, all for the, No, just daft little things I used to do, just absolutely off me. Not really. But Brian see. said that in his last interview. He said, if someone pulls a gun at you, run at him. If someone pulls a knife, run away. I'll just say run on both. <laughs> That's the right thing to do. <laughs> or get on your knees and say sorry. You know? <laughs> so these are fascinating stories. Good grief. And But the question was, you told us now about these, these arrests for attempted murder. Um, you became in the top six most dangerous prisoners in the UK. How did that come about then? Um... Because I refused to listen to the system. I hated the system. I just hated authority, really. But what I didn't like is, look, if you're a prison officer and you're sound, you're sound. You're doing your job. Good. But you get them ones who put a white shirt on and they've got power behind them because they've got 20 million prison officers behind them. And they just become dogs, really. And there was this one. I loved my gym at the time. And in home, I was prison at the time where I was. You had to press the buzzer 
you sell the buzzer, they'd come to the end of the wing and shout Jim. Jim, yeah. And you'd press your buzzer and they'd come and open the door of everyone who pressed the buzzer. Same with church, was it? Yeah, they weren't doing that for me. So they weren't opening my door. Bastards. So I pressed the buzzer the first time. I said, oh, how come you're not opening my door? He went, oh, I'll make sure I'll do it next time. So the next time comes, press my buzzer, doesn't even come on my landing. But I'm not, they're not doing this to me. Was the reason they were messing with you like that? Probably just because I was running around the jail, like causing havoc and getting involved in... You don't like you getting big either. Yeah, well, I was. Set, I did get involved. I was getting, like, I don't want to make it sound like I was a fit, like, doing out, but I was, like, m muscling in on people as well, like, bullying people and saying, hey, give me some drugs, hey, I want this, I want... Cause, yeah, um, we'll do it fucking 19 stone, fucking yeah, Rick, you know what I mean? Just a nutcase. Fuck it. <laughs> and uh, basically, they just didn't like me, and, and they didn't like the fact that I wouldn't listen to them, and I was always running my mouth, and... And anyway, they weren't letting me out. So what I did, I, pressed, I waited till I saw the officer who I wanted on the wing. And I pressed my buzzer and he come. I said, and he start. I said, what about the gym? I said, you said you'd let me out. He went, oh, what a pity. I said, see you. I said, you're dead. I said, I want to get you. He went, oh, whatever. I've heard it all before. I said, we'll see. Okay, then. So instantly set up a, start setting up a plan. And I went out on a, like association and associations when all the inmates go out and play pool, get a shower, uh, you know, do whatever they do and they mingle on the wing. Yeah. And and that's what association is. And uh, Watch I went... your bit of TV till the fight goes off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, and then use the TV. Yeah. <laughs> and then they had these big, massive coffee jars, like glass coffee jars. And it was the only thing I had at hand, you know, dead quick to think about. As soon as the door opened on association... I got that, wrapped it in a towel, and had it as if I was going into the showers. Walked on the bottom landing where all the playing pool. And I went up to two lads and I said, look, you know if you kick off, anything kicks off, them officers, because they always stand near the gates to get on and off the wing if anything happens. I said, you know they're going to get off the wing. Shit sounds like, like yeah. they stand right near the gates as well, or yeah. on either side. <laughs> so I said to them, I said, uh, go to them and just talk to the officers. So when it kicks off, just stand in front of the gate so they can't get off the wing. So that's what they did. Uh, they went over, they're chatting away at the officer, he thinks having a normal chat. And then I went up to another lad from Pete Lee and I said, right, start chucking pool balls at the officer, or screws we'd call them. And he went, oh, like, he was like, ah, oh, I don't know, man. I says, listen, mate, I said, do you want respect or not? And I knew him from on the out. And he was like, ah, oh, I don't know. I says, look, just do it, man. And he did. He said, okay, then. So I stepped back, I said, I'll deal with everything else. I said, you chuck the pool balls once it kicks off, I'll deal with the rest. Uh, he did, started chucking the pool balls at the officer. Officers jumped up, went to get off the wing. The lads have jumped in the front of him, stopped him getting off. He's pulled his bat on and ran towards the inmate who was uh, fingering the pool balls. At this point, I pulled out the coffee jar, smashed the bottom off, and I ran up to him and I just started stabbing him. Uh, he was putting his hands up, so I was, catch I was going for his face and his neck. But he put his hands up, and so I'm catching his hands because he's blocking. Yes. And then he, I'm trying to get him in his stomach, and then he's putting his legs up, and I've trapped him into the corner, and I just started just going wild and trying to stab him wherever I could stab him. And I was cutting my own hands as well, you know, like bit, little cuts, though, where I've had hold of it, and it's all the glass is smashing. And then another officer come. They say I stabbed them, but at this point, you're in like a frenzy, aren't you? You don't know yes. what's going on. So I, I don't know. Uh, he, he says I did uh, they got me on the floor uh, and actually they didn't get me on the floor I literally I went down so I've done what I needed to do and then I've just put the stuff down I've just laid down put my hands up they've come grabbed all my arms got my head did all that rubbish to do and then one of the officers picked my arm up put it on the glass because it was the bottom of the glass it was still stuck up and it was like one bit sticking up on that round circle at the bottom and he's got my arm there, and that was like bone, do you know what I mean? He put it on and he went, you, boom, and just with his knees, just bounced on my hand. Yes, didn't bounced. make a noise, didn't even feel it to be truthful. And that was because I was, my adrenaline was gone. Yeah. And I, would, I was so full of pride at the time, I don't want them to hear a noise come out of me. And I just basically looked up with him, and it must have scared him this, because I looked up with him, didn't make a noise, and I just went, see you. I said, when I get you for this, you're going to die. I'm going to kill you. I'm coming after your family. And that's what I said to him. And then anyway, I go to the hospital. I get shipped to Durham Prison. Went to Durham Prison. Um, they started messing about with me. See, once you do a prison officer, that's it. You're a different ball game. 
different ball game to the officers. It's like everywhere you go, it's like you want to mess with one of us. Let's go. We're going to mess with Durham's you. Durham's old school as well, yeah. isn't it? Couldn't break me though. They couldn't break me. No. What did they do to you there then? Oh, in that jail, I went to then went to a top security prison. So I, I got chucked out of there quick. Cartier van. I wasn't Cartier, but they chucked me on a Cartier van and they took me to Franklin, uh, top security prison, Franklin. Went to Franklin, they took me straight to the segregation unit. Did the Midnight Express, like just a bit of the night? Come yeah, just Cartier van. No, straight away. No, there was an incident where um, I got a weapon and threatened, like jumped out. No, I jumped out the cell with a weapon. And I went, boo! And all the officers all just jumped back <laughs> and they were all like stood there. I went, here. And they went, because they were winding me up and they put me on basic and took all my stuff off us so they thought yeah. I couldn't get weapons. So I made a weapon out of something. So you haven't got your TV. Oh, you haven't got oh no, I didn't make a weapon. Do you know the lights have got long lights yeah, 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 on yeah. the top and they've got special screws in. But I've sussed, what you do is you burn the end of a toothbrush and then you just, when it's all fully melted, I would just squash it onto the onto it so it would mould the shape of the screw. So and then, then I unscrewed got... them. So I had the metal end, you know, like the, the metal end of it yeah. instead. So I had it behind my back and I, I, I saw it when they come to the door, I went, boo! And they've all jumped back and they stood there and I was going, hey, come and get it. I said, listen very carefully. I said, if I was going to do something, your head had all, I'd already caved your skull in. I said, this is just a warning. Stop winding me up. Finally, one of them come got it. Within five, ten minutes, I just heard a van, a cat ear van, reversing up. And I was took from Durham Prison into a top security prison, Franklin. Full, uh, Franklin. Went there, took straight to the segregation unit because I was still under the prison officer. So every prison I went, I was still on charges with stabbing the prison officers. So every prison I went, it was You're straight to the You're going to get shit, aren't you? Oh, I got hammered. Straight to the seg. It was all right at first, and then they started winding me up, and I thought, sack it, let's go to the war. And when you say winding you up, what did they specifically Just do doing there? stuff like turning your lights on and off, uh, when you're going to sleep, banging your door, keeping you awake. Ed games. Just playing with your mind, you know what I mean? And then and just wind, just doing stuff. So I just thought, you know what, sack it, let's go. And then I ended up um, battling on a daily basis. With the, they would come in, with, they would put ballys on, so I didn't know who they were. So I couldn't retaliate and stuff. And that they'd come in with ballys on, and just six or seven of them with a right gear, I'd be laid on, on my bed, just fast asleep, and they'd just come running in, boom, handcuffed. Like, you can fight for so long, doesn't matter who you are. There's only You can only fight six, seven men in riot shields uh, for so long before the, you, you, you're knackered and you have to get down. That's but three you know seconds do? right now. They got me down, and they'd handcuff me, and when they had me handcuff me, then they'd go up, do stuff. Like one of them, I'll tell you one occasion what happened. This one time I was in a camera cell and they said to me, right, come out. And I used to go through a process because I ended up on a, as a CSC prisoner in the close supervision circuit. But not on the unit or anything. It's where you're going from like seg to seg in the, in the top security prison. And you go in these cells where they've got a hatch. So you have, it's 23 hours bang up. When they'd open your door, you have to be six or seven. Like yeah, you have to be six or seven. Yeah. No, no, you have to be six or seven prison officers in right gear, or they can't open your door, and 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 then you have to go through a process. So I'd have to lie on the floor and put my hands up before they'd open the door. Then they'd slam the door open. Then they'd, be up, they'd put the shield to the door. Then they'd come, put the shield on your back, uh, wow. tell you to put your hands off your head, and then a man with riot gear on that side would search your body, and he would search you. Then they'd run to the back, back to the door. And then they'd say, right, stand up slowly. If you went fast at any time, they'd be on you. So you slowly got to get up and then slowly walk back till your back touches the, then you, uh, the shield. Then they'd step back. Then they'd step to shield. Then you step the side. Then they'd push you up against the wall. Then you'd be searched again. And that was just to go on the exercise yard. Then you'd have to walk backwards as slow as you possibly can until you got to the exercise yard. Then they'd get you the exercise yard, tell you to lay down. You'd lay down on the floor, put your hands on your head. And then they'd shout, go, 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 and everyone would just run. But I would try and get up to, and, and run at them. So as soon as the shield was off me, I would get up you and I would run. You didn't do yourself any favours, did you, mate? Really? I hate the system. I didn't do myself yeah. any favours at all. In fact, I come to the realisation that what was I expecting? Listen, I used to believe every time I come into crime, it's their fault he grasped me up. It's his fault. Oh, he's this. Oh, it's the prison officer's fault he locks the door. No, I committed the crime. So I'm in jail because I put myself in jail. It's not their fault. Now, here's another thing. I experienced a lot of brutality. Like, I'm talking about, like, serious brutality. 
And what was the and, what was the worst brutality? One of them was uh, they got me in there. They took like I was saying that I went through that process and they said to me this one time and I didn't click the first. They said go into the next room, next cell. We're going to search your script searcher. So I go to the next cell and I go to the back wall, and I'm stood there for a couple of seconds, and I just thought this isn't right. And all of a sudden the shield just went bang off my back, and and what they counted on is to grab my hands because as soon as my hands touched the wall, they had they were there. They had all of my arm. What man with right gear there? One with right gear there. But what they didn't count on was me not taking my hands off the wall and sliding my hands down the wall. Uh, so I slid my hands down the wall, turned, grabbed one of the legs and picked them up and fell with them. Then I've pushed with my legs. These are all beating me up, kicking me. And they pushed me into the le- into the I pushed them into the corner with my legs. And we're in between a metal toilet and the door. He's got his right gear on. And I remember these are boot me, pull it they, they have a thing of pulling your head back, grabbing your throat, and making it so you can't breathe. And then just as you think you're going to die, they'll let go to get you a bit of breath. And you go, <laughs> and, they'll, and they'll you right get there. that feeling like you're drowning, where your body goes into a panic. But they were trying to do all sorts of get me off, and which I get, I understand that. But I remember getting my hands, I, blank, I, black, I blanked all that out, and I had my hands so far up his shield on his thing. And all I remember doing is looking at him, and I just said, I just whispered to him and said, do not let me get my hands hands on your neck today because you were not going to home to see your family. And he started panicking. And so did the other officers. And then they started kicking me all over. And then what happened is finally you give up. You can't you can only go so far. Uh, and then they put the handcuffs on me. And I sort of wished I carried on fighting. Because they put the handcuffs on me and they tortured me for days. Absolutely tortured me. I mean like just just coming in, batting me all, and calling me a coward. So while I'm handcuffed on the floor, Shit out. they're all coming in doing all this, about 10 of them, and I'm I'm handcuffed, and I'm the coward. Yeah. Crazy, right, isn't it? Fully grown men, 10 of them. And they would come in and just beat me to a pulp, you know what I mean? Punch me all over, and they would just... Um, another thing, food. So they would get, like, the food, they would come in, just chuck it on the floor. Just leave you there, handcuffed for days on end, and that you can't do out. You can't get up, could because they d- put them on my feet as well. Put them on my back. Shouldn't see you as a dog. Well, that's you're the getting way. punished. For, you're punished for who's actually been in there, and that's it. They should treat you as a human being. In Walton, what they used to do is they'd musty squad you. If you were being an asshole, they'd literally just put you in a cell, and they'd have you know the little thin mattresses they have. Yeah, but... they'd have a couple of them. They'd roll you up in them and they'd fucking beat the shit out of you. And basically what it did was it's made it me worse. bruise all your insides, but you don't actually see the bruises on the outside, do you yeah. know what I mean? All it did with me is made me worse. And it just set all that just made they're just they're the enemy now. And I just went through this process of every single time my door opened, we were fighting. And in the end they were coming to me and saying Look, at the, they're not going to break me, this is what I thought. You're not breaking me. I'd hear, like, fully grown men who were meant to be faces down south and all that and, and, and like, screaming like girls and then that's it. I'd sack that, I'm do- but me, it would make me angry. I'd go to the door and go, what are you doing, you idiot? You're showing us up. And I would just, they'd come in and, like, try and, you know, do the chicken and try and yeah, twist yeah, it up. The chicken. And they would, and I wouldn't make a noise. Look, it would kill. Inside, I was like, ah! You know what I mean? But, but not showing. one, not I would stay as calm as possible. And they would beat me and I would stay calm. And they started sending psychiatrists. They would come to the door and saying, there's something wrong with you. Like, we can't break you. And I was like, you'll never break me. Come on, it's what? Like, I was in my own mental mind, my own mental state. And, and then from then, I remember going to Wakefield um, segregation. I went into Wakefield. So I went from Franklin, uh, then Full Sutton, Whitemore. Long la- these are all the top security prisons in the in the our estate at the time because they obviously changed sometimes, and I just um, I remember going to the White Moors a hell hole in it. I've never been, but I've heard White Moors. I like White Moors. It's got a gym on the wing and everything, man. Oh, the gym and that. Yeah, I liked it. And you you can in the dispersal system. Listen to this in the maximum security prison, right? And anyone who's been in a top security prison will know this. You can only go to the office and hire out a nine inch kitchen blade and walk around the wing. Because you can cook on the wing. So they've got cookers. 
you've got like a, a kitchen on your wing in a multi gym in what is in white a multi gym you go and train when you want you cook and all the lads cook you can order pots and pans and do you know what i mean that's fucking mad but if... you can go and order there's like they've got like three or four for a wing or a, like two nice and people are walking around you're in a top security prison right can you imagine the tension just off that you're in a top security prison right and full of killers gangsters gang members and the walk, you can walk around in the, with a nine inch kitchen blade. Will people get oh, swilled? Is that? Like, what do you mean by swill? Yeah, it? I know. I, I, like, with, with, with water and the sugar boiled. Well, it started off, you were allowed oil. Until oh, a, fucking hell. Until a prison officer got swilled with oil and got his face melted off. Yeah. And then he banned oil. So, what the lads do now is they make what you call ghee. And so, you get loads of butter. You mm -hmm. buy a load of butter, just put the butter in, you melt it. And then you pour all the bad out and you've got oil. There's oil and butter in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they use that to pick, they start swilling people with that. Or the sugar and water, because the sugar sticks, so sticks. it's worse for your skin. But the main one in the dispersals was oil. So when, this is what's funny. So when someone had start walking, because all the, um, in Whitemore, all the, the tables are on the, the bottom floor. And everyone would just be sat mingling around. This is the tension, right? If you, a lad started walking down the stairs and he had a pan, the whole landing would disappear. Everyone would go behind the doors. Yeah, 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 look at that. We used to, anyway. <laughs> yeah. you, you just look through the gap. I used to just look through so the gap. Like, just swill. wait for who's going past. And I think, oh, it's not me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the tension, what it used to be. And I met some really big people in the, in the dispersal prisons or like powerful, like. Big faces and stuff. Do you mean shit slingers too? In America, oh, you met a lot of shit slingers. Yeah. Well, I didn't meet. There was only Pacific people I so associated with because yeah. I just, I didn't take drugs. I didn't do anything. So I was on the ball. I just keep myself to myself. If it came to me, then I would do something. But it, and it's mainly my battle was against the system and officers setting me up. And I'm surprised some of the main heads didn't put you on a payroll though to go and collect for them. No, I, it was because it's not like that in the dispersal. See, I. See, the dispersal of maximum security prisons are very different. And so you, you don't have a, a one hard man who stands out. You don't have a one crazy man who stands out. They're all crazy. They're all capable. <laughs> they're all different. Everyone, there's, all a ten, there's a tension. Yeah. Everybody knows that everyone's capable of doing stuff. And you, uh, An example, the way I can explain it. Get more it. respect that way, you though. Go, wait, no, because the way to explain it is this. So you've got Newcastle. Yeah. There's a few hard lads from Newcastle, a few faces from Newcastle. And they're in a maximum security prison on the wing. Yeah. But then you'll have faces from Manchester and big boys from Manchester who are on the wing. Red and car, Liverpool. And, so it's full of hard everywhere. cases. And it's full of people who, who oof, it doesn't matter who you are, if you, if you challenge them, they're going to battle you. Yeah. So it's, that's not how it works. It's just like everyone's in it. You, you get on with your jail. And if you have to, then you deal with whatever comes your way. But nine times out of ten, people are getting on. People are just live, you know, cooking together. Getting on a bit, you get the odd idiot to come on, uh, and and sometimes they'll get told, you know, keep you no know, chill out, you know, you're not in a young lads, yeah, you're not in a daft jail now. You'll end up getting yourself sorted out, and then everyone just chills out. But when it does kick off, it kicks off. So you've just got local, basically, say it like this: local hard lads and local faces from all over the country, all stuck in one pot. Yeah. So it's not like a person who's like, oh, look at him, stands out, oh, he's dangerous. If people don't do that in a dispersal, everyone's dangerous. Exactly, yeah. So there's a different, like, mentality. No one could come to me and try and take out off me, but no one could go to most people and try and take. You do get the odd divs who, you can, who could be bullied and intimidated, but it's just full of lifers, full of faces, full of, well, not when I was in, but the IRA, there's people like that who were in. It's probably still not getting fucked up, to be fair, like. Don't get fucked up the IRA. No, they, they were. Pop I wasn't in when they were fully in. I was only in when there was a few splinter group people. Be powerful because like they had the they had the um. Well, what I've heard they were because they were the the taught solidarity and they stuck together and there was lots of yeah. them and 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 the, and what they could do on, on the outside as well. So even prison officers would tell me that the IRA like they'd be out drinking and they'd be approached by two people and. You know what I mean? If you keep intimidating, blah, 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 we're going to shoot you dead and stuff. So this is from officers who've told me this themselves. And your family's dead. Yeah, it? and stuff like that. So, yeah. But I never, it was a, 
there was a peace talks that went on just before the Good Friday thing, wasn't there? And all the IRA were released, but there was a few splinter group ones who were in there who didn't agree with the peace talks, and they were still bombing and that at the time, and a few of them were in. So, yeah, met loads, crazy people, but... So early on, you said you met our mate Stephen, who we interviewed recently. Stevie Gillen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, he described the atmosphere how you just described it. Yeah, just tension. But how did you... Being a paranoid person then, with that tension, how did your paranoia, didn't it feed the paranoia? No, because I was a bit sensible. I take, there was a lad who come in, right, and he was a, a big, he was from uh, Nottingham Way, he's called Michael Westwood. Actually, I'm trying to find Michael Westwood, so if you see this, try and find me in, uh, up north Middlesbrough I live. No, we'll, but, we'll have all your contact details <laughs> in the description box if people but, want to um, contact you. So basically, uh, I met up with this lad, Michael Westwood, and he was having trouble with two gang gangs, one called the Johnsons and one called the Burger Bars. And Michael was in jail for supplying guns, and he got caught with a factory making bullets and all that. So he was looking, he got a big stretch, but he was massive, and he was having trouble, and I remember going up to him and teaming up. I just went up and walked into his cell. I said, I've noticed you've got trouble with everyone. I says, uh, you have my back and I'll have yours. He went, oh, do you mean that? I says, listen, mate, I said, I've got your back. I said, but have you got mine? He said, yeah, I've got your back. From then on, we were like that. Mm. So we're never away, you know what I mean? And he was like, you think I'm big? He was like 22 stone or something, solid, like just a big lad, half-cast lad, just absolutely massive, gamers, gamers can be. You know, he's like, we nearly had a fight with the officers and that over a Rocky Biscuit. You know, that's how game he is. Because we went to the server. Nice like we rocky like, biscuits yeah. to Larry. But no, well, it's it's a principle. <laughs> yeah. Everyone had got served on the survey. We went there last because we were a bit late and was like, where's my biscuit? Everyone else has had one. You know what I mean? You can't let them take the mick like that because they'll keep doing it. So he was like, where's my biscuit? And there was a big massive standoff over a rocky biscuit, chocolate rocky biscuit. <laughs> oh, my dad. People who serve on the savories, though, they, they sense of that like it's their fucking food. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know I, mean? I know. It's crazy, isn't it? So how did the standoff play out? Well, just it played out with uh, this uh, prison officer from the block was on and he didn't realise. Because when they're on the block, they individually can deal with you, you see. But when you're on the wing, it's the wing. So what happened was is he said to him, oh, do you know who I am as an officer? And that Michael Westwood was like, he got mad and he went into his face. He went, do you know who I am? And then like all the other inmates come flying behind us because there's a little bit of like everyone sticks together in yeah. that sense. And then all the officers come. And it was like a standoff for a bit, and then they calmed down and started saying, "Right, everybody, back, back to the wing, please." And they made a line, and like we were walking through like a, a line of them all, no staring at us, probably thinking, "Yeah, I'm gonna get it, you, would you know?" And they uh, went through, and that was it, really. They didn't. We were expecting to get took to the second that, and they didn't. They didn't. All they had to do was go and get the fucking rocky biscuits to Daft Punk. I like the caramel me. So basically, I teamed up with Pacific people who I knew had me back, and they had mine. And and that was it, and, and we would just be together at all times. And the tension was that big for us, and we'd be that paranoid. So the paranoia was still there. But when you know someone's looking after you, so this is how bad it was. When we were in the gym training, if anyone come walking towards the, the bench, we'd have to say, someone's coming. And we'd put the bench down, we'd stand up and wait for them going past. Like, it was just like little things we had. Was it free weights? Yeah, free weight, yeah, like proper as if you're in the gym on the out. Uh, and th and that was it. Then I met that, who you just said. Um, I'd, I wasn't really friends in that sense. Like, I didn't get the norm like I did Steve. with Michael. But Stevie Gillen, he was like, uh, how I met him was, uh, he must have some money, the lad. Because I had a lot of money saved up in my canteen. And uh, he basically, <laughs> he come to me and said, look. He said, uh, I'll send you £200 for £100. That's how we first ever, like, sort of chatted. He approached me with a, a baldy looking, tough looking lad. Like look like a fight. I think he's called John James from London. I think he's a traveller, I don't know. So I couldn't say, but John James' name was. And uh, he's well known, meant to be a face and stuff. And they both just approached me and he was just like, Look, you know, you want a little deal? I've heard you got loads of money on your canteen. He says, uh, I'll send you two hundred pounds in a week if you just get me hundred pound canteen. Sweet. I thought, well, I'm not gonna turn that down, <laughs> you know what I mean? So we did that for a little bit. And then I got chipped out, and then I re-met him again in a diff different prison and stuff like that, but that's... Just a few things for the viewers, then. Um, we've done a f over three-hour podcast with Stephen Gillen. It's in the True Crime Podcast playlist. Um, go down and check it out. 
Chet Sandu was co-interviewing on that one as well, down south. Um, it was a real laugh. It was a real good energy. And you mentioned, um, Shane mentioned the Burger Bar Boys. We interviewed ex-undercover cop Neil Woods, who's campaigning to reverse the war on drugs. He's doing good work now. He, We've got a clip on the channel about the Burger Bar Boys. He's explaining how he um, went undercover and uh, the, the kind of stuff they did, because they were really notorious, weren't they? Yeah, they were, yeah. So there's a lad in there called China. I don't know which side he was on. He was nicknamed China as well. So if any of the Birmingham people don't know who I'm on about when I say China. So he was in, he got done for killing a police officer. So they were a bit like game. And at the time as well, I'm sure two two girls were killed in a drive-by shooting. It was big on the news. Yeah. So all that was going on at the time as well. And I don't know what his beef was, Michael Westwood's beef. He was a big lad. He was a gun supplier. Um, and he, I don't know what his beef was, but he was always having beef with them. But it was like a beef where they three or four gang members were running in and he was chasing them back out and chasing them down the landing because <laughs> he's like 20-odd stone. Game, really tough lad. Game. So any time they were trying to attack him, he was always getting the better, better of them. Couldn't take him one on one. Couldn't, no. Well, they couldn't even. There was three or four of them to end up running out. <laughs> yeah. And I would hear of this. He'd go to another jail, and three or four lads would run in his cell, like gang members would run in his cell, trying to attack him. And he'd come running out with his top ripped off, chase them, chase them down the landing. So he's a he's he's meant to be a proper. A, a, I'm sure people who's been involved in that life, if they watch this, they they'll know who Michael him. Westwood is. They'll know who he is. The Burger Bar Boy. I've never. Heard of that. I don't know about that. It's all drug gangs now that take over everything. Lad, Have you like the ice cream was? Michael O'Brien. That was Glasgow old school. Yeah. A lad called Michael O'Brien. Michael O'Brien. Uh, 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 I met up with. A, I was chatting with him. Met up with a lad called uh, Billy Tobin, an old man, and he used to do yoga. <laughs> he used to go on the exercise yard and sit there all the way at, on in a handstand for an hour. Seriously, just. In a handstand, not even if you went even, he's going Shh, yoga. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, he's lost to him. You do that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I've met, I have met a lot. I tell you, I met who like, like infamous, you'd say, kind of thing is that that Black Panther, a Black Panther man. Which one's that? He's the one who he, he was he was doing all robberies. It was, it, there's a documentary on that real crime thing. What uh, Kenny Noyle? I didn't meet him in the sense of chatting, but I'd said all, he would used to walk around the. In Whitemore, he was on the exercise yard in Whitemore. I've seen a documentary about him on Vice. Which one's that, Kenny, Kenneth, Kenneth Noyle? Yeah. So him, he's a big, big, there was loads of people. What what crimes had the Black Panther done? So what he'd done is he did loads of robberies and at the end he kidnapped a young lass and he tied her up under this thing and it all went wrong. He, he, he demanded a ransom, a million pound ransom, I don't know, a big ransom. But what he didn't realise is she'd slipped or something had happened and she, when they went back, he, she was dead. Mm. So like, And then he kept, kept doing robberies and doing mad stuff and they called him the Black Panther. I mm. uh, don't know why, but I don't know what that's all about. Obviously the IRA, there's, think of every criminal you can think of. They're all in the dispersal prison, really. Charles Bronson, did you have any... Charles Bronson is... So when I was going through the CSC stage of going from sec to sec, I went in Wakefield, so there's levels... So he'll have been in Wakefield uh, unit, but the thing is, you don't see him. You don't see. It's it's isolate. You you're isolated off. It's different. Yeah. And so the one I was in, so he'll have been in the full cage. I think he's in the one where it'll have been like a cell and the full cage inside. But I was in the one where it's because um, there's like stages. So he's a prison within a prison. Yeah. Right. No, because how that works is you've got a prison within a prison, then isolation within the prison within a prison. Yeah, so so yeah. so it's like so I was in uh, the, <coughs> in the segregation bit where they had like it. So in a normal prison, you've got your cell door, haven't you? And then you've got your your cell door, and then in the one I was in, you've got a cell door. So you they would open that door. Then you've got a cage door as well, so bars. And then the next level would be like, and there's all levels, but Charlie's it's a prison unit, and that that's for the like. Very serious people, and you don't have to be violent. So you can get more violent to people in a dispersal prison. Yeah, who's not on a unit, but ten times more violent there than people who are on the unit. So you can go on the unit just You're simply, psychopaths. No, you can go on the unit simply because of how high profile of a, Ian Huntley. He's nothing. 
And in fact, he'd be in danger if he went in the, in, on the normal wings. But he would have to go on a unit simply because his crime's so high profile yeah. that he has to be kept away from people. Um, and that's how it is. You don't have to be. It just Or you could be top, top mafia boss or a, a top, top criminal. So it's not necessarily violent. It's, it's, it's who, like you are, who you or are. Who's your status? Have you got mil- You could be a multi-billionaire and go on it because you've got the money yeah. to have people have your escape. So you would go in, into a unit. So it's not necessarily for who, how crazy you are. And there's, um, yeah, so basically, yeah. They thought me and Sean had it so like So I haven't America. personally basically <laughs> met Charlie. I have personally met Charlie Bronson and stuff like that, but I've been on the the sort of wings. He'll have been there and stuff like that, but you don't see. Because when your door gets opened up, you're on your own. Can't you get a job? Can't, can't you like work in the kitchen or? Well, I I couldn't in get a porter clean. Whatever. I was on const, I was in a seg. I was segregated off for six year, five or six year. Kill. On my own, battling. The, can you imagine what that does to your mental health. Battling the prison officers daily. You made that six to seven, probably like twenty fucking years, man. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It sped me. I enjoyed it. No, in the in the end, you it, it's you get used to it. And when I was getting ghosted out all the time from prison to prison, you get bored with your prison. When you sat in the same prison for years on end, it gets boring. Yeah. So when they were moving me every couple of months, it was like, oh, buzzing. It was like, oh, back in here. But they weren't putting me on the wings and they were using excuses up all the time. They were using loads of excuses up not to let me on the wing. So I'd go into prison and they legally, if you've done nothing in that jail, they should be putting you on the, on the wing. And you prove yourself in there. If you want to be an idiot, then you go back down. I was going straight from one prison, straight from the seg. I was met, Wakefield, the tough them though. They try and intimidate you. So I was met coming off the van. They had shields. They were pinging me in, into the wing with shields all the way onto the wing. And they, they were behind the shields and they had the chungins and they were going, yeah. And me, idiot, I was going, yeah, like handcuffed up. Because you, you get yourself in a mindset. Like, you're never going to beat the system, but I can understand where Charlie Bronze, like, why he's in jail and he's never going to get out. Because he, they, they put you in a mindset where you just get yourself into this war with them. And they hurt you and destroy you and br- brutalise you that much. Did you ever that get in the to end, where you just want revenge. To... Where if you want... can get one of them, you'll get them. Did you ever get to where you just wanted to grease yourself up and go fight with the cop? Done all that. Yeah, with the shampoo and um, butter. and <laughs> that, Well, what I, I was... Then that, that's a, actually, I've actually mentioned that in my book. Yeah. There was a time when what I did is I um, put butter all over myself and I, I got shampoo, put it all over the floor, screws come running in and they were all over the place and it made me fight last longer with them. And in fact, they were pulling each other out, you know, because they're like, we're all over. So they were pulling each, they get out yeah. and I'm at the door, yeah. And so this is how crazy. No, that's in my, actually in my book. Everybody, all people... Any criminal who's been through the system who have fought against the officers will have done that. Guaranteed. Charlie Bronson, I don't know, any other, probably Stevie, I don't know if he's went through the system like that, but he'll probably be able to tell you that all the inmates do that, butter themselves up and, and like... Um, Make sure that it's a crab or anything, done it? Yeah, just slip it. off when the shield, because the shield's plastic, in it? <laughs> so it just hits you and goes, and you're like, I, I, I jump on him. You're jumping on top of them and, you know, just fight and battle. And it's just, that's the way the system is. That's that's the way it is if you go down that route. And it's, it, you, imagine this, it's a bit like trying to, it's getting one. If you can beat one little one, even if you get one of them out, one of them out of 20 battles you have, you've got one of them and you feel like there's a victory. Do you know what I mean? I got you. Ha, ha. Do you know what I mean? It's like. Uh, the, and it's the stuff what goes on. It's the talk, It's the handcuffing you up, and while you're handcuffed, like the, the, and I don't just. I don't mean a little slap. You know, what I mean like Be coming up. in and doing dodgy stuff, and like just doing stuff, and like coming in and grabbing your throat and doing it for about half an hour though. So your body's going into a panic, and I, there's been times where I have felt that they're going to kill us, and I've stopped, wrote letters to my mum saying, "Mum, if I'm ever found hanged, not saying the wood." Yeah. But in my head, the things that was happening, I'd write letters to my mum to say, Mum, if I'm ever hanged, if I'm ever found dead, I never killed myself. These have done it. I will never kill myself. Keep that in mind, you know. And I would have letters sent out like that. That must be a horrible feeling, that, though. You, you see, like, like so, you're drowning. 
So you see, like that water torch, you know, they put a rag on oh, it. Oh, it is, yeah. Pour the fucking thing. That's what we're but, doing. God. So they'll do it, and just as you think you're going out and your body's panicking, they'd let go, and you'd go, <laughs> and before you could get a breath, they'd do it again. They kept doing it to me for ages. Absolutely ages. I fucking hate that, man. It's S- scary. It's one but of the scary things me. to drown as well. Yeah. No, you can't breathe. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, and... <sighs> Because I've got like, I think it's a sleep apnea or something it's called. And sometimes I don't breathe while I'm sleeping. I could go on for ages and then I just wake up and go, <gasps> and get my breath, you know what I mean? I'm not dying it out. I don't know what it is, but it's just like fucking, it's a horrible feeling though. Yeah. And that's what they did to me for a long time. They did it and did it. And do you know what? How did you get used to it? Well, you don't get used to it, but how did you cope with it? Realise that thinking it, of how can I get them back next time this door opens. Wow, man, you were hardcore, weren't you? Really, it, it's 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 I don't know. I was just mentally ill, and when they were doing what they were doing to me, it was making me more hate them. Like they would beat me, which would probably make most men cry, even tough men. But I wouldn't make a noise out of them. They started sending psychiatrists, and it wasn't that it wasn't hurting me. It was that I so hated them. I thought I'm not giving them the satisfaction of hearing me scream like a girl. You'd hear fully grown men, I've heard, honestly, I've heard fully grown men screaming, they're meant to be gangsters outside, screaming their heads off, off a of kicking off them. And I'm like, I've been down the seg for nearly a year, suffered it on a daily basis and I haven't heard a noise. I've heard them scream where they've just been chicken winged. Yeah, you know what I mean? that's what I mean, like, yeah. ah! like girls as well, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Isn't it? Because them officers will be like, ah, can you imagine them going in the office? Yeah. Uh, did you hear him there flipping like he was screaming like a girl, you know, giggling about it? So I wouldn't do that. To, uh, uh, the only way I can say it is you get so stuck in a rut of revenge and them hating you and you hating them that you lose track. You don't even want to get out. All you're thinking about is the next time can I get him? And then I even started thinking, right, so I had the gear on. So I started thinking, right, I know what I'll do. Play calm. Relax. and Be nice. And then the... The, the tactics would lower down, so the, then they'd come without the shield. They'd get them to work. Yeah, so like, oh, I'm being good, haven't I? It's been two weeks now. And they'd be like, yeah, we'll take the pads off there. And I would wait until they got right down, and I'd start attacking them again. You know what I mean? Knock one of them and hit one of them, or do something like that. So I was in Franklin Seg when it was an in, he was known as a police informant called Paul Day, and he was found hanged, and there was a big investigation into why, how, how he was hanged, and I was in the um, seg then, and there's a thing on YouTube where he's, like, actually going through the process, what I'm go- I go through, but my process, if you were to watch it, was 10 times worse than his. So even if you just look at how he was going out, think 20 times worse than that. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's just like, I don't know, I can't explain. All I can say is um, that was my life. It was uh, not a good place to be. Uh, and you're in a dark place as well. See, everything was a mask. So when you're on the wing and you're walking around the wing and you you, you put a mask on and that, you're just in a diff... It's all a mask, you know what I mean? Everything was a mask and, and, and I was just full of hate, full of anger. He tested the system. And if I never changed, I think I'd have probably got out because I was thinking of killing people. Like, when I was in jail, I was think, scared to get out. And I was thinking, right, I'll, I had a list. How long ago was that? Like when you had that list, eleven year ago. Before I okay. Out with you. Um, for people watching this, you mentioned his book. His book is called Shane, and the link to that is in the description box below this video. Shane, I've sat here listening to these stories, and this is some of the most insane, craziest, gripping, hard hitting stories I've ever heard. And we've had a lot of people on this channel, man. Yeah, I remember. I this speak. is. I'm. I'm just sat here like, what is he going to say next? Yeah. I'm sure the viewers are thinking that as well. I'm. I'm sure loads are going to want to down. Go down into the description box, click over, buy your book, and get you like even more details and even more crazy stories. Yeah. Um, so yeah, next question is then. You said it says here you classify as in the six most dangerous prisoners. So did the Home Office have a list of six? And would like Charles Bronson be in that, for example? I don't know what. See, probably Charlie Bronson's obviously going to be on on that. Yeah, but it's a list of. Um, so what happens is I only. Do you know how I found this out? Oh. When I changed, and I, bumped, I went and did my testimony, and I bumped into a, a, home, a man who worked for the Home Office, 
and he come up to me all excited, said he couldn't believe that he, he couldn't believe that he'd um, that had changed, and he said he used to sit on a board. So every year, the Home Office have a board, sit on a board, ah. and assess the top six most dangerous prisoners in the country, in the UK, and they'll assess it like what we're going to do with them, how we're going to deal with this, what do we do, and they have this meeting once a year on what the Home Office, how the Home Office is going to deal with these people and what they're going to do. And he said to me, "You were on, and your name was always on, while you're in on that top six uh, list. Now where that was, I don't know, but they do assess the top six. On the uh, in the home office and stuff like that, and this is what he was saying to me. And then after that, I would have like people approaching me and 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 just and that's where everything sort of stemmed off from then. But I didn't even know. See, I thought it was a normal. <laughs> people laugh when I say this, but I thought it was normal. I like, I you know I, now I know now looking back, stabbing people through the head, kill trying to kill people and daydreaming about killing people and battling the system and stabbing two prison officers. You were as yeah. mad as a box of frogs, mate. Well, you it's not normal. normal. It's, it's no, not but I, normal. But at the, at the time, I thought I was. And people used to say to me, there's something wrong with you, you're mad. And it would confuse me. I'd say, well, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? Because I think I'm normal. Yeah. See, this is the problem when someone's mentally ill. A, a proper mental Ill, Ill person doesn't realise that they're mentally ill. Real. Those who realise they're mentally ill, how are they realising it to, to be mentally ill? I don't understand that, but like a proper full-on, if you're mentally ill, you don't realise it. I just thought it was like everybody else and didn't get why people were saying I was mad. I can understand now that. I, now I am. Now I know I was. What, what's, the, what's the worst injuries you've ever sustained in your entire life? Broke my toe when I kicked the curb. When I, um, oh, probably is the, when the screw's done that to me. Yeah. It's about it, really. Like when they were getting all these beatings, did they get your ribs That's and just stuff? just bruises, just daft things, uh, Cut on my back and my head. I've got. A, I don't know if you can see it, but I should have a where they smash my head with a chunjin and split my head open so you can see my skull. I don't know if you can see it, but there might be a scar somewhere. On the back yeah, of my I see head. it. There. Yeah. What What was the story behind that? Just everyday thing. Just fighting the officers. So when I charged them and got them, started winning them. One of them ran behind me, smashing across the head with a chunjin, and I found out afterwards legally they're not meant to do that. But meant now to me. I'm just a scumbag criminal, so it didn't matter. But um, that was it. It was just that was my life on uh, all the time. I was always fighting the prison system, and I was always battling. Uh, see, I got because it started off all this stemmed from being picked on and bullied until I was about 16, 17 year old, and I just got sick of it. Even when I first went to prison as a young offender, I got bullied and taxed and all that stuff. And then after that, I just, I just something happened in my mind. I thought it's never going to happen again. And then I would fight back and get a big game, and then mental health kicked in, and then that just changed everything. So it's the people who've done young offenders, and they were like, when they first went in, they were scared. And they'd have the trainees took off them and all that. Or there was one guy who'd, who was waiting to use the phone, and some guy said to him, oh, can you borrow your card? And used all his phone card and just give it him back empty. And he said, but then the next time he went in, it was a real prison. He thought, no, that, that's not going to happen to me yeah. again. And he beat the shit out of the person who even tried to t do it. Because everyone will try. When you first get in there, you've always got that idiot who's going to try and fucking yeah. test you and see how you react, you know what I mean? And if you react like a div, then everyone treats you like a div. Well, 90% of the people fucking do. Did you just roll yeah. over? Yeah. Oh, okay, you can have a train. Yeah, I wouldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> So how bad did the bullying get in the early years then? Oh, well, it was that bad that when I was in school, I remember the lads saying, oh, well, you can come and play with us. And I was getting really excited, ran towards them. When I went towards them to play with them, turned around, punched me in the face, popped my nose open. Bastards. Um, and, and that's why I think I started, because I used to burgle houses and steal and stuff. Yeah. And be a little robber like that and pinch cars. And in the early 90s, it was really big. The people joyriding and doing stuff like that. And uh, a base, uh, I just fitted in with them. They didn't bully me as much. Even though I got bullied off them, it wasn't as much as all the other people. So I just tried to fit in with everyone, really, I guess. And then just... You know, and just some, do you know when you just get sick and tired of people taking the mick out of you? And I just thought, nah, I've had enough. And I even remember the saying... The thing is, they probably weren't, though. <laughs> Might have just been in your head. What's that for the... 
like people taking the mick. No, no, no. They, they, they were taking the mick all the time. Out me and like even the older lads would like if there was a house and the there was a little window. They'd like use me to get through the big to open God, the big yeah. window God, for them. Yeah. And if we got like a thousand pound cash, they'd give me hundred pound, and they'd have nine hundred and stuff. Just yeah, you know what I mean. And I'm the div who's buzzing because I'm a kid, but so hundred pound is still yeah. buzzing. But when you look back on it all, that's all you ever done. All of them, it, you know, it all just picked on me and you bullied sure. me. Yeah, and when I was older, none of them would dare. Well, I don't know about now because I'm I'm different. But when I started getting a bit nuts, then. They, they couldn't and they wouldn't dare. So that was the first crimes then, like car theft and uh, breaking in places? Cars, b burgling houses, pinching cars, robbing, robbing people. Scumbag. What was your first arrest? Probably the burglary. So you went to Young Offenders for that? I went into, I got, I went to Aircliff Secure Unit when I was, uh, I think I was 15 or 14 and I was the first person in the North East to get Section 50 freed at the time. How do you manage that? Section 53 is when you, you've done a crime. What If you're under a certain age, you couldn't get over two years. But if the Section 53, it meant they could give you over a two-year sentence and it was for aggravated burglary. So I had a burglar house and I had a knife when the police officer come. <laughs> this was when I was about 14 and the police officer come and pulled a nine-inch knife out on him. Like my favourite favorite knife. I pulled my nine-inch knife on him and tried to stab him and when I was being interviewed he said oh you didn't mean to try and do that I said I did and I said why and I said because uh, I wanted to kill him and so they looked at each of them and went well I says and then I just looked and went dead serious I was 14 I didn't realize what I was saying though yeah I was just trying to I didn't realize what I was saying but they took it dead serious and and I just remembered and I went dead serious in the interview I'm only 14 15 and I just looked I went one day I'm going to kill a police officer. And they were like, you don't mean that, do you? And this is on the interview. I went, no, I mean it. I said, one day I'm going to kill a police officer. And then I just, I didn't say it that, that I meant it. I was just a kid. They should have given you help with it then, though, really. But in the early, it's a bit like, for example, when, like now, they're, they're, they're sussing out like people who've got a dis, who are dyslexic. Yeah. But back years ago, People who were dyslexic, dyslexic, it was just you like, you're dumb, you can't, yeah, yeah, you're just a daft idiot, you're dumb and stupid and you're being made a laughing stock out of. Yeah, exactly. So, time has gone on, maybe that would be the case, but back then in the early 90s, it wasn't like that. It, you didn't get no help for that, it was just like, oh, he's just another little naughty kid who was on the street and that was it. In America, I was classed as bipolar, but um, since I've been out, I've been fine. Don't see red dots and nothing no more. Right. Back then I did like. But... Are you meant to see dots and that like when you've got it? Yeah, well I don't know. I used to just see, you know, like you say you'd start and you'd blank out. Yeah. And then you'd stop. Eventually you'd stop, and then you just like, it's like a red mist just goes over your eyes, and it clears up. But um, that's how I used to be. But now nothing makes me that angry. Yeah. I, I, I sort of been there, seen it, done it, and. It's a lot easier to talk your way out of it. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't go out. <laughs> it's another good thing. I sit in the house fucking lot because I think to myself, if I go in a pub, someone says something. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not like fucking woolen. So, like, I might as well just fucking, you know, sit and have a few beers and chill. Yeah, that's why I don't drink and I get worried that, like, people will start. Because for me, it's not the starting, it's the months of overthinking it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll unsettle me and it'll, it'll unsettle my mind. And then instead of being in peace, I'm sat there for two or three years. A fight just to fight, though. At the end of the day, you just have a fight, but you take it. But not when you can't. You? Even even though I've changed, I still have this. I can cope with it and I can't. I don't react on it, but it, it, I still struggle. Yeah. And if people mug me off, I still feel like I still feel the same. I still have the same struggle and it still lasts for a long time. I just, for some reason, know how to cope with it. Why, I know. But for some reason, I know how to cope with it now and I don't act on it. And and I hope and pray that it stays like that and it never, ever changes and, and never goes back where I do feel like sack it and I just think sack the world and back to that person. Because if it does happen, then I'll have... My list comes back. you got a lady now as well, though. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I love it a bit, yeah. And I've got me, me five and kids as well. Kids, yeah. But it still doesn't stop when someone mugs you off sitting there and six or seven months down. And that's what bothers me. 
Because the people who did who did wind you up are out. They're the ones who they'll go off and forget about you within a day. Yeah, you're dude, still sat probably there drunk two years down the line about thinking it. about it. And you're just like you're stewing on it, stewing on it. Stewing every like, and that's what kind of mentality I've got. But I know how to cope with it, and 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 I've I've changed, and it's been eleven years, and I've never committed a crime since. That's good. That's so good. eleven years, do you know what I mean? I've been married in that eleven years. I've um, got five kids in that eleven years. Do you know what I mean? It's just a totally different lifestyle altogether. So I go in the pub now and again with your mates. But you, you tend to stay out of danger zones, don't you? You know for a fact if you start hitting the fucking pub every night, eventually some dickhead's going to yeah. say something. You know what I mean? A couple of cans in the house will do me. Exactly, yeah. Fosters. Three <laughs> Fosters. I desperate hard those, me. <laughs> you one? I've got some there. <laughs> no, I've got to drive home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you rise up in the crime world then from, you just described the junior level stuff? So it's not about, when you again, I don't want it to sound like rise up so some people will think like, He's he's gone from this small town criminal to some big time gangster mafia figure or something. Yeah. <laughs> when you say that in the rise up, I'll I'll put it across like this. It's it's um when my crimes got worse. And so my crimes have gone from burgling houses, pinching cars and stuff, to then getting a little violent. Uh when I first went to prison, I got taxed and then something started um I started thinking, I'm had enough of this, I'm sick of people taking the mick out of me. And I started fighting back. What got taxed? Um, I think it was a watch. You know, you know what? Let's just stop a minute and switch chairs. Oh, go on. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very particular, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move here then. Okay. So I got. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say switch that chair for this, but I got. Sorry. I, I, I got. I got um, taxed with a watch. I had a good fight. I, I fought for it, but I was young in jail. I was a soft. I couldn't fight. Uh, just a bit game and a bit mad, but couldn't fight really. And then I just got fed up afterwards and I was thinking about it, like I said, stewing. And then I thought, you know what? This is it. From now on, no one's going to mug me off ever again. And then I just went down a rampage. And I remember having my first fight with someone. Well, and, and from then on, everyone was giving me attention. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, and talking about it. And I just remember thinking, I want this. From that moment on, I refused to back down. And I just went fighting people. And I started... Um, on a small scale, not no international scale, but started selling drugs uh, on, on, on in some ways, which I'll not go into anyway, because I uh, started selling a few drugs and stuff, and then just started moving on like that. And my reputation was more just being a nutcase, really, and just going around stabbing people and trying to get a reputation for myself. I just want, I had this thing in my head where I wanted to be feared, I wanted people to know who I was. And so I was just running around, just trying to hurt people. So. If someone said to me, see him over there, no one will cross him. Like a normal person will think, ooh, I'll keep away from him. You go off, oh, fuck I, I, would, I'll have you. I would feel like, how? what can I do now to put it on him? So I'd maybe walk past and sort of bump into him and so go, hey, who are you talking to? What are you doing? And, we, and, I'd, and I'd stab him or something. And that was <laughs> that was what I would do. But as in like doing things as in like, to, um, like some big time organised criminal, I've never rose to that. I've just literally been an absolute nutter who just ran around. And, 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 and if I didn't change, I'd have probably killed someone or been killed. And that's that. So you got know. away with it for a long time, didn't you? Uh, the, my Stabbings. Last... Yeah. Yeah. So you think about doing the doors, big lad? I wasn't big at the time, though. Oh, right. So I was a skinny lad when I was running around like a loony. So it's, hard to ex it's just hard to explain because there's different kinds of I don't want it to sound like I'm saying I was like you know when you say when did you yeah. rise up yeah you've made that clear yeah, yeah so when did you go from one knife to like just having a whole pack after my first stabbing because I, I I got like a frit like I, I don't know should I say when I did my first stabbing and I, um, I got a feeling and like a nice feeling like a a rush and and so like I used to after that I used to start there uh, my hairs would stand on end and I'd like think about killing people and stuff and then I started like uh, walk that's it I just got the full pack and I started having a f a fascination with them and uh, just and then I'd just start walking around with the with them all around my waist and and just and it made me feel a bit like so how were they hidden like just in I used to just put them down down yeah. my waist yeah and if I fell her out I'd be in trouble yeah. Yeah, but if I fell her out, I'd be in serious trouble. Um, and, and that's where 
basically that's how it all was really. So you earned your respect. You like you were getting bullied. You earned I wouldn't your respect. say I wouldn't say more like people just had a fear. Fear. More, more fear. than respect. Who yeah. respects someone who's running around stabbing people? Who respects people who are running around like burgling people? And yeah. you know, there's no. I don't think I had a reputation for respect. I had a reputation probably where half the organised criminals would think I was a scumbag. Yeah. But I was just off it. An absolute nutter. Loose, loose cannon. And if, and if anybody came to me, you know, if anyone came to me, I, I wouldn't care if they were the top organised criminal either. Yeah. You could be the top boss all you want, but I'd, I'd, if you'd cross me and I had you in my mind, yeah. I'd just come to your door and stab you to death. And that's the kind of person I was. That's what I was like um, until I obviously become a bit uh, changed. So you said you got taxed in the jail when you were a youngster. But then people started to fear you in the jail as well. Yeah, I had fear before I went in. Okay, they the carried over from the streets. Yeah, because when I stabbed um, Gales in the head, Gales had got a reputation in jail because he's a nut. He, he he was a bit of a nutter himself. In fact, he's in jail now doing life. So he's a bit of a nutter himself. So when I did that, everyone in the jail system knows who he is. So they were all like, "Oh, he st- he did thingy." Do you know what I mean? And then when I was. Um, Everyone knew that I'd been running around stabbing people and I was a bit off it. Because the few people who I stabbed were known for being psychopaths themselves. Should have got a job as a chef. Oh, I should have, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> just go and get a caribou one second. Yeah, yeah, let's just take a break one second. So what was it that caused you to turn your life around? So I was in um, HMP Whitemore, top security... What well, no... So Long Larton. I was in Long Larton, top security prison, and um, my door opened and told me to go to education. And the education, so you've got what you call in prison, just in case, because some people don't know, they've got movements. So in the morning, when it comes to going to education, they'll come and open everybody up, and whatever destination there, so visit, um, work, uh, education, gym, they'll open your door, gym, education, and you go to education. Yeah. When you get to the other end... And you turn up at the other end, there's like um, two prison officers with a clipboard. And if it's education, you'll be at the education door and they'll check, see if your name's on the list. If your name's not on the list... You're not getting in. They've got to send you back to the wing yeah. so you can go and get banged up. So they've opened my door and said, go to education. I went to education. When I've got there, they said, your name's not on the list. So I was like, what do you mean my name's not on the list? And I made a fuss because I was one of them, do you know what I mean? What do you mean I was pet lip out, didn't get my own way kind of thing? And I must have done the officer's head in because he stepped back and he went, go to the chaplaincy. So I was like, buzzing. I'm not going back to my cell anyway. So went through, went to the chaplaincy. And when I walked in the room, there was like a circle of lads around this video, uh, video with this like posh head, grey head man, you know, hello, you know, that kind of a person. And he was on the um, tally on the video. And I didn't realise it was like a Christian course, basics of Christianity, like it's called the Alpha course or something, basics of Christianity. So I sat down and I just remember thinking, oh no, it's one of them Christian things, you know what I mean? Them godly, crazy things. So I thought, right, as soon as the video stops, I'll go. And anyway, as the video stopped, I went to go. And one of the lads went to me, uh, you get strawberry gattos and biscuits and that. I went, miss, can you put my name down, please? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so I got my name put on the course simply because of that. You know, I used to get Nescaf coffee, you know. Yeah. You used to get, like, strawberry gattos, bis bourbon biscuits, you know, you could eat them all. And that was the reason why I carried on going on this course. <laughs> so I'm going on the course, and this time I'm arguing and debating. I didn't believe in God or anything like that at all. I just thought they were all nuts, you know. They just I thought God was a... Con- like my two beliefs, I believed science disproved God. And I believe that it was a conspiracy by the government to keep everybody under control. So if you can make everyone believe there's a God and you you can't do these things, then everyone's good, you know. And I'm con- still in two ways about it, myself personally. Yeah. But Easter or if people can believe in it and actually get something good out of it, more power to them. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. But that's just me personally. Yeah. You see people with huge sentences and then they fall back on the Bible. Yeah. It stops them from killing themselves and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, look, it's a, everyone, you know, you can't force anything. But obviously I believe in God now. So I would always say to that is, what if, it's, what if it is right? One day you're going to pass away. It's hard enough here. 
Yeah. But if you die here and you had your bad life here one day and you did stand in front of them, then what are you going to do? Because you can't go, oh, please give me one more chance. You've had it. I'm, but anyway, I'm not going to... I'm going that way, mate. <laughs> 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 you don't want to. No, I'm only joking. But, but, uh, uh, nice basically, and warm. <laughs> but basically, I went on this course and I disbelieved for them reasons. And I would argue all the time with them, debate with them. Uh, and I used to think, you're a load of rubbish. But what I respected was... They respected, I was swearing at them and being funny and they would be like, oh, that's great, that's your opinion. I'd be like, eh? Because normally religious people, and including myself, I've done it myself, you're so, you're so thingy by it that you can't help sometimes but get a bit heated. Mm. And not meaning to, but you so believe it that you get a bit heated. And these weren't like this. So I'm there, I'm watching it, and the, the day come, what they sort of dedicate the Holy Spirit where they pray for people for God to do something and stuff like that. And they were, no, he told me, no, he's, he did all that. They were praying and praying for people. A few people started crying out happened to me. And I remember just thinking, see, rubbish, man. This is all rubbish, brainwashing me and all that stuff. And then I went out. And no, I actually remember making a cuppa. I remember the pastor come to me and he said, look, I've never done this in all the years. Eddie Baker, who's called. He said, I've never done this in all the years. But God's just told me to tell you to come here this afternoon by yourself. He wants, no, come here. So I says, okay. So on the afternoon when they open up and do the movements, I went to the chaplaincy. I found them. And he got two chairs like this. We sat in front of each other. And he said two verses out the Bible. And he said, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God, which is in the Bible. And then he said another one, which was about Jesus dying on a cross for sinners. And you know, no matter what you've done. Because I always had this religious belief. And the religious belief is, you no, know, you've got the good people and the bad people. And, you know, you've got to have this list of stuff you can do before yeah. you're a good person for God. That's not what the Bible actually preaches, by the way. The Bible preaches that we're all bad, we're all sinners, but some of us have been given the gift of God, grace, you send Jesus down to die for you. And if you can accept that, you'll be, forg be forgiven by what Jesus did, shedding his blood for you. It's what the Christianities believe. I've done Bible studies and they do say, like, is, I mean, I quote if there is a God, but they said it is a very jealous God. He's like, you know, if people didn't believe in him, he'd kill him. Well, it it does say, well, that, that, that's a good question, but the reality is, yeah, uh, he does say in the Bible that anyone who refuses to be, follow him, then they are the enemies of God. That's a quite obvious. There's yeah. always a devil and there's always a God. So if you're not with God, who are you with? In the sense of religion, uh, yeah. like the faith. So you, you are sort of right in that sense, but it's true. He's give you a choice and you, you can choose you, to follow him or you choose not to. And if there's a punishment to that, then that's your choice you made, not his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. gave you a way out. He said, look, you know, believe. If you don't, then that's up to you in that sense. But what he wants is, I believe, is true people to follow him. And he's given you a free will to do it. Because if he doesn't give you a free will to do it, then do you really believe? See, this is the point. If God said, okay, you're all going to believe in God, and I'm going to make you believe, then you're not believing off your own accord. Therefore... No. Is that a true belief? And so what God's done is he's give you free will. He said, okay, you choose to go that way, you choose to go that way. Because I love you enough, I'm not going to control you like a robot. I'm going to give you the freedom to choose that choice. Because when the time comes in the end, he wants you to um, believe in it off your own accord so he knows who the true believers are. You can't get further that than that. That sounds crazy. You really? Yeah, you can't. Well, anyway, what was I saying about my... You were saying that you went to the classes, you, you, you were taking the piss, you went for the the, the, uh, the cakes and stuff, but then you, yeah. they started to talk to you in a different way that resonated. Yeah. And then I just remember him... Nice word, lad. <laughs> and then I just remember him, I just remember having a cup, going and making a cup of coffee and the pastor coming to me and saying, I've never done this in all the years I've worked here, but God's told me for you to come. Went to my cell, come back. And I remember sitting in the chair in front of us and he just said, right... Um, said two verses out the Bible, and then he just said, um, right, pray. He prayed, and then he said, pray. And I remember saying, well, what, what do you pray? What do I do? He said, from your heart, pray. Uh, and I just remember um, finding myself saying, uh, God, if you're real, um, come into my life. I hate who I am. I hate who I become. Please, if you're real, just do something. Show me you're real. Um, nothing happened. I've said my prayer. And we're just in a normal chat now. The prayer's over. I'm in a normal chat. And I start to feel like an energy bubbly feeling in my stomach. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? 
and then they start to get stronger and stronger and it uh, it rose up, rose up, rose up and I just got this feeling shoot up my body and I just burst out sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and uh, it always ups this was 11 years ago and it still upsets me now because it was the beginning of the change of my um, whole life. You sure the gas are working out of date? <laughs> it was the beginning of my the change in my whole life. That's nice, that. And it's when I realised I was wrong in life, what I've done. It's when the impact of who I've hurt really bothered me. It's when... And, and since then, you've gone ahead and actually spoke to some of your former victims. Are you able to describe any of that? Um, I've apologised to every single victim, apart from one who wouldn't accept it, which is one prison officer. Uh, but one of the prison officers, I was invited. So, you, you see, I believe in God and it, it changed my life. From that moment on, it changed my whole life. I uh, never, uh, never committed a crime since. And and I got out, and within about a year or two, uh, one of the, the home house prison where I stabbed the prison officers, you would have thought they would have been the last prison to have me. Mm. They've only they only contacted me, told me that one of the head officers is allowed to come round my house for cuppa. They want them to come round to see if I would to discuss whether I could come in the prison and start working with the inmates. Um, so I goes in. Uh, it, I'm in the office and with the, the officer. And he said to me, um, oh, just going to ring someone a minute. So he rang, picks the phone up, rings somebody. Uh, a little bit after the door knocks, it's the prison officer who I stopped. Um, and I just remember saying, look, I'm sorry what I've done. Uh, got a bit upset and I said, can you forgive me? And he held up his hand and he just said, um, he said, I, no, he said, I forgive you. And it was crazy, it was surreal, because I'm now sat with an officer who I stabbed in a prison who hated me. And I'm sat there, and we're having a cup of tea, but you know when you're very apologetic and you can't help say, I'm really sorry for what I did. I kept doing this, so we had a joke, because I, I kept saying, look, I'm really sorry. And at one point, I took a sip of my coffee, and I went, look, I'm, I am really sorry I wasn't in the right frame of mind. He went, tell us about it. You know what I mean? And we had a laugh. <laughs> uh, and, and what was offered is, like, for the first time in my life, I got to see a different side to the prison officers. And I realised that when they're on them wings, they've got to act like they are. Some of them are really yeah. nice people, but they've got to be like that. They don't want to be. Some of them officers who you them probably think are horrible on the wing are the same officers who were going out in the part of a charity to stop prisoners going back to prison. This is what I was seeing. Like, this officer who people are saying they don't like, he's, like, invested and involved in running... Christian charities to try and stop the prisoners offending. They've got a front set just to say it's, yeah, it's front it's, it. Cause it's if they don't, the, it's oh, a big front set. Yeah. They'll take the mick. Yeah. If you if if they see a weakness in that officer, just, how many how many you no know, they'll try and bully him, they'll try yeah. and get him to do stuff, they'll take the mick out of him, they'll they'll not listen to him. So he's gotta have it and it's it's not what I saw, you know, when I was on the other side, I just saw a shirt, scumbag. You do get bad pennies. You, you do, do get ones where it just it's so quick to get the truncheon out and beat the shit out of yeah, you. It's I know. unbelievable. But majority of them aren't like that. Majority of them are decent. But you just got to know, on the wing, they've got to front it. Yeah, it's 100%. And that's what I read, but I'd never saw it. So when I was seeing it, it opened my eyes a little bit to, like, sometimes you're so narrow. We saw, like, on the blinkers of how we look and what how we see things. And if we just step back and open our eyes up a little bit, You'll begin to see that there is... Too busy in our own world, aren't we? Yeah. Just think of anyone else. So did it change your view of the whole system then? You weren't at war with the system anymore? I was at war with myself. I still am. <laughs> um, Don't stab yourself. You are, the mo you are your worst enemy. Yeah. That's what I've learned. You are your worst enemy. Like the, the Pride in the Bible says pride comes before a fall. See, it's pride what makes you not want to get mugged off so you go and stab someone. So that little gang member over there... When he ends up going and shooting him, do you know why he did that? Because he feels mugged off, so his pride's got him. So that pride makes him want to go back for revenge. See, pride, I think, is your biggest, your biggest enemy. It's your own mindset. Your own. If you could, if someone mugs you off, and you could be at a point like, and 
mug me off, big deal. How many people wouldn't commit a crime if they had that mentality? How many people wouldn't get revenge if they had that mentality? I've got, I'm, a, I'm at that stage you know, you know. I've got a lot of trolls who can't stand me, call me a big fat bastard, and they're going to do me in, and they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And I'm like, <laughs> arsed. <laughs> know what I mean? Not bothered. Yeah. Not at all. Because at the end of the day, 99% of it's just fucking talk. They're probably like 15-year-olds sat in the fucking mum's basement <laughs> fucking on the keyboard. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go, trolls. What, keep it coming, and Wild Man is going to kill you with kindness. He's no longer going to do home visits. Yeah. Started out Wild Man was doing home visits. I was going <laughs> to look for your IP addresses and try and find you and kill you. But now, <laughs> troll me all you want. I'm very sorry if my weight offends you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what happens then when people from your old lifestyle... Meet you now? Probably just think I'm an idiot because I'm like, you know, treat me like, I don't know, it's hard. It's because there's a few people who just. I think they respect yourself. I don't know. I don't know. There's some people who do and there's some people who don't. Have you got enemies who try and trigger you? It's not necessarily enemies who try and trigger me. It's people who aren't enemies who try and tr trigger me. People who just, I don't know, I'm in a good place and they just seem to try and goad me and wind me up all the yeah. time to get a response out of me. And I have had once or twice where I've responded a bit and then thought, what are you doing? But yeah, I have, I've, I've had a, um, a, a lot of people, like things like my cousins, my younger cousins, like people, this is what hurts, people who were scared to death of me, people who wouldn't dream of crossing me, and they cross me. Now, I've got to live with... you find your own family, you'll fuck you off the worst. I've, I've had it all. Family, friends. I don't, I've, listen, I'm, I'm on my own in that sense. And I like it that way. Better. Uh, and, because, and the more public you become, the more, like you say, people come out, oh, who's he think he is, all this, all that. Yeah. And the more people come out. And sometimes you do think, if you said that to me when I was 20, I'd, 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 <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't dare. You just got to like, and, and it's just like, you know head. what, so... so it's one of, one of Pablo Escobar's favourite quotes was, envy kills more people than cancer. It's true. As soon as you get success and people see you're doing well for yourself. I've had, I have it. Then they try and trip you up. Yep. And, he, and the, what they say about you behind everything, I've had it all. I've, I've lived it. But again, it's going through. I've been through a big process of learning that and a big process of accepting that. But you, sometimes you've got to go through a process because when it first starts happening, you, you get annoyed and you, you want to go and do something and you feel like you want to, but in the end, you're just like, you know what? I'm a man now. I can't really be true with this childish stuff. What made you stop when well, you're not carrying knives no more? When, you... when, when I stopped... <laughs> Has he got knives on him? <laughs> <laughs> when I stopped, when I stopped, when I started becoming, when I had that experience, what I've just experienced. Nice. At that point, I didn't just stop carrying knives. I stopped violence. Uh, I didn't... Uh, I had remorse. I was, um, I struggle more with forgiving, with forgiving myself than I do anything else. You're your own worst enemy, aren't you? Yeah. We all are. So you're not, you're not alone, bro. You know yeah. what I mean? You don't. Want... We used to go Bible study, didn't we? Yeah. There's one song I liked. It was like "Save a Wrench Like You." Uh, I kind <laughs> of like that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that a church on the street? Yeah. Old wooden cross. Yeah. Save a wretch like you. Jumpo Jack Flash. <laughs> jumping Bill. Oh, Jumping, jumping Bill. Bill, yeah. It's all in hard time, the book that we gave you. All our visits to the um, church on the street. Yeah. And this um, guy would come in called Jumping Bill. And past the wall would just stop the mass and jump. He said, I'm going to let Jumping Bill take over. <laughs> and he was bald. He had like a rainbow t-shirt on, a guitar and Jesus sandals. And he started <laughs> strumming. And he's smiling, he's running around the room, getting in everyone's faces, just smiling, like inches away from people. Comes to the back row where like all the hardcore people are inches away from their faces, getting them to smile. And he sings, he sings, he sings, and he goes, everybody jump! And the whole room starts pogo <laughs> dancing. You got the, the, you've got the Spanish and the Italians all tattooed up, but all very religious, you know what I mean? Yeah. And just like, you don't see a smile at <laughs> yeah. By the end of it, they're like, jumping <laughs> themselves. It's class, isn't it? That was like... A bright moment in a dark place. I used to, um, the priest come round and give us these uh, little paper things you eat. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, boring yeah. as fuck they was. <laughs> <laughs> People were so hungry, we were desperate for them. 
I actually got it and just threw it at him. No, he made an eye patch out of it first. Oh, I made an eye patch out of it. Just like to freak that. out. Because on the front row, is, is a lot of hardcore religious people with yeah. all the religious tattoos. Wildman puts the eye patch on and he goes, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he throws it at the priest. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a frisbee. Went, everyone watched it. Got, he almost skimmed the ceiling and come down. Like, <laughs> yeah. All right, anyway. Um, writing a book is not easy. What made you want to write a book? I didn't write it, I can't read and write properly, <laughs> but so I'll answer it in this way. I was approached and told that my story uh, by a, a, a freelance BBC man from the Glasshouse Publications. And he was he spoke to me for a bit and asked me if I'd do it, and I was uh, a bit, I don't know, and then in the end I thought, yeah, suck it, how many people might read this and see that you can change, see that you can change your life, see that for me personally, my to come to God. But if not, just to show that no matter what life you've had, no matter how much of a scumbag you are, you can change, uh, and I'm proof of that. And so, if if one person can read the book, um, then I'm I'm good enough with that. And and if it helps them, I mean, uh, then I'm good enough with that. And how do you know you get a good deal though? How do you know? Did it say have you got legal representation? I'm not bothered about a good deal. You got you got to make money out of it. Bothered about money. What about people who are reading the book? Are they contacting you, to, giving you, saying, like, this is inspired oh, I've, I've had stuff. two people who've turned up at my church saying that they believe in God now and they've been going to my church ever since. Brilliant. I've had people, um, I've had, you wouldn't believe the, the amount of people who've come to me and said, like, that it's helped them, that they've changed. Not necessarily all come to God, but they've sent them on a, the right path. The right path, yeah. Uh, I know handy criminals who are ex criminals who have. Give the lives to God simply because they realised how psychopathic I used to be, and they just cannot believe that I'm in the position I'm in now, and they just can't, they just can't get it. Because he, uh, one lad always talks about, he just, there was a look in my eyes, and um, where I it, it just, it, it, when I looked them, it was if I was looking, they couldn't, it was, I was looking through, through them. them. There was something blank there, you know, when they looked. Dead eyes. Yeah, and then they look now, and even though they're a little dead, they're a bit alive now, you know. <laughs> no, but now that now you can, they're saying that they, they don't see that thing where it feels like they were looking through, and something must have happened to me, uh, and so. I think your eyes are sparkling now, like oh, very yeah. alive. Yeah, yeah psychopath yeah. has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the BBC then, and a possible film. What's what's going on? It's a, a documentary film, so it's. Um, they basically, they've just went round interviewing prison officers. Uh, they filmed me in uh, Home House Prison where I stabbed the prison officers. They filmed a prison or head prison officer who knows about it, who's friends with the officers I stabbed. They've gone to my friends. See, I wanted to, uh, same with the book as well, I wanted it to make it not one-sided so I can big myself up. And so what I did is I went to everybody who was involved and I, I said, this is the story of what I've explained. Do you agree with that? And they've said, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, and, and they've agreed with it and it's gone in. The documentary has just literally gone round and interviewed everyone who was part of my life who can back up what I'm saying. And you're talking prison officers, police officers, judges, you're talking um, ex-offenders, ex-offenders, uh, criminals who I was hung, hung about with as a kid, uh, uh, um, people who I've had uh, run-ins with. So I talked about that, Paul Venice, the, the K1 fighter, He's on it. He's uh, he's talking about how I, what I used to be like. Said he'd bash me, which he would. I've got to admit that he's solid. You know what I mean? Give me a right slap. But but he 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 said, you know, he 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 remembers me and he knows he you know that I'm the kind of person that would have sort of come back and. Did they interview the guard who you stabbed? Who you who, who, who accepted your forgiveness? No, but they've, they no. Uh, he wouldn't. He would. He was asked to do it, but he didn't want to do it. So they interviewed the, you know, the one who arranged for me to meet him when he rang him and he come. Yeah, so gives him, he's on it. Gives us enough, though, isn't it? You don't yeah, want to, he's, he's forgiven you don't me. Want to put him on front street. Well, do, do you know what? It's it's unbelievable because when I was doing an alpha course in there with the, with the lads, he was actually sending like lads up to say, "Oh, tell Shane, he's, I'm, I'm asking after him." It's like. You, you can't make this stuff, it's unbelievable, do you know what I mean? I'm yeah. just in a place now, I've gone round the country, talking, telling, talking, uh, do you know what happened? So I went down to London, had this one book on me, right? And I'm walking through this um, big, massive 
I'd just done a talk and I'm walking through this big massive shop, a uh, co coffee shop, and where you can eat and all that and stuff like that. And there's a lad there, and I just felt, you know, I, I know you don't, some people don't believe, but I just felt God say, see him over there, a lad there. He said, Who go to help? him and give him a book. So I walked over, said, here, mate. I said, I don't know why. I was just getting a big urge to, to come over and give you this book, so I'm going to listen to the urge. I give him the book. So he reads the front, most dangerous prisoner. He jumped up, he went, mate, are you being serious? I was like, what? He said, I'm on home release from prison. He said, I'm going back to prison in a couple of days. He said, how on earth did you know to come to me? How on earth did you know to come and give me that book? He's like, I can't believe it. He said, I've been... No, and it just... like, and I, It makes me walk off thinking... Stuff like that makes me think even more, you know. Like, yeah. I know I'm right, I know. And, and things like that happen all oh, the now time. Now all that positive energy now, aren't you? Yeah, 100%. I, yeah. Can, I love it. Yeah. I just love helping people. I love um, just doing the right thing. But I will say, it's not... It's not been easy. It's a battle all the time. And it's still, I'm not going to profess that like instantly. It, I've, that's it. There's never been no struggles. In fact, sometimes it's tougher and harder for me. Because before, if I re reacted to people and dealt with them, then the pressure was gone. I had no pressure. I dealt with it. And I'm happy now. Yeah. They know not to cross me. Now I've got to live with the fact that I'm being mugged off and I've just got to take it. And, and, and that sometimes is even more pressure in your own mind than, you know, the pride and the thing I'm a mug and all that stuff is a bigger battle to overcome sometimes. Sometimes when you've lived an exciting life and then you calm down, you still have to do other things to give you that excitement. Yeah. Have you replaced the old stuff with other things that oh, give definitely. you excitement? Church. My wife. Every night. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, only, I'm just trying to have a crack on. But yeah, you know, if if you can, uh, my kids and and stuff like that, and my wife and and just doing stuff, and I get a buzz out of going around talking and and helping Still people. Still doing out. Your fitness? Does it look like it? <laughs> Not really. And again, it's because when I was training before, I trained for one reason: to be ready if I had to. You know, I was mentally ill. I, I had this... Um, you don't have to be ready for nothing now, do you? No, you know I mean? not... Well, I hope not, but yeah. yeah. But now I'm just sort of... I chill out, I've got no problems, uh, no, no worries at the minute. So I'll just um, chill out and just let God hopefully help my life get better. What's People? your favourite scram? Do you like kebabs? Love kebab. Um, what was it? Um, Hot shot pizza. Full of kebab meat on the top. Oh, that sounds nice. And twenty packets of uh, twenty um, bags of chips as well. I love the Chinese chips. Oh, do you? Yeah, I love them. So I buy them on their own and eat them. So I've got to be careful because I was like, I was meant to have started losing like loads of weight for the on the lockdown. Yeah. Right. That's it. I'm going to lose weight. I put about a stone and a half on. <laughs> Can't stop eating. Fucking hell. <laughs> 27 fucking stone it's because you get older and you don't, you don't care like about your looks and I think that's what the problem is and it's sometimes with some you just think sack it uh, who cares I'm married now yeah. I've, got, I've got my woman fuck it you know what I mean <laughs> doesn't matter if I look like a fat bastard or not <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame people watching this are going to be so inspired by this incredible turnaround I mean I've never heard someone go from one extreme like that so far to the other and that's remarkable, and that's, you know, credit to your character and your personal development and everything. If these people are watching this who are inspired by you, if they want to contact you, I mean, I'm going to put all your links in the description box. What's the preferred method of them contacting you? Probably his email. By email, so yeah. put your email down there. Email, and if the, one, if the contact goes, I'll just give them a number and then... Are you on, like, Facebook or anything like that? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, yeah. I it's... wouldn't give you numbers out on Facebook or anything like that. No, I don't. I You're going to get fucking... Dickheads, going. yeah, no, I know. I, I, I've, I've only got I went from 5,000 people to 200 on my Facebook, yeah. If I haven't if met them, uh, and, and and don't know them, I don't tend to add them. Uh, but, um, I guess if there was people who were contact with saying they're struggling and they seemed all right, then I guess I would. And I guess I probably might possibly just on my email see he's my number, I can easily block it if they're. I've got Thai birds. I don't even have the birds. They might be fucking men, actually. <laughs> Look all right, like, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you've enjoyed this video, then, 
Please let us know in the comments section what you thought about it today. And if you want to subscribe, thanks for subscribing. Subscription logos in the bottom right hand corner. If you want to donate to what we're doing, producing these podcasts at this high quality in a studio, donation links are also in the description box. There's a link to Wildman's playlist in the description box. He's got over 100 videos now, hours and hours and hours of endless content. And now he's got his Skype set up officially. Yeah. That was at his house. Set that uh, up. And um, he's going to be doing, interviewing people all over the world who've got prison experiences himself um, by Skype webcam. I'm going to be in charge of the Epstein stuff that, that Wildman loves so much. Can't stand the cunt. <laughs> <laughs> if, right. you, if you thought I was mad, this guy's really mad, you know what I mean? Was. Was. <laughs> yes, was. Let's give you a hug, man. That's yeah, brilliant. Man. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely blown away by your story, man. Yeah, yeah, well done.